politics for years to come. The polls in New Hampshire open for just three more hours, and the countdown is on to those critical results. Voters across the state have been piling into polling locations since early this morning. New Hampshire voters, of course, famous for their surprises and famous for embracing underdogs. Will that be the case tonight? Up for grabs, the Granite State's 22 delegates. But more importantly, this contest, a make-or-break moment in the 2024 campaign. A once crowded Republican field narrowing down to an old-fashioned head-to-head matchup. Can former President Trump ride the momentum of his win in Iowa and cement his status as a candidate who cannot be beat? Or will former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley surpass expectations and pull within striking distance? And if she can't, will tonight be her last stand? All of those questions will be answered right here over the next several hours. In just moments, we're going to bring you the first wave of exit polls that are first glimpse into really what's in the minds of New Hampshire voters. At 8 p.m. Eastern, polls across the state will close, and that is the earliest time we could have a projected winner in this race. Our correspondents take a look. They're fanned out across the state at those polling sites and at Trump and Haley campaign headquarters and the watch parties. Let's get straight to our Hallie Jackson, who's at a polling site in Bedford, New Hampshire. Hallie Jackson, ready to go. Yeah, You're on fine. camera. How are we feeling call. there? What are you seeing? What are you hearing? Thank you. We're, we're getting traffic block. copped a little bit because the most block. important block. thing is that we cannot block, obviously, this line of voters heading in to go vote. And let me tell you what a line it is. Look at all these folks. A lot of folks, obviously, it's after the work day coming in. Let me tell you, the traffic coming in, too, it was a crawl because people are coming out for this first in the nation primary, this critical day, this critical state. And we have seen here at this particular polling site in Bedford, New Hampshire, the expectation that maybe as many as six to nine thousand people will be here right before polls, polls close. Looking at my clock, Tom, in the next two hours. So that's all we have. My, I'm going to ask my cameraman, David, here to not back into the folks over here. We're going to swing in this way. Um, and, Tom, this is where all of the action is happening tonight, right? If you take a look, I mean, this is a scene that is playing out over and over in 309 different polling locations here in the state of New Hampshire. This particular one leaned Republican as far as registration, but newly now it's the undeclared and independent voters that have the edge, Tom, at least as it relates to registration. Now, why does that matter? You know why that's important. And it's because those are the voters that Nikki Haley would need to win over in what is essentially her last best chance here in this Republican race. That's how it's being perceived at this point. Haley and her campaign are talking about taking this not just to South Carolina, but to Super Tuesday and beyond. She is insisting she is not going to drop out if she loses tonight. Her allies are suggesting that a second place showing here, if it is a strong second place showing, is actually in many ways a win for her as she is now casting her eyes to her home state of New Hampshire, uh, to her home state of South Carolina, I should say. Keep in mind, South Carolina doesn't vote for another month. I want to show you this line here. People are queuing up, essentially. I think this one's probably a little too young to vote, but maybe here with, with a caregiver, with a parent, with a family. As you see everybody here, we're getting, I know, Tom, some of our exit polls in just as we speak as we are looking to see who is actually turning out. Because again, this question of undeclared and independent voters, the exit polls were just getting in, just under half of the voters who have turned out based on the exit pollings are undeclared and independent voters. Obviously, that is really important when it comes to how Nikki Haley may do here. We can't read into it too much, but it is a critical data point. And I wanna to get to Chuck Todd, who I know is standing by at the board in studio, Chuck. Talk us through this, the yeah. significance, what you're seeing is some of this data is now just starting to roll into us in the last 90 seconds. Well, look, I am, I, I, the, to me, the whole ball game tonight is what is this split between Republican, right? And I, I have 2016 up here for a reason. This was the first primary Trump was in. He won it. And more importantly, Bernie Sanders was the guy winning the Democratic primary, which means, which meant he was dragging over almost a lot of liberal and progressive voters to his side. And I want to circle a number here. This 3% back in 2016, just 3% of Republican primary voters call themselves Democrats. Every other New Hampshire primary we've ever exit polled, that number's been in double digits. So why is that important? Well, in 2016, Trump won because the independent and the Democratic number did not get to 50%. 42 and 3 is 45. Tonight, this is the ball game. This number and this number has to add up to more than 50 for Nikki Haley to have a chance. If the Republicans outnumber the independents and Democrats, Trump wins, and Trump may win handily. But if this is either even 50-50 or even a majority non-Republican, that's the path for Nikki Haley. But for her to win a, primary, a New Hampshire primary, Republican primary, 
And uh, if she wins it without winning the Republican registered Republican, she'd be the first person to ever win a Republican primary in New Hampshire without winning actual Republic, a majority of actual Republican voters. And so r remind people of the process here, Chuck, right, as we're watching mm -hmm. people come in. If you heard clapping, it's only because they cheer here for first time voters. People can pick up a ballot. Undeclared voters can come right. and choose which ballot they want to pick up, Democrat or Republican here. Explain that piece of it, because that's so critical. Well, that's right. Look, if you're a registered Democrat today, you could not show up and vote in the Republican primary. You had to change either to independent or, re or Republican as a Democrat if you wanted to do that. But if you're a registered independent, you get to walk in there right now and you get to pick, and essentially you become a member of that party if you decide whichever ballot you choose. And what many of these independent voters do, and Hallie, you're probably seeing it, the second you're done voting, if you want to re-register as an independent, you can literally do the process right there at the polling place. This is why right. so many independent voters love participating. This is a very open process for them. They go, they pick their ballot, they're a Republican for about 10 minutes. And then they go back and re-register as independent, and they're important swing voters for the general. We've been talking to a lot of voters here mm -hmm. uh, in Bedford, obviously around the state as we've been driving around here today, Chuck. And what's interesting is hearing those independents that you're talking about, people who are right. undeclared, their rationale for casting the votes that they do, right, for casting those ballots. You hear some contingent of the independent undeclared sector essentially say they're, they're never Trump, essentially, that they couldn't cast a ballot for Donald mm -hmm. Trump. So they're choosing, in this instance, Nikki Haley. You hear some people that are more pro Nikki Haley when you're looking at that segment. And then, of course, some people who say they are backing for former President Trump, uh, that is obviously another factor here. What are you seeing in some of these numbers, Chuck? Because again, mm -hmm. he is, I spoke with him earlier today, I was at a polling site down in Londonderry, and I happened to see the former president, yeah. and I said, what is a good night for you? He wouldn't give me like a number, right, a specific on the margin, but Senator Tim Scott told me, listen, 10 points is a good night, 15 points is a great night, yeah. as far as that kind of victory. Tell me if you can glean anything based on these early exit polls that we're seeing. Look, this looks like uh, a New Hampshire primary electorate that, that competitive New Hampshire primaries are fought over. Right. I mean, it's a first wave of, of numbers that we're getting in. Um, I don't I want to be careful on how we're characterizing uh, some of these things. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, this this looks like independent voters showed up uh, in, in, in significant numbers enough that I, that I think we we don't know yet. Uh, I, I I will say this. I think early exits sometime um, over can overstate the Trump uh, over excuse me overstate the anti-Trump vote. It's a pattern we've noticed over the last eight years since that. So we'll see. But I'll tell you, if we do see a movement here where Haley is uh, within single digits tonight or even pulls the upset, then it does show you that there is a contingent of voters who are like, hey, despite what the conservative media is saying that this is over, despite what the Republican Party and the chairman of the RNC is putting out a statement trying to end the race tonight. The voters don't want to end this race, uh, yeah. and that would be a significant development. Chuck, I'm walking down the hallway here because, and this is obviously incredibly, you know, what we're talking about, this is it, right? This is some of the first data that we're seeing from this first in the nation primary. I'm walking down this hallway because I wanted you to meet somebody who is with us here as we are making our way. These are all, by the way, voters who have voted. The exit is out this way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here and bring in our guest. Really good to see you, Doctor. Nice to see you. You know New Hampshire just as well as anybody here. Have uh, you been having a chance to listen to what Chuck's talking about as it relates to the exit polling? No, I haven't seen any of the exit polling Okay, yet. I'm going to show you some of the numbers here that we're seeing. Uh, and um, forgive me for having you look mm -hmm. on my phone. Here's what we're seeing. Party ID, 47% Republican, 45% Independent, 8% mm -hmm. Democrat. Mm -hmm. Give us a sense of what you think about that, how you see it playing out with this particular electorate. I'm going to move you over a little bit here this way, sir, too. Um, I you know, it's, it's a lot of, un, of independent voters who are coming out to vote. And that, I think, is good news for Nikki Haley. Is it enough? Because remember, many of those independents are still going to vote in the Democratic primary. They're not all going to go over and vote in the Republican primary. New Hampshire is a state that has seen some surprises before in the past. It has. Uh, but in the past, we've had more competitive elections where we haven't had somebody who was, say, the quasi-incumbent, which yeah. is his votes or Trump's votes are locked down. A lot of the other candidates still have can move around in previous elections. Yeah. But this time around, it's one-on-one. -on -one, and I think that might be more problematic for Haley. Dr. Schmidt, thank you so much. So, Tom, that's uh, the situation here on the ground in Bedford, New Hampshire. We're going to be here talking with voters, keeping an eye on how these things develop. But for now, I'll toss it back to you back home in the studio.
All right, Hallie Jackson for us. Hallie, thanks so much. So, look, we want to be completely transparent. This exit poll data, this first wave, just it's in. literally just coming in. Mm -hmm. I'm telling Chuck, put it in the board. <laughs> We're doing he's, it. He's trying to figure it out. But look, let, let's talk about the top line that we know, which yeah. is the, the percentage of independents, undeclareds, that are in this race. Talk to me about this and at least the impact right now what this means. Look, 45 is the minimum number she needed. Yeah. Uh, to make this competitive, because what I told you before, we know a chunk of Democrats are going to vote in this this primary. Right. In 2016, it was an all-time low at 3%. That had a lot to do with Bernie Sanders being on the other side. So if all you need is more than 5% of Democrats and suddenly 50% of this electorate's not Republican, that is the recipe for Haley. So this is early. I, I just would caution folks. Right. Early waves at times in exit polls, at times have overstated an anti-Trump vote. Nikki Haley sort of needed a, yeah. like three things, right? She needed the, the undeclareds to turn out. Yep. She had to win, obviously, a, a big majority of yep. them. But she also needs to grab, like, what, about 30% 30, 30 of the Republicans? Something 25 around to there? 30. 25 it, it, to 30. It, well, depending if she's winning this by the same How much she 25 to, to, to 30 margin here. I do want to show you this here. I believe we have uh, party identification. So we have an idea of what the makeup of who is. these people are. And this is the most important thing right here, man. Yeah. 45 plus 8 is 53. This is, if this is what this electorate looks like, it's 53% yeah. not Republican. Now, you can already hear what MAGA World's going to say. Democrats and independents right, right, are right. invading our primary. But my goodness, less than 50% Republican for Trump. This is in a this, flashing in yellow. In this first wave. In this first wave, this is a flashing yellow sign and, and means... This yeah. is not a, put it this way, this is not a race we're calling a poll close. Here's something else that's interesting, though. We're putting this banner up right now as I'm looking at our, at, at our screen, our graphics. 56% of those, though, in this exit poll said they'd be satisfied if Trump was a nominee. 55% say they'd be satisfied if it was Nikki Haley. W what does that tell us, if anything? Well, I think it's just a different makeup. I think the independent voter is a more pro-Haley voter. They're looking for to break the spell. I mean, I can tell you yeah. they're just sort of exhausted from Biden v. Trump. So you have that. It's just a different share of voters. But look... Yes, there are plenty of independents who are fine with Trump. Okay. Right? They are they don't like the system and Trump was sort of an anti establishment He did really well with independents in 2016. Yeah. He's doing less so now because he's essentially made those independents that liked him. Yeah. He turned them into his version of Republicans. While you get more data in from yep. this first wave of exit polls and we feed the beast, I'm gonna walk over here to our good friend, Meet the Press moderator, Kristen Welker. Kristen, so we've seen some of the first wave data come in. Yeah. We just broke it down with Chuck. There's something else that happened right before the polls um, th th this data came out. The polls obviously still open for a couple of hours. And that was a statement from the yeah. RNC chair, right? Walk our viewers through that because it almost sounded like she was trying to set the table for the night, essentially saying, listen, Ron DeSantis, Tim Scott, they've rallied around Donald Trump. If he wins tonight, let's support the nominee. The big word of that statement by RNC chairwoman Ronna McDaniel was unity. Unity. And she talks about the fact that, as you point out, Tim Scott... Ron DeSantis have basically rallied around Trump. It was a not so subtle way of sending a message to Nikki Haley that if she doesn't win tonight, she should think seriously about dropping out. Now, I actually had a chance to just interview the Haley campaign to get their reaction. Not surprising, they yeah. were undeterred by this statement. They said, look, she's always run as an outsider, whether or not you can make that case. She's obviously someone who served with former President Trump. But they were not persuaded by that argument by by Ronna McDaniel. But Tom, let's just take a step back. That's an extraordinary statement it was. to put out on election day before the polls right. have closed. We just got a little bit more information. I do want to share yeah. with you. This is from Exit Polls. Candidates who share their values matter most to New Hampshire voters. When it comes to candidate qualities, Republican primary voters in New Hampshire had similar priorities to Iowa. One third, that's 31 percent of Granite State voters, said they were looking for a candidate who shares their values when deciding whom to support. So what's significant there is yeah. that that is similar to what we saw in Iowa, where Trump did have that big win, and I think the point that Chuck makes, it's still very early. Still very early, and sometimes, as Chuck was saying this as well to me, this first wave data sometimes, not always, sometimes can be not yes. as Trump-friendly. You just got back from New Hampshire. You were there. They're, they're projecting, predicting record turnout in New Hampshire. Did you get that sense? Were people talking about this race everywhere you went? You know, it's interesting. Yes, they were. At the same time, a lot of the folks who live there said, because this is not an open yeah. primary, because there are now two people in this race, they didn't feel like it had the same energy and enthusiasm and excitement as they have seen in the past. The other big takeaway that I, I will just say from my time on the ground in New Hampshire, Tom, is a lot of Nikki Haley supporters said to me, 
point. They love her closing message. Yeah. They wish they had seen that fire from her weeks ago. Yeah, people earlier. said that. Right. They, they, they are concerned that this state, which is uniquely tailored for a Nikki Haley win, uniquely tailored for potential comebacks, mm -hmm. that, that she may not have given it the amount of fire that she needed in the closing weeks of the campaign. Kristen Welker, we always thank you for your analysis. We're going to check in with you throughout the night. I'm going to take a little walk here uh, to our fun board of reporters, correspondents, political analysts that are fanned out across the Granite State here. This is our board of remotes here. These are, you can see, our, our, our wall of fame, if you will, of all these great correspondents. As I look at this wall, all these Beautiful people in New Hampshire voting. There's just one person that sticks out, and it's because of this beautiful hair. The hair is jumping off the screen. It is Jacob Serboroff. He's talking to voters there in Derry, New Hampshire. Jacob, we can just see, you, you're, the hair was just so big. It was great. Um, I was just talking to Kristen about the excitement level. You've been talking I, to voters I need all to day. I some of your product, Tom. That's the <laughs> truth of the matter. You got it. I, I FedExed it to you. Talk to me about the excitement over there. And what are you hearing from Thank voters you. in Derry? You're just south of Manchester there. A lot of Nikki Haley voters. Tell me what you're finding. Uh, first thing I want to tell you, Tom, is that this is, so we're at Pinkerton Academy in Derry. This might be, I can't confirm it for sure, but the local officials here say this could be the largest polling place, not just in New Hampshire, but in the entire country. There are 20,000 or so New Hampshire voters that are registered and eligible to participate in this place. When it comes to excitement, it's off the charts. There's already been almost 7,000 people come through to participate. When it comes to process, I want to show you what that looks like because New Hampshire does it differently than many other places in the country. So come with me. Let's start here. When you show up, these things are called, sorry guys, these things, we're kind of swimming upstream, Tom. These things are called poll pads. You show up at a poll pad, you present your driver's license, your ID, and they give you a ballot and you go in. If you don't have it, this is the part of the process that I think it's analog, but it's really cool. You come over here to this area and an election worker will help you out. They grab this thing right here. You know what this thing is, Tom? A camera? It, it's a Polaroid camera. They take a Polaroid picture with the Polaroid camera and they give you a voter affidavit. Look at this. You, you recognize that face? It's a voter affidavit for being a challenged voter, for not having your voter ID here in New Hampshire. What they do is that once you, once you have your challenged voter affidavit, it looks like this, Tom. You bring your challenge voter affidavit. You could be undeclared, you could be a Democrat, you could be a Republican, back up to the poll pad all the way here. And by the way, Tom, I gotta give a shout out to my man here. Tell me your name one more time. Um, Sergeant Tyler Daniel. Sergeant Tyler Daniel. Sergeant Daniel is gonna be the one, you're taking the ballots late tonight, right? You gotta make sure the ballots get safe and sound once this place is all shut down to where they go, town hall? Uh, I believe so, yeah. Okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna spill the beans because <laughs> top secret information, but thank you, Sergeant. So you come up here, Tom. You come over to the poll pad with your affidavit, with your form, you go do the voting process and obviously in the voting booth over there. But if you're an unaffiliated voter, there are more unaffiliated, we've said it ad nauseum, there are more unaffiliated voters in this state than a Democrat or a Republican. You can change your party preference to one of those two. And then when you're done, by the time you're out, look, come over here, Dana Roker's here with me. Come take a look. That's called the change back station. Those people that you're looking at right now, Tom Yamas, are in line to, they've already gone from unaffiliated to a political party preference. Now they're going back before they walk out the door back to be an unaffiliated voter. So when we talk about how important are those people, they couldn't be more critical and they come in unaffiliated, they switch to Republican or Democrat, and by the time many of them walk out the door, they're very proud of that unaffiliated status and they have it by the time they go home uh, after casting their ballot. Tom? Jacob, before we go, you've spent time in New Hampshire before, uh, not your first rodeo. Anything stand out to you this time around? All right, I think we might have lost Jacob. Jacob Soberoff for us, Derry, New Hampshire, just south of Manchester. There's some great reporting. We're going to get back over to Chuck uh, Todd, who's got second wave data, exit poll information. And Chuck, we have some big, we do. Big, big, big data points coming in here. One on issues. Talk to me about that. Well, all right, let me give you the issues here in a second. Uh, I'll do that right now because it's a, uh, um, hang on, we keep putting them in so quickly. The data's it, coming it, in it, as we're it, talking. We're, we're, we're losing them here. Here we go. Most important issue here, economy trumps immigration. It's still basically the same, but if you remember in Iowa, immigration was a little heavier here. Economy, that's not surprising. New Hampshire, always a bit more economic-centric. Trust me, talk heating oil is normally what you want to do here. So that is somewhat of, I think, 
tells you a more moderate electorate says it picks economy more so a conservative electorate you usually have more of the immigration number but i want to show you a few other things it shows you the big difference between iowa and new hampshire so for instance we've got the questions about if donald trump is convicted is he fit to be president in new hampshire look at this 50 percent said yes 47 percent uh, said no now in iowa these numbers were 65 right and here was 31. So if you need to know the ideological difference and what type of voter is showing up in the Republican primary, this is a pretty good distinction here. It, what we're seeing shows you this is a much more moderate electorate, a much more independent electorate, uh, an electorate that is much more favorable to Nikki Haley's messaging. 49 to 47 right now, registered Republicans versus registered independents, undeclared, if you will. Mm -hmm. That number's still helping Nikki Haley. It's still, still a good number for her. Absolutely it is uh, on that front. And, and by the way, I've got a few other things here. I think we have the, do you think the election, did Biden win legitimately? Look at this split. 49-49 in a Republican, supposedly a Republican primary. Just to remind you, did in Iowa, the numbers were 66 uh, who thought Trump won versus 31 uh, who thought, excuse me, 29 who thought uh, that, that uh, Trump won. So uh, you see this is a much different electorate, a much different set of voters. And look, this is Haley's electorate. This is the electorate yeah. she needed to have a chance here. So we got some drama. Okay, second wave is in. Uh, we're still watching, waiting for the polls to close tonight. Still about two and a half hours to go. We're joined tonight by our all-star panel here. Hogan Gidley, he's a former White House deputy press secretary during the Trump administration. Steve Hayes, editor and CEO of The Dispatch and an NBC News political analyst. And Tara Setmeyer, she's a senior advisor to the Lincoln Project and a conservative political analyst. We thank you all for being here. Steve Hayes, I want to start with you. You get that data, that second wave of exit polls and that Chuck just talked about. That could be a good night for Nikki Haley. What, what do you pull from those numbers? Yeah, I mean, certainly if you're in the, the Haley campaign right now, this is exactly what you want to be hearing. Doesn't mean that she's going to win, doesn't mean that she'll end up on top at the end of the night. But of all of the possibilities, this is the one that you are hoping for. We had a reporter from the dispatch uh, spending time with the people who were trying to wrangle independence on behalf of Nikki Haley last week. And the, the assumption at that point was if she could you know, in the best case scenario, she could get to, to within single digits. This seems to be greater than that for the people who want Nikki Haley to win, for the people who are trying to get independents to vote for Nikki Haley. Hogan, you think former President Trump's a little nervous going into tonight? You know, he, he had a speech two nights ago where he said, hey, if I win this, we got to wrap it up. It's essentially over. He was hoping voters came out for him, Republican voters. Still very early in the night. You think he's a little nervous about this? I've not spoken with him, but I think they're pretty confident right now. I spoke to actually someone who works on the ground in New Hampshire has been a political expert there for decades, not affiliated with Donald Trump. And he said he still sees the numbers around 13 percent for a Trump win. A long way to go, obviously. The first number is encouraging to Nikki, as Steve just said. Uh, but but Trump is right. I mean, if he does go on to, su to succeed here, um, he'll be he'll be two and oh, the field's oh and two. He'll win Nevada and then obviously South Carolina. A big chance for him to knock Nikki out of this. Tara, what do you hope happens? Uh, well, I think that it's a fait accompli that Donald Trump will be the nominee. But it's interesting to watch and see whether the electorate here in New Hampshire would actually move forward with voting for someone like Nikki Haley. Um, I think a lot of people are surprised that it's come down to just Nikki Haley and Donald Trump at this point, that the party has coalesced so much around Donald Trump at this point. But what I hope happens, uh, I mean, it would be if Nikki Haley overtook Donald Trump and actually won this and pulled that miracle off, I think that would be... Would you have hope? Because it just sounded like you uh, have no hope left. Uh, well, I mean, I don't think it... For this purpose right here, I think it's... it's It would add to the drama and just... For me, it would be the just drawing out the inevitable because from this point forward, there really isn't a path for her um, come Super Tuesday. And the Republicans, and Hogan knows this, the Republican Party and state party chairs have basically made sure that Donald Trump um, takes it takes everything pretty much by Super Tuesday because they've changed the rules in a lot of states and made them winner take all. So even if she were to pull the miracle off tonight, it would be a great political story. But the in the inevitability of Donald Trump becoming the nominee is really set stone based on the calendar. Steve, if you talk to the Nikki Haley campaign, they'll tell you, look, they got the ad buy in South Carolina. They're right. headed there next. She was governor there. There's only been 40 delegates in Iowa, 22 in New Hampshire. Even if she loses tonight, she's going to Super Tuesday. Do you buy that? Yeah, look, I mean, 
everybody who has looked at results of an election or polls that suggest that Donald Trump's support is waning or is that he's done or he's finished, I mean, how many times have we heard that? So take all this with caution. Even if she wins by a couple points here, you take all of it with caution for the reasons that Tara suggests. But I, I think if you're Nikki Haley, your argument is we've waited for a long time to have Donald Trump face one other person. This is that time. Um, there's softness in, this, in the party's support for Donald Trump. That is clear. Even if you look at the numbers that Chuck was referencing about Iowa and the number of Republicans in Iowa who think Donald Trump is not qualified to be president if he's convicted of a felony, 31% is a big number. You lose elections if you don't have 31% of the Republican Party supporting you. You lose elections if you don't have a third of that number supporting you. So there are reasons for, for the, the, the non-Trumpers to be... It, it, it's encouraged. a good point, and I've heard this from other Republican strategists, right? 50% of Iowa Republicans, a red state, chose not to vote for Donald Trump. I mean, does he really have the party behind him? Yes, 100%. He's up 35 points in South Carolina, and here's an interesting point because we've been talking last week about all these endorsements Ron DeSantis had, for example, in Iowa with uh, Governor Reynolds, uh, uh, other evangelical leaders, and here we're talking about Nikki Haley and Sununu and that support. But did you, did you notice who was on stage with Donald Trump? All of these statewide office holders from the state of South Carolina, including Senator Tim Scott, who Nikki Haley put in that position. Right. So the fact is, people who know Nikki Haley best don't support her, and for all this talk that she's the fresh they, face, they, maybe, she's maybe the they fresh don't support message, her, maybe they fear former President President Trump. Well, well yeah. regardless, they're standing behind Donald right. Trump. Whatever motivated them to get there, they're there. And for all this talk about her being the fresh face and new ideas and turn the page, she was governor 15 years ago. She's, if anything, she's the old voice in this race. Yeah. Donald Trump's still the new voice. And I think she has a very difficult chance to win her home state of South Tara, Carolina. Derek, hold that thought. Yeah. Uh, Hogan, Stephen, stand by for us. We're going to take a quick break. Voters across New Hampshire are still casting their ballots at this hour. Our correspondents spread out across the state. We'll check in with them and get a look at more exit polls. You're watching special coverage of the New Hampshire primary. from Tel Aviv. We are live tonight from Juarez, Mexico. Reporting over the skies of Lahaina. Here in Florida. The time to evacuate has come and gone. You were seeing people just running for their lives. People running for their lives. Hundreds of Israelis have gathered to demonstrate. What do the people in Gaza, do you think, what do they need most? A place where Palestinians and Israelis have found common ground. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. And welcome back to our special coverage of the New Hampshire presidential primary. NBC News chief political analyst Chuck Todd is here at the big board joining me live. Once again, Chuck, we've got our second wave of exit yep. poll data. And there's a big data point we kind of want to keep hammering, at least at this point, because it could tell a lot about where this race may be headed. Talk to us about that. It is simply who voted today. Yep. And so far, according to our exit polls, we have a basically a 50-50 electorate, 50 percent, half of the electorate identifying as Republican, frankly, slightly more than half the electorate, identifying either as independent 
or Democratic, right? This is, this is the split, 53-47. This is the recipe for Nikki Haley. To give you a, a, a more of a reminder of just how sort of less Republican this is, yeah. here's the MAGA question here in New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, you're a member of the MAGA movement. People who identify, identify fully with, with former Brad, President Trump, yeah. Right? So that, his number, 46%. The non-MAGA number, 50%. And in Iowa, that number was about the same, 50-46. So I don't know if it, it, but it tells you this is a divided electorate. Mm -hmm. This isn't Trump country per se. And I'll tell you, this is why I was so, so hesitant. Even though you didn't see the, or feel it on the ground, the more sometime New Hampshire voters can react, the more inevitability starts to be thrown in their face. Right. Um, so it is why these, these quirky independent voters, they wake up. Some of those storylines that Trump had this locked up, all the endorsements. We've you're seeing something different, at least right now. Exactly. Look, this is what happened to Obama and Clinton in 2008. Right. It was, oh, this race is over. Obama's about to wrap up the nomination. And then Clinton. And New Hampshire voters said, yeah. hey, hang on a minute. And that thing got drawn out. Look. I, I, I accept the premise here that this is after this, I don't know where else she wins next, yeah. but start to follow the rules of the primary. Yes, he, changed, he helped change the rules in some of these places where Republicans only vote, winner take all. But there are states like Michigan and South Carolina yeah. where independents, yes, even Democrats can either change their registration and vote. So she has other opportunities to at least start to pierce him if she indeed pierces him here. All right, Chuck Todd, we appreciate it. Let's take a walk here. If you're just joining our special coverage of the New Hampshire primary, we want to get you up to speed right now. So polls, some of them closing at 7 p.m. Eastern, some of them closing at 8 p.m. Eastern. You can see here, still have about two and a half hours to go. This is our big board, right? Our board of all of our remotes, all of our correspondents, people voting. There's even cameras that, that are hidden inside the studio people don't know about. Look at all these amazing correspondents. We're going to go over to REM21 if we can. Brett Holy, our amazing director. And that, of course, is the great Hallie Jackson. Hallie, talk to us about what you're seeing in this first exit poll, the second wave of exit poll data, because it sounds like it could potentially be some good news for Nikki Haley. I mean, listen, it's exactly what her campaign would be wanting to see. And obviously, I think people are waiting to see until we get actual numbers, actual data from the voters who are out here. Like at this spot that we've been showing you in Bedford, New Hampshire, you can see the line behind me. Um, this is basically where we're allowed to stand at, the, at this point here in the evening because people need to have the space to get out and to actually cast their ballots. Now, listen, the argument from the Haley campaign really since this became officially a one-on-one -on -one race, and even before that, since Iowa, was that she could potentially pick up some momentum here in New Hampshire, carry that into her home state of South Carolina, which votes in just about a month, of course, and then potentially be in until Super Tuesday and beyond that, which is early March. That is what her campaign has laid out, even in a new memo today, describing their strategy here. Of course, that relies on what happens with that critical block of undeclared voters here in New Hampshire. For former President Trump, it is a different calculation. It is about motivating the Republican base. He is already, and we have seen this now, try to, try to consolidate the field behind him. He and his allies are hoping for this kind of GOP show of force, if you will. He's been appearing with his now former rivals like Vivek Ramaswamy, like uh, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, who has now endorsed, of course, the former president. I caught up with Tim Scott today and I asked him, what does a good, good night look like for the Trump campaign? Uh, because I will tell you, I also asked that question of former President Trump. He didn't get into numbers, but Senator Scott suggested 10 points would be a good night, roughly double digits, 15 points may be a great night. You have to also remember what is motivating some of the Republican voters that we have seen, at least in the Republican electorate broadly based on polling, and that is these multiple indictments of former President Trump. Uh, the idea that these Republicans, many of them, have rallied around him. Ron DeSantis, even today, one of the now formal rivals who has endorsed former President Trump, is blaming his own campaign, uh, dis dissolution essentially, on the fact in part that many Republicans rallied around the former president after his first indictment back in March, and that that was a factor in seeing some of that energy move over to the Trump campaign. I asked the former president about that when he was at a polling location down in Londonderry not too long ago. Uh, I want to play a little bit of that back and forth here. Do you believe that that's propelling your campaign here? I don't know, I don't know, but look at look at what you're having here. I can tell you, you know I did great here in 16, and you know I did great here in 20. did better in 20. There is no comparison between what we have today in terms of enthusiasm and even the last two campaigns. Would you agree with that? I voted for you twice, Donald. You know what? And now you like us even better, right? 
So he's talking to, obviously, supporters who had come out for this sort of surprise stop from the former president at that location. Really, he and his campaign focusing on the enthusiasm piece, the turnout piece, as in many ways, Mr. Trump is looking to cast an eye toward November, toward the general election, looking even past tonight. The question, is that even going to be possible, right? If Nikki Haley pulls off some kind of upset, if in fact she ends up having a stronger than expected showing here, Tom, and again, the, the, the allies around Nikki Haley, Governor Chris Sununu, for example, who I've spoken with on the campaign trail, they're not saying she has to win. The, the expectation has been a strong second place finish. So we'll see. Tom. Yeah, yeah. Those expectations have changed slightly, uh, but that's what they're saying right now. Hallie Jackson, we thank you for that. As we look up at our live remote board, I see Shaq Bruce is up there in live remote 22. Brett Holy, if we can hit Shaq right now. He's just north of the Massachusetts state line talking to voters there. Shaq, what are you learning from, from the voters you've talked to today and, and what's the atmosphere feel like? Hi there, Tom. Well, look, we've been talking with voters really all across the state. We were about an hour and a half north in Laconia. Now we're in Milford. Both are fairly bellwether towns. So back in 2016, if you look at the results, at least on the Republican side, the results in the towns mirrored what you saw out of the entire state. And you heard a mix of opinions, but I'll tell you, so Especially when you saw polling coming into today, is that many people said they didn't make a decision until the past couple of days. And you heard some people say, oh, it was because of endorsements by candidates who dropped out. Or I saw what happened, literally two people talked about Dixville Notch and what happened up there and Nikki Haley winning in that area. And then there's also the action on the Democratic side. And for that, I want to bring in a friend here that we just met a couple of minutes ago who just cast your ballot. The process is over for you. Which primary did you vote in? So the Democratic. Who did you end up voting for? Dean Phillips. Why Dean Phillips? Um, because I felt like Biden, while he's done an excellent job for our country, it was really time to show our youth that it's time for fresh people to come in with new perspectives and take over and help us lead through this country. How much of it had to do, how much of your vote had to do with the back and forth with the DNC and trying to change the position of New Hampshire and Biden not even appearing on your ballot? Not a ton. Um, being a registered Democrat, I just knew that in this state we are traditionally more Republican and I feel like we needed more people who are more willing to be open-minded and really look at what our, uh, the language of the country is going to be. You told me you didn't make a decision until this weekend. First, how common is that in New Hampshire? And secondly, what went into you making that ultimate decision? Not sure how common it is. A lot of my friends and, and rel um, neighbors are pretty set in their ways. But okay. um, for me, it was conversations with friends just about the past four years and what we've seen. And, and prior to that, what we saw happening throughout the country. And a friend just said, hey, have you seen Dean Phillips? Like he did a great TV ad. And I was like, oh, OK. So I showed that. And then I went and just kind of looked through his website, looked for what he was standing for, what his thought process was. And it kind of swayed me to say, OK, Joe's done a great job, but it's time to move on. If you look at polling, now you, you made your vote clear, but if you look at polling, it looks as if we could be heading toward another Biden-Trump rematch. That's mm -hmm. before we know what New Hampshire voters do here yeah. today. But if that ends up happening, what are you thinking? What's going through your head and your heart? Oh, it's definitely Biden. <laughs> um, if that happens, you know, I... I can't support Trump, unfortunately. It, it doesn't show to be respectful of anyone who's not on his side. And to me, the four years where we were just trying to get through his, his administration and then going into the 2020 primary, it was the time I felt the most scared I've ever felt in my life. Um, I don't want to go back there. I feel safe and respected in my in my with people in my country that I know that are on the opposite side, it, I feel safe and respected here in this town. Thank you so much. Thanks for staying and sticking around with us and speaking to us. Thank you. Have a good one. And look, that is just a sign of, again, you have two primaries here. A lot of the attention and activity is on the Republican side, but you also have Democratic voters who are also coming out looking to make a difference.
with a good reminder that the Democratic primary is also happening, a sort of Democratic primary is happening in New Hampshire as well. We're going to go right next door and a little further south to Nashua, New Hampshire, where Dasha Burns joins us. Dasha, you had been on the campaign trail covering the DeSantis campaign from the get-go and that surprise dropout over the weekend. It's obviously shaken up this race a little bit. We won't know until all the votes are in. Yeah. But tell me what you're hearing tonight. And, and do you feel that those DeSantis voters are essentially all going to go to Trump or are they just not play today? A whole lot of them are going to Trump just because DeSantis did campaign for a very different voter base than Nikki Haley did. He was not with his policies and just his approach to uh, speaking to voters. He was not trying to court those moderates and independents where Nikki Haley's trying to play. He was trying to chip away at Trump's base. And so not surprisingly, our data has shown this and I've heard this anecdotally. The people that were supporting DeSantis are mostly flocking to Trump, which just creates a steeper hill for Nikki Haley. But Today, we've been seeing some fascinating trends that really do reflect what you've been showing there in the exit polling data in terms of who's showing up to vote. But here's what's fascinating, Tom. And while I talk to you about this, I want uh, my cameraman, Chris Jackson, to just show you uh, the picture behind us because uh, democracy is happening as we speak. You see those um, cute polling booths back there that are the sort of old school traditional curtains with the stripes. I just love the, the traditional New Hampshire vibes that we have here. But listen, the, the folks we've been speaking to are a whole spread of Trump voters, Haley voters, and I've run into a surprising amount of people coming in to write in Joe Biden's name on the ballot. So that makes me wonder when we are seeing that 53 percent of um, undeclareds or independents plus that 8 percent of Democrats, who are they voting for, right? They might be going for Haley or Trump. That's certainly where Haley finds her strength. But are some of them showing up to vote for Biden, to write in his name? Because that has been a major campaign from Democrats in this state. And we really have seen uh, uh, people of all walks doing that, right? So we're also hearing it's voters really reflecting the language that they've heard from their candidates. People voting for Haley are talking about the chaos that Trump brings. That's, of course, a line that she's, she says on the campaign trail. People who are voting uh, for Trump are calling Haley a globalist. That's, of course, what Trump has been saying in his ads and on the campaign trail. So you're really seeing kind of the airwaves reflected in reality as we talk to voters today. Uh, but again, Again, it's just a surprising spread as we've been bopping around polling locations that aren't necessarily MAGA country. These are the places where Haley has opportunity, where she needs to run up her numbers. Places like Nashua, Gosstown, where I was earlier, she's going to want to be getting about 50 percent or so. But again, the question is, how many of those independents on declares that Haley's going for are actually coming in and writing in Joe Biden instead? Tom? All right, Dasha Burns for us from Nashua tonight in New Hampshire. Dasha, we appreciate that. Our special coverage of the New Hampshire primary continues throughout the night. Polls are still open, and we'll be right back and break down just how the NBC elections team prepares for a night like this and how they know when to make a winner projection. Stay with us. The 
NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. Fire has grown a leaps and bounds. You see behind me is typical. How you doing? Um, pretty, pretty bad. Welcome back to our special coverage of the New Hampshire presidential primary. Our countdown clock ticking closer to that 8 p.m. Eastern poll closing time, as you can see. It's a straightforward choice for Republican voters tonight. Just two major candidates left in this race. Former President Trump, who scored, of course, that first big win in Iowa, looking to add to his lead and knock out his final GOP competitor. And it's do or die, many say, for Nikki Haley in the live free or die state. The former U.N. ambassador has the endorsement of New Hampshire's governor, Chris Sununu, who's very popular in the state. But will that be enough to move the needle, or could a defeat tonight spell the end of her campaign? I want to bring in some experts to break down what we know so far. Michael Denny, he's a GOP strategist in the state of New Hampshire. And Neil Levesque, he's the executive director of the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College. Thank you both for joining us. Neil, I want to start with you. From the exit poll data you've seen so far in this second wave, what stands out to you, and, and are you seeing signs that this could potentially be a good night for Nikki Haley, of course, with a caveat, it, it's still very early. Well, it's still very early, and we conduct the polling here in New Hampshire, and I'd be the first one to tell you that if you try to predict what New Hampshire voters are going to do, it's, it's a fool's errand, and anything can happen. What we do know right now is some of that exit polling, but that can be skewed because somebody who has a certain opinion goes to work early and then get exit polled. Um, what we do know is that the Secretary of State has been sending out more Republican ballots to some of the towns that have run out. That shows that there is great interest uh, in this election and his voter turnout levels, which were high, uh, may be exceeded. So at this point, we know there's a lot say, of interest. Say that, Neil, we can you say really that one more time? Who that's going to... Neil, can you say that sure, one more time? Secretary Explain State, that that's a new data point for us tonight. So the Secretary of State's been sending out ballots to more towns Republican ballots. That means that if you expected X number, it's X plus Y now, and that there is a great interest in this election. That wouldn't necessarily point to one candidate or another, but it certainly shows that New Hampshire voters are engaged in this election and they're coming out to the polls. Higher turnout, Neil, does that tell us anything? Can we read those tea leaves? Well, that means that uh, potentially a lot of undeclared voters are going to the polls because you'd be going to the polls and declaring yourself as a Republican and that the polling site wasn't necessarily ready for that number coming in. Uh, so it could show that more undeclareds are coming in and more undeclareds are more motivated right now to go to the polls. Mike, you know, we're pulling whatever data points we can from these exit polls and obviously the votes will matter at the end and we're obviously going to report that and project that. The polls, though, going into this election tonight, I mean, they were overwhelmingly in, in favor of former President Trump. Do you think it's going to be a different outcome? No, I don't. I, I see it as a very strong night for the former president. Uh, but, uh, you know, like Neil said, th we're having record-breaking turnout today. Uh, probably 50,000 to 75,000 more votes than we've ever seen in New Hampshire before. Uh, so it, voters are engaged. I think it'll be a great night for Donald Trump. But we don't know exactly what undeclared voters are doing. Both uh, undeclared voters and Republican voters are hyper um, excited about this, about this campaign. There's actually two two primaries within the Republican primary because Donald Trump is so strong with Republican voters, but Nikki Haley has generated a strength among undeclared voters. So as we all know, it's coming down to how many undeclared independent voters are showing up to vote and are they Show, are they showing up to vote for Nikki Haley in large numbers, large enough numbers to overcome Donald Trump's strength among Republican voters? Michael, as a strategist, did Nikki Haley do anything wrong in the lead up to this election? Could she have done more in the primary state? I think she could have done more. I think she should have opened herself up more to independent voters. She, she had, had very successfully had town hall meetings all throughout the last nine to ten months. She stopped having town hall meetings about ten to fourteen days ago. She should have continued them. I think she should have had the debates with Ron DeSantis. The, the bottom line is when you're an insurgent candidate, 
I should say, I don't think she ever took the mantle of, of the insurgent candidate the way she should have. You have to open yourself up and take advantage of every single opportunity. And that means town hall meetings, uh, debates, opening yourself up to the media, having regular press conferences, interacting with the media, using them as a resource to reach independent voters. That's what she could have done a better job of. Neil, before we go, talk to us about the counties you're going to be watching into the lead up until polls close around 8 o'clock. Where are you watching closely to see if there's either an upset or a very tight race? Well, the first polls really to close are going to be Concord, New Hampshire, which is uh, our capital city. Those will be closing at 7 o'clock, but it's more of a liberal area. So early on, it could be that Haley shows up pretty well in the, in the early data, but I would be watching some of those beltway towns with Massachusetts that have a lot of new Republicans and a lot of Republican strength, actually. Neil and Mike, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining our special coverage of the New Hampshire primary. I'm sure we're going to check in with you guys later. Polls are still open, and our NBC News decision desk is working hard as the numbers come in. I want to show you our live remote wall. We obviously have correspondents spanned out across the Granite State. We have cameras at polling locations where voters are voting. We even have the UN. Look, this is a camera here on the United Nations, in case you were wondering what that is. Rem number 36. But one of the most important people in our entire election night is this guy right here in live remote number 32. You may not know him. You may have never seen him before, but he is part of the brain trust here at NBC News because of our decision desk. He helps us understand how and when we can call a winner. His name is John Lipinski, and he's a great guy. And he's going to explain now how NBC News and other news organizations are able to project winners at almost as soon as the polls close. And obviously, news organizations came under attack from the DeSantis campaign in Iowa. So, John, the floor is yours. And walk us through this. How, how is NBC News able to project a winner right when the polls close in New Hampshire? Possibly. We'll see what happens tonight. But in 2016, we, we reported it pretty close to 8 o'clock. Yeah, well, um Thanks for having me. Let me walk you through the process. So one of the things that I, I'll say is before we make any projection at NBC News, we absolutely have to be confident in putting in that check mark. We technically have a, a standard of at least 99.5%, but the reality is we can't be wrong at all. So it really is, is quite a bit higher than that. And so what we're doing through is we're pouring through a number of different types of data. So in the case of New Hampshire, we're interviewing people. We're doing exit polls. Uh, we've already interviewed over 2,000 people. We'll probably Probably get you know to over 3,000 people before the night is over, and we'll have that be uh, you know we'll have we we're looking at that actually obviously right now as we're reporting out on it, and we'll we'll report out more on it later throughout the night. So we look at that, but in reality, when we're actually making these projections, we're using statistical models to make sure we're absolutely confident. And if there's a huge spread in the race, we might actually be able to project a race off of uh, of an exit poll. But in reality, we usually are using vote data, and we're pouring over that vote data. And the re what we're really looking at is, is we in instances to how quickly we can call a race is dependent upon how close the race is. So if there's a lot of spread, we're able to actually call it uh, with less of the vote actually counted or tabulated. But if it's a really close race, we usually need a lot of that vote. More important though than the uh, more important than how much vote we have in is where is that vote from. So tonight, for example, there's 237 townships in New Hampshire. So when we're looking at that data, we really want to pour over to make sure that we have data from all different types of places geographically across the state. We also want to have data from places that are high Republican, high Democrat. So we're pouring over that data and we're also looking at all the historical data that's out there. So we're making comparisons to what happened in past elections. We basically take all of those ingredients together and put it into dozens of different statistical models to make sure what, that we're looking at model after model that's basically telling us the same thing that we absolutely know who the winner is going to be. And then when we absolutely know that and the entire team agrees uh, that we're right on that, that's when we put a check mark in. So in the background here, you're seeing my decision desk. So this is not even, this is not just me. This is a, a team of experts that have, you know, a lot of knowledge on statistics, but also a lot of deep knowledge of substantively about politics. And we're pulling all of that knowledge together and all of that data together be, to make projections. So, John, you know, in 2016, there were about 280,000 people that voted in the Republican primary, give or take. Um, they're, they're predicting record turnout for this primary, right? Upwards to possibly 330,000. I think that's the top line. That was the highest I've seen so far. If there is record turnout, how does that affect when you can make a projection call? 
Well, it's not so much how much the ter how many people actually vote, it's how many of those votes we actually get in and where they're from. And so we also, by the way, even though we use our models to actually figure out like candidate spread and who's going to win, right now, right, we're actually, we, we've collected data in over 70 precincts to try to measure that turnout. So, I mean, it's a little bit early in the night to absolutely know where that number is going to be, but I can confirm from our own analyses, and we're running statistical models on that, we know that there's going to be, you know, sort of the turnout is going to be high. It's John going to be, you know, well, yeah. Okay, John Go Lipinski ahead. for us. John, we appreciate all of you. I'm sure we're going to check back with you throughout the night. We're just minutes away from 6 o'clock. Some polls will be closing in about an hour from now. Our special coverage of the New Hampshire primary continues right after this. Welcome back to our special coverage of the New Hampshire presidential primary. We're back now with some breaking news. Uh, NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli joins us now with a shakeup in the Biden reelect campaign team. Mike, what can you tell us? Well, Tom, according to two sources familiar with the matter, Jen O'Malley Dillon, who is currently part of the White House staff, she's a, a deputy chief of staff, will be moving out of the White House and to the campaign headquarters in Wilmington, Delaware. This is a significant move because it speaks to what a, one source tells me is the fact that the Republican race has effectively, in their view, ended so quickly. Donald Trump has consolidated support so quickly that they are now taking steps that they had planned to take down the road, but at a far earlier stage. Now, I'm told that Julia Chavez Rodriguez remains the campaign manager, uh, that the president continues to have confidence in her. But Jen O'Malley Dillon, is important to note, was President Biden's campaign manager in the 2020 general election. She has been coordinating a significant amount of the strategy from the White House. And this speaks to exactly the kind of advice that former President Barack Obama was giving to President Biden directly about the need to have the senior advisors, those deeply involved in the strategy, in Wilmington at the campaign head headquarters to, to make sure that decisions, important strat strategic decisions, are being made much more quickly, much more seamlessly. And so uh, it, this is, will be read as a, a shakeup of the campaign. There has been a lot of criticism uh, of the Biden team for, in the view of a lot of nervous Democrats, not necessarily uh, showing the kind of urgency in their planning for the general election that, it, frankly, a lot of Democrats feel about this race. And so a significant development, Tom, as it relates to how the Biden campaign is viewing the next 
phase of this re-election campaign, uh, and, and certainly uh, the cert an indication of the concerns that are held at the highest level, including President Biden himself. Mike Memoli with that breaking news tonight. Mike, we appreciate your reporting. Former Obama and Biden campaign manager David Pluff joins us now. So, David, how can we interpret this? We heard Mike's reporting there. Uh, is this a concern for the Biden team that we need to shake things up and start to get serious as we approach November? I don't know. You know, all the campaigns I've been a part, when you get good new talent in, Jen's not new talent, she ran the last campaign. But I think what it speaks to is just a general election in all likelihood starts tonight, unless we're super surprised, and Haley either wins or comes really close. Uh, and I think that means that you've got to accelerate your plan. So uh, this is gonna be a very close race. It's gonna be you know a point or two or three in six or seven states. Uh, Jen is one of the best operatives in the Democratic Party of the last generation, so I'm personally thrilled uh, that she's making the sacrifice. She's got a young family. Washington's not that far from Wilmington, but still it's uh, uh, it's something that I think all of us that are uh, committed to, to making sure that Donald Trump doesn't get a, another turn in the Oval Office. It's good news. Mike was reporting on criticism the Biden reelect team had gotten in the months leading up to this moment. If you were advising President Biden at the time, would you have told him he needed to do something like this? You, you think this is a good move? Listen, I think you've got to. What, what I don't think works in politics is it's like in baseball. You can't have three shortstops. Right. So even a talented people in the wrong roles doesn't work. So as long as they're being thoughtful, which I'm sure they are about the role people like Jen are going to play and I'm sure she's not going to be the last one who comes to Wilmington right. because ultimately you want a campaign to be fully empowered uh, to make you know 90 95 percent of the decisions and those at the White House uh, largely need to let them do their do their thing you know last week it's funny this this race is going to take so many twists and turns but last week a lot of the conversation was former President Trump could win this nomination and he could possibly win, win the election. And then uh, a, a new poll comes out and it's, it's the Consumer Confidence Survey, uh, the Consumer Sentiment from University of Michigan, and it shows that it's up and it's up a lot. It, it came up a lot from December. How much do you think that e those economic numbers are gonna play into the president's favor as we, as we move closer to November? And if the economy gets on better footing, will his poll numbers slowly creep up, do you think? Of course it's helpful, but I would encourage full patience by anybody who's gonna watch this campaign, because we have about a thousand lifetimes between now and, and when people start voting in, in early to mid-October. So yeah, there's some sense. I think the biggest thing that's happening, and the question is can the Biden campaign capitalize on it, you saw a good percentage of Iowa caucus attenders, okay? These aren't just Iowa Republicans, yeah. not choosing the president. And my guess is you're gonna be north of 40, maybe even 45% tonight. So that's a target-rich environment for Joe Biden to figure out if you can pull, not most of those people, most of those people come home to Trump. That to me is significant. But of course, the people's statistics don't matter in the economy. The consumer confidence one might be an outlier. It's yeah. how people feel. Right. And if they're feeling a little bit more secure, but of course, you know, one of Trump's great strengths is People remember 19 pre-COVID mm -hmm. uh, that they felt pretty good about the economy. So Joe Biden's got to at least get to even on the question of the economy. And then questions like democracy choice are additional issues where he may have an advantage. The top two issues for New Hampshire voters, at least in that second wave exit poll data, the economy and immigration. Is there enough time for President Biden to have some type of victory when it comes to the border? Or has or that, that, that battle been lost? Well, listen, I think it's important to deal with real math and real facts. And, and, you know, over the last decades, you know, border crossing has increased. Yeah. And there's very sophisticated modeling to show what we can expect. So that pressure is going to continue. This wasn't manufactured by Joe Biden. It's higher under Trump than Obama, higher now. So I think the question is, will Republicans on the Hill uh, meet Joe Biden and create a deal here. If not, I think they're gonna to have to look at some executive orders. I think the border is both a real problem and a political problem, there's no question about that. You have the Democratic mayors in major cities calling out President Biden, calling out the White House, trying to go to the White House to get more funding. Do you think those problems and those discussions get to a point where they can get on the same page with this or do you think, do you think that's gonna to continue to be a problem for the president? No, I think if those mayors believe that real effort is being put forward, to slow the influx into the city and better, I think, thought given to things like expedited work permits and things to get people in the workforce, that would be helpful. At the end of the day, when you think about the small percentage of people outside of Milwaukee, uh, outside of Madison, Wisconsin, out in Maricopa County in Arizona, 
you know, that is a, a state on the border. But I think a lot of these upper Midwestern states, I'm not sure how much vote is actually going to be driven. Because again, I've spent enough time in politics. Yeah. I've had a million reporters ask me, well, that's a political problem. And my answer to political problems is, if somebody's going to vote differently than they were going to vote, that's a political problem. And I think we have to be careful about that. I think the economy is still a much more salient issue for the people that will determine this election. David Pluff, we always appreciate your analysis. We thank you for being here on, on Big Night. NBC's Garrett Haig uh, joins us now from the Trump campaign headquarters in Nashua, New Hampshire. Um, Garrett, what can you tell us so far about where Team Trump is and, w- and what they're saying with this sort of second wave of exit poll data coming in? And some of the numbers, at least, and it's very early, looking you know, promising for Nikki Haley. Yeah, uh, Tom, it's interesting. I just had Eric Trump stick his head into the ballroom here a minute ago, the former president's younger son, asking us what we have heard at this stage of the night in a campaign. It is always a bit of a guessing game. Early data is notoriously unreliable. Turnout's up in some places and down in others. It's like trying to put together a puzzle when you can't look at the picture on the box. All you have is the pieces, and you're trying to figure out exactly who knows what and when. So the Trump team team is looking at a similarly muddled picture of what we're in uh, right now as, as we are. I can tell you they've been very confident throughout the course of the day today. Donald Trump was very confident today when he talked to reporters, including myself, outside of a polling place earlier today. And we talked a little bit about the general election. And I've been struck listening to some of these comments here, the changes on the Biden team, about the ways these campaigns are posturing now towards November beyond just what we're seeing in New Hampshire. I've been very focused on these voters who I keep talking to in Iowa and in New Hampshire who were Trump voters in 16 and in 20, but say they cannot be Trump voters again. Either they're dead committed to not voting for Trump or they're sort of on the fence. They might leave the top line blank if it's Trump and Biden. And I asked the former president today, what is your strategy to get those people back? How do you put a coalition together that doesn't include those people? I was very struck by his answer and it connects to the conversation you all were just having. Let's listen to that exchange. You've talked about trying to unify the party. How do you bring these Nikki Haley voters, some of whom voted for you in 2020 but say they don't want to now? Oh, they'll all vote. How do you bring them back into the tent? They're going to all vote for me again. They're going to all vote for me again, everybody. And I'm not sure we need too many. I'm not sure. I think that Biden is the worst president in the history of this country. But we're going to all come back. They're all coming back. And I think you see that here. So he basically said three things there, Tom. One we throw out entirely, this idea that they're all going to vote for me. I don't think there's any data that supports that. It just felt like a throwaway sentence. The second is the idea that it's about Joe Biden and the idea that Biden would be the motivating factor to bring these Republicans back into the tent. And the third, maybe the thing that I think in his mind is the truest of all, the idea that he doesn't think he needs these voters. That the, the Donald Trump, and probably to a lesser degree, the Trump campaign believe, they can continue to do a strategy that has always worked for them in primaries and worked for them once in a general election, which is to just maximally juice the turnout of his most committed followers, perhaps to the detriment of every other sort of subgroup of voters, and that that can be enough to push them across the finish line. And in the context of everything we're seeing in the electorate in New Hampshire and everything we're seeing about Joe Biden apparently uh, changing gears here a little bit to prepare for November, I think it's a very telling answer from the former president today. Garrett, before you go, I do want to get your take. There's there's now been a lot of reporting that, that the Trump team has sort of pressured Republicans, or at least put the heat on them, to, to sort of coalesce and come around former President Trump, especially after the oh, win yes. in Iowa. We've seen a lot of people come around, establishment Republicans, former rivals, and then we had this statement from the RNC chair just before uh, we got we came on the air, essentially saying that if, if Trump wins tonight, the party needs to rally around him and support him, and, and only two states have voted. What have you heard from your sources in the Trump campaign, and is this something that, that you've seen, sort of this, this, this hush campaign that's now getting louder and louder almost to a, a shouting campaign to make sure Republicans get behind former President Trump. Oh, yeah, Tom, there's nothing hushed about it now. I think this really started in the lead up to Iowa, the Trump campaign making it clear to lawmakers who were still on the fence or who weren't publicly committed to the former president that the time was now and that Trump was going to remember who was with him and who wasn't with him as this election really got underway. I mean, Donald Trump is somebody who carries around a lot of those memories and grudges sometimes of people who he thinks have been either disloyal or uh, unsatisfactorily publicly defending him or publicly loyal. 
scale. And the campaign has upped that pressure in public and certainly in private. They've benefited and really tried to amplify the endorsements they've gotten from the other candidates who've gotten out of this race, like Doug Burgum and Tim Scott, Vivek Ramaswamy, who's become a pretty uh, energetic surrogate for the former president. The Ronna Romney McDaniel thing is particularly interesting, obviously, because she is supposed to be neutral in this race, at least as long as it's still a contested race. The RNC does not get involved officially in these kinds of primaries. But, uh, you know, the RNC is at some point going to become uh, very tightly connected with the Trump campaign, if indeed Trump's the nominee. You're not long off from a joint fundraising agreement and from the time in which the candidate, the nominee in waiting, let's say, or, or, or a de facto nominee, depending on kind of where we are in the process, becomes uh, enmeshed with the RNC in a serious way. And I can't help but think that that might be part of uh, Ronna McDaniel's uh, statement tonight, sort of saying, look, we're all moving this direction, e even her. Yeah, but even 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 she could be surprised tonight as we're just getting started here. Uh, Gary, we always appreciate your reporting. We have just passed the 6 p.m. hour here on the East Coast on a pivotal night for Republican politics. And we are less than two hours away from final poll closings in the state and possibly a projection. And our first look at the results. Polling locations are packed with the critical after work vote as people rush to make their voice heard before polls close. The big question tonight, will the voters of New Hampshire deliver an upset victory to an underdog candidate or will they choose former President Trump yet again? Former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, now the last challenger standing, but a loss in New Hampshire, the early state where she has the strongest chance of winning, could be lethal for her campaign. The former president on the trail this week in New Hampshire saying he's ready to wrap this up and move on to the general election. A reminder of what's at stake tonight, New Hampshire's 22 delegates and momentum as the primary season picks up. Our reporters are out at polling locations across the state talking to voters and at both campaign headquarters for those watch parties. One of them will be a victory watch party. And of course, Chuck Todd is at the big board tonight standing by to break down the results as they come in. But first, right now, I wanna get back to our Hallie Jackson who's at a polling site in Bedford, New Hampshire right now. Hallie, uh, we've been talking to you all night over the last, you know, hour and 10 minutes so far. We have some exit poll data, but it's still yeah. it's still early in the night, right? We have no idea where this, this election is going to go. But you did spend some time with former President Trump, and, and you, you spent time there in New Hampshire this time around. What were you picking up on? So the question, of course, Tom, is what happens with this really critical block of undeclared voters, right, in the state of New Hampshire? And I should tell you here at this polling location in Bedford, you can see it, clock it. We've got about 50 minutes left before polls close at this particular site, and it has been packed all day, just a steady stream of people. I want to bring you inside here. As we're seeing some of this exit polling here, including some new exit polling that suggests that a majority of the Republican-leaning voters here, Donald Trump and Nikki Haley voters, um, are looking to see one of them, of course, in the White House here on the conservative side. Let me show you here. This is the line where people queue up, where they go, where they cast their ballots. And so when you ask about, Tom, what we've heard here and what I've heard as I'm talking to voters across the state, it obviously depends on which, right? Nikki Haley voters. They tell me in many instances that they simply cannot cast a ballot for former President Trump. That is one of the rationales that you hear. I've also heard people talk about the fact that she is younger, the generational change argument that Haley has been making, that she seems to have more energy. Uh, that is another fact that comes into play. As for supporters of former President Trump, you're going to hear from one in just a second. It tends to be about wanting to get him back into the White House. They liked what he did in 2016, uh, and they want to see that again now here this election cycle. I'm bringing you over to this whiteboard just to give you a sense of who's turned out. So this is where they're tracking. Literally every hour that this polling location has been open, they've been updating the boards. You can see about 7,000 people have turned out to vote at this location so far. The majority of them, of course, Republicans. This is a red city, a red leaning town here in New Hampshire out of about 15,000 registered voters in all. So you're looking at roughly maybe a 50% turnout here or there with again, 50 minutes to go until polls close. And you can see that by a bit, it's undeclared voters that have the edge in voter registration here. So this is going to be one of those interesting towns to look at to see how does Nikki Haley do here, right? Is she able to get a majority of those undeclared voters? I'm going to walk back outside here. Or will it be people casting ballots for former President Trump? People like Jen, who has been waiting patiently here and chatting with us. Jen, thank you. So you just voted here in Bedford. Yes, I did. Tell me, are you registered one way or the other? Are you undeclared? I'm a Republican. And who'd you vote for today? Donald Trump. Why? Well, because I think he has a good track record. I think he's been an excellent president, and I'm hoping he can get the border crisis under control again. Did you entertain any other candidates? Did you ever consider anybody else who'd been in this race? 
I did consider Nikki Haley, but at the end of the day, I decided to go with Trump. Because of the reasons you laid out? Yes. And just because I wasn't too familiar with Nikki Haley's track record. Who do you want to see as maybe a potential vice presidential pick if, in fact, former President Trump is the nominee? We've seen a lot of his, his now former rivals coalesce behind him, appearing on stage with him. What's your sense? Maybe Nikki Haley. You would be behind that? I think that would be pretty cool to have a female vice president. Uh, uh, Jen, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you for chatting with us. Um, and, and I'll let you get on your way as you've been waiting patiently okay. here. Thank you very much. Uh, listen, this is all obviously going down here on the Republican side of the ledger because that is where the contested situation is, Tom. Um, and so, listen, you heard it there. This is a sense of what we're seeing on the ground. As you heard Garrett lay out, former President Trump feeling hopeful, optimistic. Uh, we'll see. Tom? Hallie Jackson for us doing her thing. Hallie, we always appreciate that. We're back at the big board right now with NBC News chief political analyst Chuck Todd, who joins us now. So, Chuck, um, you've been telling me this throughout yeah. the night. The voters in Iowa, the voters in New Hampshire, they're different. They oh. may call themselves Republicans, but, but, they're, but they're different types of voters. Talk to us about the, the biggest split here. It couldn't be. A, look, how about evangelicals, New Hampshire, one of the least sort of religious states in the union. Look, 81% of Republican primary voters yeah. do not identify as evangelical. 19 do. Just for comparison's sake, in Iowa, the yes was 55, and the uh, not evangelical was 45. So there's one massive difference massive. In, in, in how this is. But it isn't just in evangelicals. We can sit here and go to the MAGA movement, for instance. Are you part of the MAGA movement? In New Hampshire, 64% said no. Well, in Iowa, it was 40 uh, it was it was uh, it was 50% that said no. So again, you see a much more moderate electorate, a less Trump electorate, which is the recipe she needs to pull this off. Obviously, the other thing we've been looking at is things like this. If Trump right. is convicted, uh, is he fit to be president? 50% said yes. Well, in Iowa, that number was 65. <laughs> Now, remember the basic spread in Iowa, yeah. right? About 52, Haley was in the mid-20s. So you can see here, if you start to, you could see how this race looks like it could be shaping up as a split where the party is, right. where it's a, a single-digit split between the pro-Trump forces and the anti-Trump forces. There was a data point that came in. I'm going to let you set it up here mm -hmm. on the board and tell our voters a little bit about it. It was basically about ideology amongst the GOP primary voters in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And when we first got this data, this is uh, exit poll data, second wave, and it showed that six in 10 New Hampshire Republicans yeah. identify as conservative. And, and you were saying there, there's a caveat here. We should be a little careful. Well, there is. I mean, look, so when, when somewhat conservative uh, outnumbers very conservative, in a Republican primary, that is usually advantage moderates. That's advantage the college-educated wing. That's advantage the Chamber of Commerce wing, whichever you want to say. So this is like, for instance, in Iowa, the very conservative number was, uh, here we go here, the very conservative number was 51. The yeah. very conservative number. So you see the difference in this electorate. Somewhat conservative. Just because it's somewhat conservative, that doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna go to Trump. Correct. This, if, and in fact, if Haley wins, she should carry, it, it, she should win somewhat conservative. And these moderates, and her, those obviously, are Haley these voters. are ones she's gotta win by double digits, and obviously the, 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 those self-described liberals there. So ideologically, when you look at this, Again, it looks like, but I, I just want to caution. Right. I've been here before. Yeah. With New Hampshire, especially because of those independent voters. They're so hard to poll. They're so hard. The formula right. is so, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when Pat Buchanan was beating George H.W. Bush, yeah. according to the exits. And George H.W. Bush won by double digits. So we are, I, I just can't emphasize enough, as much as this data certainly yeah. looks like a competitive race. You always got to be a little extra careful in New Hampshire. You know, the pollster we were just talking to out of New Hampshire brought up a good point. He said a lot of that early exit poll data mm -hmm. may be different from the later exit poll data. People getting off work, coming in late, making sure they want to vote. So there used to be a theory. That? There yeah. used to be a theory that the, the the person that couldn't vote until after work was more likely a working class voter. Right. Okay. So who's the working class voting candidate? Right. In this case, that would be Donald Trump. So in theory, he's getting the late deciders. The most enthusiastic voter is usually the first one at the polls. So there is why there's sometimes you see this overstatement in exits. You have people that got there early and they want to be there. They've been voting before five o'clock. So the voter after five o'clock is somebody our exits haven't captured yet. Before we go, I know you have some, mm -hmm. some data also on the MAGA vote too. You we want do. to talk about? Well, okay. I think we just, yeah, we were, we were showing that earlier with the MAGA vote. Uh, but 
it is a massive difference. 64% are not a member of the MAGA movement. And again, these are GOP in, voters. In Iowa, they don't is, identify as MAGA movement. These are New Hampshire GOP voters, yeah. Tom. Okay. And I do want to emphasize the New Hampshire Republican primary electorate is the single least conservative electorate we will see all year long. Right. But for maybe Virginia. But and to be the, fair, the too, of Columbia. the polling on MAGA versus mm -hmm. Donald Trump, we talked about this here in Iowa. Donald Trump always polls better than MAGA because MAGA sometimes. It, it, yeah, it, there it, are people, people say, oh, I'm for Donald Trump, but I'm not MAGA. Correct. No, yeah. there is, I think that it, th so this doesn't mean this is the split right. here. And he does well with traditional Republicans. Yeah. In 2016, he wasn't. He's the candidate both of traditional Republicans, we were showing you that before, yeah. Ted Cruz, right? He basically took his vote and the Ted Cruz vote. He's united these sort of tradi more traditional conservative Republicans and married them with his populist working class uh, base. And this is his part, that's his version of the Republican Party. Haley's trying to use the Chamber of Commerce wing plus some moderates and um, disappointed left-leaning mm -hmm. independents. It's, it's not a way to win a nomination, but it's a way to win the New Hampshire primary. Chuck, we always appreciate you, and I know you're going to get more exit poll data getting, as the, as the night goes on. There. Uh, we're going to take a short little walk right here. We're always checking in on our panel over here, just get a quick look at them, making sure they're working. You guys working? Of course. All right, always working. Never working their sources. All right, we're going to come over here because we want to talk to the chairman of the New Hampshire Republican Party, Chris Ager, who joins us live now here on our special. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for joining us. I, I do want to put a quote up on the board because I wanted to get your reaction to this. This is the chairman of the Republican Party, and she put this out even before the polls closed in New Hampshire. I wanted to get your take on it as we put the graphic up here. Our, this is RNC Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel, and she essentially said if President Trump comes out strong tonight, that's a clear message being sent from our primary voters. She goes on to say, Republicans know that if we're not united as a party behind our nominee, we won't be able to beat Biden. What is your take on this? She essentially, it sounds like she was trying to possibly influence the vote even before the polls closed in New Hampshire. Well, the, the polls don't close uh, until 7 o'clock here. Some of them... Uh, the rest of them at eight o'clock. Until then, we've got to let the voters decide. Um, and I don't think she was trying to put her toe on the scale at all. It's just kind of factual that New Hampshire is a very friendly state for someone like Nikki Haley uh, to mount a, a, a vigorous campaign. And so if she can do well here, then game on to South Carolina and Super Tuesday. If not, then perhaps uh, a campaign would reassess if they can't win here in a very favorable uh, location, you know, maybe they should reassess. So I think we've got to let the voters decide. And then after that, uh, each campaign can assess what they need to do. But I do want to get your, your, your take and, 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 a, and a solid answer on, on if you were upset she did this, because former President Trump has talked about the system is rigged, a corrupt system. And, and it sounded like here there was almost somebody trying to sort of put their hand uh, on the scale a little bit in former Trump's favor. And that's not what New Hampshire says they're about, correct? Oh, yeah. And, and look, people here are very little influenced by what people say, especially from out of state. Uh, but even our governor, he's been promoting uh, Nikki Haley, which he absolutely has every right to do <laughs> in his position. Uh, but it's really the candidates and their positions that impact the voters here. Endorsements matter very, very little here in New Hampshire. The live free or die electorate it makes up their own minds based on what they see in the candidates. So I, I see zero impact on her comments at all. And I don't think uh, the voters really put any stock in it whatsoever. And again, I don't think she was trying to put her toe on the scale. She knows New Hampshire voters, uh, and, and there's no possible way that could impact any votes at all. Mr. Chairman, I do want to ask you, what, what is the biggest difference you notice between 2016 and 2024 as far as the primary voters in the GOP are, are concerned? Former President Trump won that primary. We know he won by, by, by a large amount, beating John Kasich and, and everyone else that was still left in the field there. What's different this time around? So I think this time... Um, what's, what's different is he has a track record of what he did while he was in office. So we know what he would do when he's in office. Good, bad, or indifferent, we know what we're dealing with. Uh, the second thing is that th we saw the border and the policies that President Biden had eliminated that President Trump put in place and the impact of those. So we know that what he, President Trump did worked and President Biden reversed it. So there's a, a very, very big uh, motivation uh, to retire Joe Biden and let him um, retire out his last uh, senior years, not in the White House, uh, but enjoying himself. So the Republicans want to get rid of Joe Biden, 
They know what President Trump's all about. Uh, and Nikki Haley, they're getting to learn what she's about. And so we've got a great choice between two really good candidates and may the best person win. And after that, reassess the campaigns, figure out who we're going to get behind as time goes on and win in November. Number one criteria for the electorate here. We need to win in November to restore some sanity into Washington and the White House. Mr. Chairman, you, you did mention uh, the former or the current president's age. I, I do have to ask you, Nikki Haley has been attacking the former president's age, her Republican rival as well as being too old. I, is that a, an attack point you think will resonate with New Hampshire voters? I don't think so, because Saturday at a rally, uh, President Trump was electric. He stood for about an hour and 45 minutes didn't take a sip of water, didn't miss a beat, not a single flub. President Biden can't get past two sentences without a flub. He went an hour and 45 minutes, engaged with the crowd. He looked very, very healthy. Uh, we don't discriminate against people on age. It's about their capability. And President Trump looked very, very fit. And again, so does uh, Nikki Haley. She's extremely fit. Uh, so we've got two good candidates. Mr. Chairman, we thank you for your time. Thank you for being here on our special coverage of the New Hampshire primary. Speaking of age, speaking of flubs, uh, I want to talk to our panel now and bring up some things that did happen in New Hampshire and some major flubs. Hogan, you know, the, the former president got a lot of uh, attention, media attention, uh, not great attention, when he confused completely uh, Nikki Haley's name and Nancy Pelosi's name over and over again, in, in, over a few sentences. Um, he got a lot of flag for this. Was that fair or do you think that was a, a, a stumble? Well, some would argue they're not all that different, but that's a different conversation to have altogether. Uh, no, I just think those things are kind of uh, throwaways for people to point at him because Biden makes so many of these mistakes on a daily basis because he can't walk, because he can't talk. He's got the questions in front of him. He knows what, what reporter to call on. He has the answers in front of him. I think the left and the media just say, look, look at this, look at this. This guy made a mistake too. But I think it doesn't really matter at this point. Biden has a pretty hefty body of work on making mistakes on the stump. Uh, speaking of mistakes, I, I should introduce our new panel guest because some people may be saying Tara looks a little bit different. Sarah <laughs> Matthews, thank you so much for uh, for joining us here. Uh, Steve, I, I do want to go to you. Do you think that attack line that sort of Nikki Haley honed in on the last two days of this primary campaign in New Hampshire, basically saying Trump and Biden are around the same age, we need to push these these older gentlemen out and, and make room for, for newer and younger blood. Yeah, I mean, I, I think she should have been using that argument for a while now. Um, and it doesn't have to be an age argument. I mean, I think if you're, if you're, you've got people here paying careful attention to what happens in New Hampshire tonight and among Republicans, the activist base, they really care what happens. You've got some Democrats who are, you know, looking at Joe Biden. They really care what happens to Joe Biden. You've got a majority of the country, as borne out by our NBC polls, that look at this potential competition between these two men and say, how is this happening in our country? Isn't the country better than this? Some of that has to do with age, but a lot of it has to do with the things that Donald Trump says when he's at his most coherent, saying, I need immunity so I can commit all the crimes. Well, that might not be something that he said by accident, but it's scarier if he said it by purpose. You look at Joe Biden having trouble, as Hogan says, getting across the stage, having trouble you know, finding himself in these verbal cul-de-sacs, not really knowing where he's going with his rhetoric sometimes. The country looks at this contest and is just depressed and discouraged. When I was in New Hampshire last week, we talked to voter after voter after voter who said, how did we end up with this as our potential choice? Sarah Matthews, you worked uh, in the Trump administration as well, just like Hogan did. Have you noticed a, a change, a difference in former President Trump than when you worked under him? It, it's been a while since he was in the White House. It's been a while since I covered him in, in 2016. The chairman of the New Hampshire party calling him electric. Does he have the same energy level he did since you worked with him? I actually would disagree with that. I think that he's kind of lost his fastball. We haven't seen him out on the campaign trail nearly as much, partly because I think that, um, you know, he has to deal with all of his trials and court cases and things like that. And they're trying to conserve money and not hold as many rallies. But I also do think that he doesn't have nearly as much energy and he does seem to be confused on the campaign trail. That instance with uh, him confusing Nikki Haley and Nancy Pelosi, that was not a singular instance of him being confused. 
there have been multiple times where he's had multiple gaffes like this. He said something like that he was running against President Obama. That never happened, obviously. Maybe he confused him with Joe Biden. Um, he said something about how we needed to stop World War II from happening, confusing it with a potential World War III. And so this shows that there is maybe some concern with his mental acuity. And Nikki Haley seems to have waited a little bit to fire this attack and be as aggressive with it until the final days of the campaign trail. And it was something that I wish she would have brought up sooner because it does appear that Trump has been slightly confused on the trail. Yeah, Hogan, um, on the part of, of working for it, right, working hard enough in New Hampshire, we had this conversation in Iowa. Did, did he work hard enough in New Hampshire, do you think? Who, Donald Trump? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, Donald Trump was the former president of the United States. He does have a body of work as the chairman there of the GOP in New Hampshire just pointed out, and the American people understand that. But yes, he has other things too with the onslaught of the weaponization of three-letter agencies, the government going after him, his businesses, his family, uh, staff, et cetera, et cetera. And so he does have to fight multiple wars on multiple fronts. He was able to do that in the White House and not just weather that storm, but succeed in spite of it. This is another instance where as president, a former president, he doesn't have to do the same things that someone like a Ron DeSantis would have to do doing all 99 counties or someone like a Nikki Haley would have to do is plant her flag in New Hampshire because everyone knows him already. So it's a completely different dynamic for him versus the rest of the field. Stephen, have you been surprised with the amount of Republicans, even establishment Republicans, um, who they would never call themselves that, but elected U.S. senators, representatives, governors who have come out and supported former President Trump and then those who ran against him and have not endorsed or supported his rivals. I'm talking about Chris Christie, Mike Pence, others who decided to stay quiet and not maybe help them. Um, I'm gonna ask you a lot of questions here. Do you think those endorsements of Chris Christie or Mike Pence would have hurt Nikki Haley, ultimately New Hampshire, if they backed her? And are you surprised about all the other Republicans coming around former President Trump after just one contest? No, I, I think endorsement, endorsements from those candidates would have potentially helped her. I mean, I think if she's made clear what she's running as she's running as the Trump alternative, they would have endorsed her as such. And I think it probably would have helped coalesce the, the Trump alternatives. I guess I am a little surprised that some of the elected Republicans who ha have gone on to endorse President Trump, in part because we've heard them be so critical of the former president in the days on January 6th and the days following January 6th, some of them calling for him to be prosecuted. You had people like Marco Rubio, you had Mike Lee, very critical of the president and his role there and in his role of uh, in the weeks before January 6th, where he pretended that he won an election that he lost, that his staff all understood that he lost. So you have to ask those people, are you comfortable endorsing and campaigning for somebody who you have previously said lied about winning an election and was willing to trigger violence in order to, to remain in, in office? And apparently they are. That does surprise me. Sarah, but talk to me about maybe this pressure campaign. And it was no longer a whisper campaign. And it's basically telling people you, you should back former President Trump. I mean, that pressure campaign is real. And you know former President Trump doesn't forget. Loyalty is important to him. And he's going to be remembering who was there for me before Iowa, after Iowa, before New Hampshire, and so on. Yeah, and I think a lot of these politicians are making those political calculations. They kind of see the writing on the wall. They see that it looks like it's inevitable, that it's going to be Donald Trump as the Republican nominee. So they want to get ahead of it and endorse him. And I think it is disappointing just because if we actually as a party cared about winning, then I wish that those Republicans would be endorsing Nikki Haley, who in poll after poll, it shows that she would easily beat Joe Biden in a general election. One poll even showing her up 17 points against him. And that poll was conducted by Trump's own pollster. And so I wish that those folks would be lining up to endorse her, but I think that they are seeing um, the writing on the wall feel like it's Donald Trump's to lose, and they are thinking of potential cabinet positions or VP slots, right. and so that's certainly a factor. Hogan, before we go? Yeah, just real quickly. Campaigns are tough, and people use a lot of harsh rhetoric during them. Let's not forget it was Kamala Harris who called jo uh, who called Joe Biden a sex criminal and a segregationist from a debate stage. She's the vice president of the United States, so these fences can be mended over time. And I think the rawness of this, when Trump was asked, would you consider someone like DeSantis on your ticket or somewhere in your cabinet, he said, this stuff's really raw. Even he understands the back and forth kind of leaves scars. Give those things time to heal, and then people come on board and say, what's more important? Um, 
you know, my own personal vendetta or making sure we don't have the opposition party in, in the White House. And I think if Republicans coalesce, they'll do really well in November. All right, Hogan, Steve, and Sarah, we thank you for your time. I know you guys are going to stand by for us. You're watching special coverage of the New Hampshire primary, and the countdown to those critical results is on. We're breaking down everything you need to know over the next several hours, and we'll continue to bring election alerts as they come in. Stay right there. Possibly a trillion galaxies. Yes. That is a number that is just so hard to compute. Whether it's the moon, whether it's Mars, it feels like we're on the cusp of something big. Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. All right, welcome back to our special coverage of the New Hampshire presidential primary right here on NBC News Now. You can see the countdown clock just behind me. We still got about an hour and a half, a little less than that, before the polls close. When it does, all of these polling sites we've been monitoring throughout the night across the great granite state are going to be closed as well. Our decision desk will be able to make the first characterization of this race around that time. But if it's too close to call or if they don't have enough data, we're obviously going to wait. You heard John Lipinski earlier. We want to be around 99.5 percent sure when we make a characterization, when we make a projection. The choice for voters is between the last two candidates standing, former President Donald Trump and his former UN ambassador, Nikki Haley. Haley insisting a loss tonight in New Hampshire will not mean the end of her campaign, saying she'll compete in the primary in South Carolina, a state where she served as governor for six years, but where she trails the former president by big numbers in the polls. But in a sign of how the Republican Party is thinking about this race, RNC Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel saying, quote, if President Trump comes out strong tonight, that's a clear message being sent from our primary voters. I want to get right to Ali Vitale at the Haley campaign headquarters tonight. And Ali, when, when everyone, when, when this reporting from John Allen hit our, our inboxes, everyone sort of said the same thing, like, wow, this is a big statement coming from the RNC chair. How did the Haley campaign take it? Look, it's a big statement coming from the RNC chair because she said the quote that you have there, Tom, and then she also said that the other message that voters in the Republican primary were sending is that because people like Tim Scott and Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy are all now supporting the former president, that they are asking for unity, and unity, of course, doesn't happen as long as Nikki Haley is in this race. I have to say that over the course of the last few days, the best word that I can use to describe the tone and tenor of the Haley campaign is defined. They released a memo earlier today saying that they were going to be staying in this race, not just through New Hampshire and her home state of South Carolina, but all the way through Super Tuesday. Her campaign manager making an assessment that the best states for her are ones that kind of look like what we're seeing on the ground in New Hampshire, the ones that have semi open or just open primaries, pointing to places like Michigan and Texas, as well as Virginia, that are going to be good states for Haley going down the line. But look, you don't get further down the calendar until you get past 
today. And the response that they're giving us to the RNC's statement there is in part saying that there's, quote, plenty of time for Republicans to rally around the nominee, which this person told me they believe will be Nikki Haley. The spokesperson went on to tell me that we will stand by our statement that this is not a coronation. Of course, that's something that Haley said to me when I spoke with her one-on-one -on -one yesterday. And her spokesperson also saying only two states will have decided by the time New Hampshire is done. Let more people speak. They deserve a choice. Of course, that makes sense with what the Haley campaign is saying now, and it jives with what Haley herself has been saying to me and to voters across this state as she has been barnstorming in this final swing through Election Day. I can also tell you, just to bring you into the room here, You've been on these risers so many times before, Tom, especially when we were together in 2016. And look, this is a room that is empty now, but you're starting to feel a little bit of the energy and excitement start to move in, especially as we're seeing staff and top advisors to the campaign, to the candidate. You're talking to them and you're sensing, again, that defiant tone, but also excitement, because I think they are seeing exactly what we are seeing in the returns as to what the makeup of this electorate was. They're feeling the unpredictability, but they also think that the unpredictable predictability here is exactly what they have been banking on, because it seems like, at least in the interviews that Nikki Haley's been doing, that she feels she's constantly beating back against the narrative that this race is done, that it's cooked for Trump, and the unpredictability at least allows them the hope that that's exactly the opposite case of what we're dealing with tonight. Tom? Ali, fair to say that there was, though, a change in tone, and essentially they wanted to set the table and lower the bar in case they lost tonight. And I point out two things. One, Governor Sununu, when he endorsed Nikki yeah. Haley, said it was going to be a landslide, and then later saying, as we got closer to voting time, she doesn't need to win. And then that memo came out today from the Nikki Haley campaign saying, listen, you mentioned this, we're going to stay in this race through South Carolina. We love Super Tuesday. We have the money. We have the momentum. They went on from there. That, to me, sounded like they were setting the table because they were looking at the polls coming into New Hampshire that showed former President Trump with a very big lead. <laughs> Of course they're seeing those polls, and of course they're aware that any of the polls that initially showed Haley neck and neck with the former president were now several weeks old, especially coming out of Iowa and watching the former president's dominant performance there. We've watched the polls in New Hampshire show a much wider gap. It's in part the explanation for why you're seeing top allies like the New Hampshire governor, Chris Sununu, go from saying that Haley is going to win this state in a landslide to then saying, well, it doesn't need to be won. The only goal was to do better better in New Hampshire than they did in Iowa. And frankly, I asked Nikki Haley that question myself, especially in a race that's exactly what she wanted it to be, which is a one-on-one -on -one with former President Trump. There's only two people here who are actively vying for this nomination. What I asked Haley was, how is coming in second anything but a loss? Again, she continued to move the goalposts and say the expectation was never that she was going to win here, but that she was going to do better here than in Iowa. Of course, it's easier to come in second when there's only two people in the race. And of course, there were far more than that when we were back in the Hawkeye State just last week. Still, Haley not setting the expectation of a win, but what they are making clear is that a loss here is not a fatal blow to their campaign. All right, Ali Vitale with some fantastic reporting there from the Haley Watch Party tonight in New Hampshire. I want to bring in somebody from the Super PAC that is supporting Nikki Haley to get an inside sense of what they're thinking, how fundraising is going, and what the strategy really is. Joining us now here uh, live via Zoom, I, I, I guess, is uh, Priya. Is Sam Sudar. She's a spokesperson for Nikki Haley's Super PAC, Stand for America. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, I, I want to ask you, if you guys don't win tonight, is this a loss? It's a two-person race. You either have to win this or you lose this. There's no second place here. Well, thank for, first of all, thank you for having me. And second of all, it's absolutely not a loss. This is exactly what we want. We as we've said in the past, we want to do better than we did in Iowa. We'll come out strong. We're going to continue to build that momentum and head into South Carolina and Super Tuesday, building even more momentum, building more support and raising more money. Priya, walk me through the strategy. Looks, I kind of want to understand um, the, the poll numbers aren't favorable at all in South Carolina, right? It, it, it's a much redder state than New Hampshire. So if you don't win in New Hampshire, right, but let, let's say let's say the race is close, you, you head to South Carolina. Is that a, a must-win state, or, or you think you can keep raising money, keep losing state after state, and then head into Super Tuesday, and somehow this race turns? Look, we're well-funded. We've raised millions of dollars in the last few days, and we're going to do what's necessary to support her. At the end of the day, this is about electability, and Nikki Haley is the only candidate who defeats Joe Biden handedly. 
in every single matchup during the general election. Americans want a choice. 99% of Americans haven't, e American Republicans haven't even voted yet. You have 50% of Iowa Republicans who said last week that they aren't interested in a Trump redo again. You have 75% of Americans who said they don't want a repeat of the 2020 election. They don't want to for vote for Joe Biden or Donald Trump. Americans deserve a choice. The fact of the matter is this isn't season one of the crown. We haven't crowned Donald Trump the king of the GOP primary. Facts of the matter is Americans want a choice. Nikki Haley has winnowed this race down to a two-person race, and she deserves to give them a choice as much as Americans deserve to have a choice on the ballot. Priya, why did the why did sort of the, the messaging change on New Hampshire? It went from Nikki's going to win New Hampshire to saying, well, if we lose, we can still go on from there. I mean, was, was it the polling? Was it stuff you were seeing in your internal polls? Or is it just the reality that maybe former President Trump is more popular in New Hampshire? And again, there's, there's still about an hour and 15 minutes to go before the voting ends, so you guys could, could pull off a big victory and surprise a lot of people. But why did the messaging change? The message never changed at all. The fact of the matter is, is Nikki has always wanted to build momentum, and that's exactly what she has done. The fact of the matter is, is people have been telling Nikki and everyone else associated with the Haley campaign and the super PAC that she should have gotten out months ago. She should have gotten out to support Tim Scott. She should have gotten out to support Ron DeSantis. She should have gotten out to support Donald Trump. The fact of the matter is, is Trump has thought, and his allies have thought, that they can bully their way into uh having sole control of the GOP primary. Nikki Haley's not giving up without a fight. She has always said that she wants to build momentum. The fact of the matter is, is if we had told you even a month ago, two months ago, that Nikki would have gotten 20% in Iowa, that she would have knocked off Ron DeSantis, that she would be in a two-person race with Donald Trump at this stage of the race, y'all would have left us out of the room. The fact that the media, the Trump, uh, the Trump team, the fact that the D.C. establishment wants to bully us out of this race, it's not fair to Americans, and like we're not giving up without a fight. Priya Samsudar, she is a spokesperson for Nikki Haley's Super PAC. We thank you for joining our special coverage tonight. I do want to turn to that other breaking news we've been following tonight about the shakeup in the Biden campaign. Top advisor Jennifer O'Malley Dillon is expected to leave the White House for a leadership position in the Biden campaign. MSNBC anchor Jen Psaki joins me now live. She's also the former White House press secretary under President Biden. Jen, how do you interpret this move? It, it, it was expected for a while, Tom. I mean, there were rumors about David Pluff. There were rumors about other people coming in who have run campaigns before. The Biden campaign is hearing from donors. They're hearing from big supporters that they want more urgency. They want more momentum. So this is part of their answer to that. Now, Jen O'Malley Dillon ran the campaign in 2020, so there is confidence in not just her ability to run a national campaign, but also her knowledge of field organizing, the kind of county by county, state by state operation operation that a lot of his supporters really want to see picking up at this point in time. So it's a reflection of that. I haven't heard any uh, changes or people departing at this point in time. Obviously, I'm sure people will be reporting on that. But this is more of an addition, uh, putting somebody um, at the helm in a senior position who will give people confidence about their plan moving forward. As, a, as somebody who worked in the Biden administration, somebody who's worked on campaigns, what was wrong with the campaign? Were, were there things that just weren't going right at this point? And I know it's still early. Really? Yeah, it's very early, obviously. I'm not working on the campaign. I spent some time with them about two weeks ago. I think there is such a fear among Democrats and among supporters of the president about a re-election or an election of Donald Trump. And what they want to see out there is more aggressive uh, campaigning, more aggressive messaging, more aggressive setting up of operations in states. Now, to be fair to the campaign, it's still 10 months out from the election. There is time. What they are eager to do, and this is what I talked with them about when I spent time with them a couple of weeks ago is really make this clear to the public that this is going to be a race between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. There, of course, is a primary happening in New Hampshire. People are still voting. That's important to note. But as it, as it relates to the view of the Biden campaign, that's what they're preparing for. And what they are, what a challenge for them right now is that people have not settled into that, not just Democrats, but independents and never Trumpers who think there could be an alternative. So they're eager to run that race. And I think a lot of Democrats out there who are supporters want to see more urgency and action out there on the trail. That was already in planning, but I think Jen O'Malley, Dylan will give them more confidence about having somebody they recognize, they know in a senior position in Delaware. Jen, you know, we haven't seen the president do a lot of sit down interviews lately. Um, you mentioned the phrase aggressive campaigning. How, how does how does someone in their 80s 
do aggressive campaigning. I'm, I'm just I'm wondering how the, the campaign can sort of generate maybe that energy that the Democratic Party has to beat President Trump, if former President Trump, if he's the nominee. How can Joe Biden sort of manifest that? Well, I think what is a signal here, Tom, and we'll see what they do moving forward, of course, and I don't have any insight into that at this point, are the two democracy speeches that the president gave just a few weeks ago. That was really, in some ways, the launch of his general election campaign. You saw him out today doing an event on abortion rights, an issue that is unquestionably, in their view, going to be a big driver of getting voters out to the polls. Even people who may not be excited right now, there's going to be ballot initiatives on perhaps up to a dozen states or more uh, in November. And that's something that they think will help them as well. The way they see it, Tom, is it's about also really empowering uh, some of their supporters to be validators to their neighbors, to their friends. That's really the way that they're running this campaign. Some of that is on digital. It's on social media platforms. They're using that as an organizing tool. But a lot of it is also going to be through field, ground, grassroots operations as well. So that's how they're seeing it. A challenge for them, unquestionably, Tom, is we're also right now living through what is a historic level of uh, uh, criminal indictments and legal cases uh, that, of course, everybody in the media has a responsible to co ability to cover against Donald Trump, but that is like blocking out the sun of a lot of media coverage. So they are really focusing on targeted voter-to-voter -voter campaign, uh, campaigns and doing that in an organizational way while also thinking about how to pick moments like those democracy speeches and the abortion event today to really do big events to reach voters. Jen Saki, we always appreciate your analysis here on NBC News Now. We thank you for that. I do want to go to a bit of, of Thank of you, somewhat, Tom. thanks, Jen. A, a bit of somewhat breaking news. I want to bring it over here to our panel. If I can ask our control room to put up the uh, President Trump's tweet on Truth Social, just because as we read tea leaves into the night here in New Hampshire, I'm going to put this up on the screen. Hopefully, my eyes will uh, do me justice here. This is Trump tweeting: "So ridiculous that Democratic and Independents are allowed to vote in the Republican primary, especially since crooked Joe Biden has abandoned New Hampshire." But word is we are doing really, really well. Um, I, Hogan, I'm going to go to you first, and Sarah. I want to ask you right after. <laughs> it sounds like he could possibly be a little bit nervous. No. Um, let me just try and translate this because yeah. obviously being with the man every day for four years in a White House and on a campaign, um, he's making a statement, a declarative statement about what he sees as a big problem in the state of New Hampshire where you can have those crossover votes. And he's also kind of accentuating a point he's made on the campaign trail, which is Nikki Haley is the establishment candidate. She's part of the corporatist elitist wing, and she has a lot of Democrat support. And he's trying to point out the fact that as the Republican primary voters go to the polls, she's not your person. And that's really what he's trying to do. Sarah, how do you see it? You worked with him as well. How do you see it? Um, multiple things in this that I want to hit real quick. Um, first off, that uh, true social post is inaccurate. Yeah. Democrats are not voting in this primary. Uh, right. They could switch their affiliation, but that ended in, in October. In October. Yeah. So first off, that's a lie. You and don't then, think of Democrats voting in this primary? But I'm saying that they're not voting right now. If they switch their affiliation, they could Technically, could've. yeah, you had to switch their affiliation. Yeah. So, yeah. But yeah. that, that so, ended, yes, but he's been acting correct. like that they're showing up to the correct. polls today. Sure. And then on top of that, too, with independence voting, I think that if um, we were smart, we would be nominating someone like Nikki Haley, who actually has broader appeal beyond the Republican Party, because she's bringing those independents back into the fold. And I think that in, if Donald Trump is the Republican nominee, then this is concerning that there's this amount of people turning out to vote for her because a lot of these folks are anti-Trump. And so he would need to win them back over in a general to actually be competitive with Joe Biden. And so if we were a smart party, we'd be nominating someone like her who could um, bring those independents back into the fold. Yeah, Steve Hayes, there is a chance he's watching the coverage. There's a chance he's seen pretty internal chance. polling. And there's a chance, chance he, might not, be, he, may, he might not be too happy with what he's seen. And he, and he puts this post out there. Look, I, I look at Hogan, I listen to Hogan, and I think, that is a really admirable job at spin. <laughs> I mean, why would the president put that statement out at whatever it was, 609, if he wasn't actually currently concerned or frustrated by this. You said he put out a declarative statement. That's true. It's a declarative statement. But the timing of the declarative statement matters a lot, right? Of course he put it out because he's watching this or he's getting reports about it, and he's he's concerned. You know, maybe he has reason to be concerned. Maybe he doesn't have reason to be concerned. But if, if he were confident that he was going to go and win by double digits tonight, there's no need for a statement like this two hours before well, the polls close. Now you're saying no need. That's a whole different conversation okay, altogether. 
Whether he needed to post that or not is not the issue. The issue is he just wanted to say something declarative. And by the way, but I've received not because of, received, not because of what he's seeing. Well, okay. I've received nothing from the campaign telling me one way or the other what they're seeing. But obviously, you're talking about exit numbers that would tend to exit polling data. Exit yeah. polling that would tend to uh, give Nikki some hope here. But the fact is, this is always going to be close. I'm sure the campaign is still of the mind they're going to win this. The question is by how much? And to a point she made, which is Nikki Haley can broaden the support of the party, but she can't get the support of her own party. And while her person from the PAC was just saying how 50% of the people in Iowa voted against Donald Trump, right, but 81% of the people voted against Nikki Haley. So it's Donald Trump's party right now. He coalesces that MAGA base and the GOP voter. It's his job to go out and get more and unify and pull in some of those independents. Sarah Hogan, Stephen, stay right there. We're going to take a quick break. You're watching special coverage of the first in the nation primary. We're just minutes away from the first major round of poll closings in New Hampshire, and there's still much more ahead tonight. For the generation of now is NBC News Now. Back now with our special coverage of the New Hampshire primary. I want to welcome in North Dakota Republican Senator Kevin Kramer, who has endorsed the former president, President Trump, of course. Senator, thank you for your time tonight on our coverage of the New Hampshire primary. My first question, your, your predictions on how this ends up in New Hampshire. Yeah, well, my prediction is that President Trump's going to win and win handily. Um, regardless of all the uh, management of expectations I've noticed has been going on by both campaigns, it seems, a, a little bit lately, I, I, just, I just think it's going to be decisive enough that it really should, should end the race as far as I'm concerned. I understand, um, you know, Go Governor Ambassador Haley wants to keep the dream alive and she should do everything in, in her power to do that. But I really think after tonight, uh, it comes down to uh, a presumptive nominee. Senator, only two states, uh, around 60 delegates, uh, delegates going to be allocated after tonight. The race you really want it to be over, that's, that's best for the GOP? Well, first of all, the GOP has benefited tremendously from having a large um, stable of candidates running for the uh, the nomination. The problem is all of them were running, chasing uh, the former president, who you know I think by any measure has had a, has a, had all of the momentum and certainly has had the lead the entire time. So we've already benefited from showing off a really impressive group of of people who, who aspire to be a president uh, in this cycle and. Any one of them could be a good president in the future cycle or a good candidate. So I think we've already benefited from that. At this point, though, I just think it is time, at least soon, to coalesce around the nominee and make this race about all about Joe Biden and less about the Republican candidates. Senator Kramer, um, how did you come to your decision that you wanted to endorse former President Trump? 
Sure. So, you know, I was one of the very few members of Congress that supported him and endorsed him in 2016 very early. I think there was a group of five or six of us who did that. Um, he was <coughs> instrumental in getting me to be a Senate candidate and uh, become a senator. Uh, we worked very closely together on a lot of, a lot of legislation and especially regulatory uh, issues when he was in the White House and I was in the House for a couple of years and then in the Senate for a couple of years. I know him well. I consider him a friend. I supported, of course, my governor, Doug Burgum, all the while he was a candidate, but the day that Doug got out of the race, I called the president and said, okay, it's, it's time um, you know, for me to, to get on board. And uh, So anyway, I, I, I just think Donald Trump represents the best opportunity for Republicans to, to make the types of changes that the, that the people who are supporting him want to make, and that is to, to fight back against the bureaucracy, the over-regulated um, you know, government that we have, the, uh, obviously secure the border, secure the world, uh, get back to some peace and prosperity. He just carries that message with, a, with an authenticity and a believability, I think. The, the other thing is, as much as anything, he is the nominee. He's going to be the nominee, and I just think the sooner the better at this point. Yeah, besides him being the nominee, and I know you, you agree with him on issues of policy, how did the issues of policy and the agreements there overshadow his behavior after the 2020 election? Sure. Well, again, this is about the future, not about the past. At least it is for me, and I think it is for a lot of people. And, and remembering that one of the factors that we have this time that he didn't have um, in, in the last election cycle in, in 2020 is that Joe Biden has demonstrated that he's a really bad president. And they can make all of the changes in the campaign that they want to make. They can put higher you know, profile people and stronger leaders into the campaign, but they can't change Joe Biden. And they can't change his personality. They can't change change his policies for whatever reason. Even when Republicans try to give him good policies to, to support, he doesn't. So, um, yeah, I just think at this point we're down to a binary choice for a lot of people. And while not everybody may be as enthusiastic about him as I am, I think that a lot of people are going to be on board once we get down to uh, the presumptive nominee. Do you think his behavior will change at all if he's reelected to a second term? Uh, in, in, in the sense of what happened after the 2020 election, I mean, sure. could we see that type of behavior again? And what leads you to believe that we wouldn't? Because if you believe that could happen again, I, I can't imagine you would endorse him. Well, a couple of things about that. First of all, we're already seeing his behavior as a candidate um, evolve a little bit this week, right? Once Ron DeSantis got out of the race and endorsed him, Tim Scott, Doug Burgum, of course, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, um, you already saw sort of a, a lightening of the burden, if you will, and he, and he's talking unity and not, not you know, um, beating up on, on his uh, opponents or adversaries. I, I think you're already seeing that transformation. We, I know him well. I know he's very capable of, of being the most charming person in the room. And frankly, his personality is much of what brought people to him and and didn't bring people to um, to Governor DeSantis with all due respect to him. So, no, he's more than capable of that. He, one thing about Donald Trump that we all know, he likes to win a lot more than he likes to lose. I, I, he's, he's capable of doing what it takes to win. Senator, we appreciate your time here. We always thank you for, for coming on. Our coverage of the First in the Nation primary continues right now. Thank you, New Hampshire. I love New Hampshire. New Hampshire tonight has made Bill Clinton the comeback kid. Finally have a poll without a margin of error. <laughs> Mount up, everybody, and ride to the sound of the gun. New Hampshire. I'm here a lot. And then all of a sudden, we started getting numbers in, and everyone said, how come they like Trump so much? This is an NBC News special, Decision 2024, the New Hampshire primary. Reporting tonight, Tom Yamas. It is now 7 p.m. here on the East Coast, which means we are in the final stretch of this New Hampshire primary. Some polls now closed in parts of the state, the rest of them closing in less than an hour. A once crowded Republican field down to the final two contenders, former President Trump and his former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, locked in a head-to-head -head battle for the GOP nomination fighting for those 22 delegates at stake tonight. But more importantly for Haley, the night truly a make or break moment, possibly for her campaign. A major loss could be hard to come back from, though Haley has said she's gonna stay in this race either way. Her campaign spending more than $2 million on ad buys in New Hampshire, just slightly less than Trump, and perhaps more notably, the campaign spending a lot of time in the state, 
Haley on the ground in New Hampshire for 31 days compared to just 11 for Trump. A big investment on both fronts, one that has boosted Haley in the polls, but will it be enough to pull off an upset? Our reporters have been spread out across the state talking to voters and to campaigns. And I do want to get back to Hallie Jackson, who's at a polling site in Bedford, New Hampshire. Uh, Hallie, where you're at, did that polling site close or is it one of the ones that's staying open until 8 o'clock? Literally seconds ago, you hear the cheering? That's because they just announced that the polls have closed here in Bedford. Now, you're probably seeing all these people still in line. These are newly registering voters. They're going to be allowed to go ahead and cast ballots. They're going to do their thing uh, because they've been in line here at this exact moment. But listen, this is the first time that we've seen, frankly, this blue floor space here at this location because it has been packed all day. They've had roughly 7,000 voters come and cast ballots, the majority Republican here in this red-leaning town. Uh, and that's about half of the number of registered voters that they have all together. You can see, listen, this is it. It's, it's over. The folks are going to start packing up some of the gear here, but there will still be counting that happens, obviously. The votes will be tallied. They're actually still working on some absentee ballot processing over in the corner there, Tom. And so this is what's going to happen for the next little bit, as obviously some other polling locations here in New Hampshire will stay open for about another 60 minutes. Somebody who knows this process well is Bill Klein. He is an election moderator here. This is uh, your 40th year doing a presidential primary here in this state. You've seen a lot. Yes, I have. Yeah, it's been a wonderful time, almost all the time. Uh, it can be challenging at times. There's things that happen. And uh, I was a former uh, sports official and uh, did an NCAA Final Four in uh, soccer. And uh, it was through that that I got roped into by a group of citizens said, that uh, you'd probably do a good job as a modern, making quick decisions, learning the rules, knowing how to handle people, difficult, you know, the whole thing. And, and it's, it's been fun. And here you are essentially refereeing your 10th presidential primary in the state. Have you noticed a change over the years? Well, obviously there's been a few changes, but some of, the, some of the procedures and everything have been pretty well set down by former moderators. And when I had to learn how to do things and work with other people, we always you know, drew from the people that had been working the polls before us, tried to keep teams together. And that's what we've been doing here is trying to keep transition teams ready to go so that as we maybe move or whatever happens to us, hopefully it's moving not yeah. upstairs or downstairs, but, you know, someplace else that, uh, hey, we've got a good continuous uh, election process that our voters can expect good experience when they come in. And that's the way Bedford's been. Last question for you. How has it been finding new elections workers to come in or finding election workers at all right now? COVID was huge. And many of, and this is true throughout the entire state and probably the country, that uh, most of our uh, ballot clerks especially have not been under the age of 60. So when COVID hit, that was the group that definitely didn't want to be here and join us. We did require certain things, you know, the masking and everything. Uh, did every, everything we could, but a lot of those said we don't want to work, and they haven't come back. So it's getting new people. But now, this crew here, we've got about a total of, I think it's 80 people that work today's election here, which is, uh, it, I don't think we're the biggest polling place in the state or the country, because only if the other polling, big polling places use one single place. When, if they use multiple polling places, right, right. then it changes the numbers. But the number of workers we have, very high percentage, uh, have already worked at least one election, so they came into us experienced. We do training every year to make sure everybody knows, and the election laws change. Our equipment's changed. We've got these electronic poll right. pads, you, you had magic too. machines. Oh, I'm sorry, Bill. You mentioned, too, that you, sometimes it's hard to find some new election workers as well because of the pressure. It is. And, and on top of that, uh, you know, the state of New Hampshire, same all across the country. I've seen some news articles, and uh, we've had election officials that have quit because of the way they're being treated. And that's a tough thing because these are volunteer people. These are people that come out. 95% of our volunteers do not get paid. They could if they wanted to but they elect not to, so it's a volunteer thing. They're devoting their days, they're devoting their time to this, to the voting process, to democracy, and Bill, you've done that for 40 years. Thank you for what you do. We appreciate you talking to us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Tom, there you have it. I mean, it's interesting to get the dynamic of how these things actually come together. Um, and now, again, over here is where they're doing some of the processing. We're able to walk around and roam a little bit because, obviously, the polls are closed. That's it for this location. So, Tom, we're going to go uh, find some other voters, chat with folks as we start to see in the next little bit some of the 
data, some of the returns start to roll in. So, Tom, I'll send it back to you back home in New York. Wait, Hallie, before you go, is someone playing uh, saxophone in there? Is there is there a little jazz? Uh, well, what, what's going on? I'm, I'm trying to figure that one out. Oh, there there you friend go. over here. Yeah, this is, this is Ricardo. If you want to listen to some smooth tunes as people are cleaning up and counting, he's got uh, all the good vibes here on New Hampshire primary night. No matter who you vote for, the vibes are very chill. <laughs> it sounds like democracy. Uh, Hallie Jackson, we thank you so much for that. We really do appreciate it. I want to get back over to my friend uh, Chuck Todd. He is at the big board. And Chuck, uh, as we look for exit poll data, yeah. uh, you, you have something very interesting. We're talking about turnout, record turnout. What, what well, are we this, seeing? This is now our estimate that we're able to do based on our own exit polling, our own little sampling of precincts, plus working with the Secretary of State. So look, we are seeing... That's a record, right? That would be an all-time record. Most ever. No Republican presidential primary has been over 300,000. In theory, this is the type of turnout that a challenger like Nikki Haley would need, right? This indicates that what we reported in our exit polls, which indicated that this is an electorate that seems to be pretty independent. Look at this, 45% of the electorate be, be one of the most uh, independent electorates that we ever had. Um, so you're seeing there's plenty of, we look here in the party identification. I mean, this is another reminder that all of that together, so that high turnout means we got a bunch of independents. You know what was interesting in the last Suffolk Boston um, Globe poll that came out when people asked were they voting for or uh, for Nikki Haley or yeah. against Donald Trump? It was pretty much even. It was about 45 45 for Nikki Haley voters. You think people are motivated to come out vote in New Hampshire against former President Trump? I think you see some of that. Like it's not clear. I mean, I will right. say this: the exit poll seemed to indicate no. People are voting for Nikki Haley a little right. bit more than I think. We went into it assuming, I think, too much uh, in that other way. But look, this is simply a different electorate. Yeah. I mean, we've got some ways to um, to compare this to, to the Iowa. Let me uh, get it over here, make sure we, we got them very quick so people can quickly see these comparisons. Uh, and here we go. So part of the MAGA movement, yeah. right? 46% of the Iowa electorate was part of MAGA, just 32% so far from part these of, exit polls, uh, okay. of MAGA. And again, exit polls, as you as you fairly yeah. uh, note there, we have a bu bunch of things here. The difference between, did Biden win the election legitimately? Uh, he did, did not, did not win legitimately. 66% of Iowa Republicans thought that. Only half of this electorate thought that. That, I think, is a pretty good indicator of what, of what the core Trump vote is for what it's worth. 49 is an interesting number now, isn't it, right? We can look here. Um, if Trump's convicted, right, is he fit for office? Right. Not fit for office in Iowa is just 31% of that electorate. Here, 47%. You would assume that number is a pretty heavy Haley number. Yeah. Look, I don't want to sit there and batch it up, but right. that 49, 47 feels like uh, some numbers yeah, we should be watching. I, I do want to ask you about the process tonight. We spoke with our, mm -hmm. our decision desk uh, elections director, if you will, John right. Lipinski, who was walking us through the night. Mm -hmm. Polls have closed in lots of parts of the, many parts of the state at Correct. seven. If you have more than, I think, 300,000 residents or something, you, yeah. you close at eight o'clock. So it, when Look, we make a call. As you see, we're going to get some, we're not making a call this hour. Yeah, we're not okay. making a call this hour. We will not We should call. remind voters, 2016, we were able to call eight, at 8 p.m. Right. Eastern. We don't think that's going to happen. We don't know. We don't I, look, know. in fairness, yeah. we're watching. We're, we should but get a lot of a little later. We should yeah. get a lot of vote count in in this next hour. Okay. And we do our own sample. Pre we have actual physical people at specific precincts that we want to know early returns on, and it's a way to find out if we can call. Yeah. We were able to do that in Iowa. Right. We had these people on the ground. We have these same people on the ground. But look, you heard him. It's a ninety-seven per plus percent. Right. You know, uh, uh, likelihood that we have to have. I will be shocked if we are anywhere near that neighborhood at 8 p.m. tonight. When people are seeing the data come into the big board right yeah. now as it's getting fed in here, we obviously have, we should point this out, 0% in. So it's, it's 100%. It is. It is. And as you this, saw, this was, I think, uh, we watched is, it. Yeah. Data went in and data yeah. just came out. So okay. it's early. It's coming. It's, it's coming. coming. Yeah. Well, yeah. We'll be watching, but it, it's we're just beginning. Chuck Todd, Could we appreciate it. Night. I want to bring in a moderator of Meet the Press. Where am I going here? There's, there's so much. This, it's an anchor <laughs> obstacle course over here. Kristen Welker, uh, she's back with us. Kristen, um, Hello. You hey, how are you? You covered the White House. You've been in and out of New Hampshire, yeah. Iowa, tracking the president's support. When we talk about those MAGA numbers that Chuck yeah. just pointed out, what stands out to you? Well, you know, I think that that gives you a window into the possibility that Nikki Haley could have a better than expected 
night. The fact that you're not seeing the vast majority of voters identify uh, as a part of the MAGA mm -hmm. movement. And and again, the, the, it's still very early. Yeah. But that is, I think, a significant data point for sure. What is the thinking here amongst Republicans? Yeah. What type of night does Nikki Haley have to have? There's obviously the victory, which would be huge for her, give her a lot of momentum going into South Carolina. You have about four weeks before voters there get to vote. But but if she loses, I mean, is there a margin? Is there is there a threshold where it's Republicans are going to say, OK, Nikki, maybe this is enough? Uh, yeah, I, I am watching to see if she loses by if she, first of all, she might win. OK, yeah. there's that. If she doesn't win, how much does she lose by if she can keep it to single digits? to within 10 points, I think she's going to argue right. that that's a pretty strong night for her. And I think that she will be able to argue, look, I still have a path. The question becomes, though, the electorate in New Hampshire is so uniquely suited right. to Nikki Haley. The fact that you have so many independents, the fact that you have so many moderates, the fact that Chris Christie's supporters, likely about 60 percent of them are going to go over and vote for her. You don't have that type of an electorate in South Carolina and some of the Super Tuesday states. The other early exit polls that caught my attention, mm -hmm. uh, majorities would be satisfied with Trump or Haley. Haley as the nominee. So over half of New Hampshire primary voters, GOP primary voters, said they would be satisfied if Donald Trump won. And a similar share said they would be happy right. if Nikki Haley won. Yeah, it was a bit strange. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, again, it, you're not seeing this overwhelming blow. What we are seeing is Donald Trump take to his social media post and rail about the process. You, you covered so the White House, you know him well. Like what he yeah. sees. And, yes. and there's been more than one post. We showed one where he was upset mm -hmm. that independents and That's people right. who were Democrats could register in October and then vote uh, tonight. You think he's watching some of these returns to come in, maybe maybe hearing from his own campaign oh, staff? absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure he's tracking this in real time. We know that he's been railing about this process even before the votes got underway today. And by the way, and Hogan and Sarah can yeah. speak to this, um, it, it, this is something that we've seen from him before, obviously, to kind of talk about the process before the voting starts. So we're seeing that tonight. We're seeing his frustration boil over. But again, it's still very early. So right. it's too early to say how this night is going to turn yeah. out. But the fact that he is railing against independents being able to vote in this election is a sign that he's watching along with us and, and, it's and not interesting thrilled. He'd like this race to be called, like Iowa. Yeah, I mean, think yeah, about right. how early Iowa was yeah. called. That's not going to be the case tonight. And getting that independent vote has been his argument in his language over abortion, right? He's, he's been talking about he's not going to go to the six-week ban because he wants to win elections, quote-unquote. Well, what's so fascinating about that is that Donald Trump appointed the three Supreme Court justices who made it possible to overturn Roe v. Wade. When I asked him in my interview with him if he would support that six-week ban, which, of course, Ron DeSantis did right. sign in his state of Florida, uh, he said he thinks that goes too far. That enraged a lot of uh, people evangelicals, who are evangelicals yeah. people who are opposed to abortion. And so... <laughs> but he very, in a politically savvy way, mm -hmm. said to some of his allies, as soon as Roe v. Wade right. was overturned, this is going to be a political problem. And that's yeah. why you're seeing him moderate. And that is why it's infuriating some groups that are opposed to abortion. Kristen Welker, we always love having you here. I'm sure you're going to be coming back throughout the night. Absolutely. When you dis you, now you disappear and you go somewhere. Where, 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 where do you go? There's, well, you're, there, are you, there are multiple there's so many broadcasts platforms. happening. I'm not resting, Tom. No, we I did, know you're not. We did not, a little you, update that, on nightly news. I feel like you're working. There's so many shows. You're, 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 you're going, you're jumping yes, around. Yes, but you, you are a priority. So Maybe we'll I'm get the, the Welker cam. The we need like the Welker cam. We'll just follow just you around with like a Welker cam. just kind of follow me around throughout the night. But what an amazing panel you have. This is. I want to stick around and hang out with you guys. Right. Go on, right? Yeah, we're done. No, I'll start. Uh, Kristen, we love having you. Speaking of that, it's still an early night. I do want to get to Shaq Brewster. She joins us tonight from Milford, New Hampshire. He joins us tonight, excuse me, from Milford, New Hampshire. And Shaq, voting is still going on there. Another 45 minutes where you're at. Yes, voting is very active right now. Still people, seeing people filing, still seeing people register to vote. And you know, one thing that's unique about this uh, location, it's the only polling location in the entire town of Milford. We're uh, not too far away from the border of Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And if you go back to 2016 and look at those general election results, you saw Donald Trump win here. But then you go to 2020, you saw President Biden win by just about 34 votes. So it's a swing area, generally speaking, and for general election elections and also it was almost a bellwether in 2016 when you look at the primary and I want to bring in Pete 
who you've been helping us out all day. You, oh, absolutely. The election moderator here. Yep. Tell me, you just did a lap around. Yes. Have about 45 minutes left of voting. What did you notice? What did you see? Are people still coming in? People are still coming in, not as strong as in the last hour, but uh, we'll have people coming in right until 8 o'clock for sure. What are the numbers looking like right now? Uh, right now, we're on track probably to about 5,500 voters uh, that will cast ballots during the course of the day. Um, you said at the top it was about 9,800 registered voters. Yeah, 9,682 uh, to start the day, and so far we've added about 250 uh, new voters uh, approximately. We haven't run, done the numbers yet. My math is not all that great, but that sounds like a little bit over 50% of yes. registered voters That's who have cast the ballot. That's correct, yes, yes. Talk to me a little bit about why this location is still open for another 45 minutes or so. Why, what makes this different? Um, the town decided many years ago, um, decades ago, that because of the way people work, um, that it was best to be open from 6 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock at night. The um, people that catch the people that want to stop before they go to work and catch the people that are coming home from uh, late in the evening. So the town voted that way and it's, it's stayed 6 to 8 ever since. All right, you have an extra hour of work compared to other people in this state. It seems like things are going well so far, though, Tom. Here you go. All right, Shaq Rooster for us. Shaq, we appreciate you and all your reporting. Joining us now from the Trump headquarters in New Hampshire is entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy, who of course was once a contender in this Republican race, then after suspending his campaign, endorsed former President Donald Trump. Vivek, you, you made that endorsement the same in the same speech that you dropped out. Why was it so important to you to get behind former President Trump? Look, I think there's two America First candidates in this race since the beginning. That was Donald Trump and myself. I do think we need an outsider, a businessman in the White House to actually lead as a chief executive. The people of Iowa spoke loud and clear. I got about 8% of the vote. I think it would have been something similar in New Hampshire. I wanted to send that vote Donald Trump's direction because we need an America First leader for this movement. And so that's why I made the decision I did. I'm glad Ron DeSantis made the decision that he did. I think it's time for this primary to be over and to go on to a general, decisive, general election victory that's going to be required to reunite this country. And so I felt like I was doing my duty and my part, and I hope that the other candidates now do theirs. Vivek, why would you want to wrap this up so quickly? I got to think you're a capitalist, and one of the tenets of capitalism is competition. Don't you think a competition would make the party better, would make the eventual nominee better? So I think we've had that competition. I, to be clear, I After was in the one thick race? of that competition After one for nearly a year. Yes. Well, look, it was when it was that decisive. I do think that now, after going through New Hampshire, it will be a waste of resources. And so speaking as a capitalist, one of the things you look at is resource allocation. I don't think it's good to waste resources of large donors, small donors alike, funding what I really see as a fake race from here on out when the people of this country and of the GOP primary base have spoken loud and clear. I think the essence of what's happening, let's call this spade out for what it is, is that Nikki Haley and her supporters are playing for a scenario that nobody in the GOP and frankly nobody in this country should be rooting for. It's that Donald Trump is somehow wrongfully eliminated from the ballot. That's the only possible scenario that Nikki Haley has to the nomination, and I think it's worth seeing that with open eyes out in the open. So tonight, a win is a win for Donald Trump, and I think that that should end this primary. That's the way this should go so we can focus on a general election where people are actually able to decide who the leader of their country actually is, rather than have resources siphoned into this primary where some of the largest Democratic supporters, the likes of Reid Hoffman, who's paying for the lawsuits against Donald Trump, are actually paying to prop up Nikki Haley via her super PAC. And one of the things you notice about tonight, if the early reports are to be believed and the early numbers are suggestive and that are correct, that actually you have more independents and Democrats voting in the Republican New Hampshire primary than actual registered Republicans, which means that this is actually a preview of what the general election should look like. And so in that sense, I view this as a practice round for the general election. And I'm hoping not just for a victory for Donald Trump in the general, but a decisive enough victory that we can actually reunite this country around that. The, so that's what I'm yeah. hopeful for. But I do think ending the GOP right. primary is an important step to get there. The data is still coming in. I want to put up something on the screen for our viewers that we, we've been going yeah. to throughout the, the night here, which is uh, a statement from RNC chairwoman Ronna McDaniel. And, and she put this out uh, while the voting was still going on in New Hampshire around, I think, 5 p.m. And basically saying, if President Trump comes out strong tonight, that's a clear message being sent from our primary voters. You took issue with Ronna McDaniel during our NBC News debate. Are you surprised that you and her are now on the same page so quickly? 
Well, look, I think that there's John Fetterman's been saying things about the southern border in recent weeks that I agree with as well, that we need to seal the southern border. So if Ronna McDaniel is going to speak something to, to there, to my eyes, look like it was a true statement. Yes, I agree with her that the clear signal from GOP primary voters do matter. That's a separate issue from whether we need new RNC leadership. I believe we do. I think that the RNC has not been well managed or well run, but that's a question for another night. The question for tonight is really what message are Republican primary voters sending? I think they sent a clear message in Iowa. I think they are sending today a clear message in New Hampshire across the board. Actual Republican primary voters. And that's one thing, one way we need to look at the results tonight is what did the registered Republican primary voters actually say versus separately how differently do the results look with independents and especially even registered or former registered Democrats included. And I think that this is more of a test of what the general election itself could look like. So if Trump comes out tonight, as I expect and hope he will with a victory, a victory is a victory, a win is a win. And I think that's actually a prediction of what the general election outcome could look like. And so in some ways, that New Hampshire testing ground tonight is actually going to be really positive for this race. And I do think the right thing for Nikki Haley to do soon is to get out of this race so we can focus on the general election, deliver a moral mandate, what I think could be a landslide in this general election. And that's where the focus of our resources should be, not on a fake primary that we're falsely extending far longer than the Republican primary electorate thinks it should go. I think the voters in those primary states will say there's nothing fake about their votes. I do want to I do want to ask you, have you spoken to the former president about any type of role in the administration if he were to win the election? We've not had any specific conversations about what my role or future is going to be. To the contrary, my focus remains on this country. The reason I entered this race is I think it was going to take an outsider who is serious about taking on the administrative state, the permanent state, the bureaucracy and the federal government, and to do so without being beholden to outside forces, financial or special influences. That's why I was in the race. That being said, the people of Iowa sent a clear message, and I do think that if it wasn't going to be me, I went all in to support the other businessman in this race who is serious about taking on the administrative state and that deep state and the federal government, and that's Donald Trump. And I think many of the issues that Trump is running on now, these go beyond traditional partisan boundaries. Growing the economy, sealing the southern border, reviving national pride in the next generation. These are not black or white issues. I think in a deeper sense, these are not even really Democrat or Republican issues. These are American issues. And so I think this America First movement that we're leading, that Donald Trump is now leading from the front, is going to be something that actually unites Americans across many stripes and boundaries. And I think that's going to be the main surprise in that second term is not only how decisive the election result is, but more importantly, how we are able to reunite this country. But that starts with first reuniting the Republican Party. And that's why I believe it would be healthy at this point, not three months ago, not two months ago, but at this point, after the first two primary states have gone and delivered a clear, decisive result to end the primary, to focus on what the Republican Party actually accomplishes in the general election. And I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that we have a decisive general election result, and more importantly, that we reunite this country afterwards. Vivek Ramaswamy, we thank you for your time tonight from Trump headquarters there in New Hampshire. Uniting the parties, what I'd like to talk about now with our panel. We're joined by Hogan Gidley and Sarah Matthews, who both served as White House Deputy Press Secretaries during the Trump administration. Also, also with us is Rich Lowry, editor of the National Review. We thank you all for being here. Rich, I didn't see them sneak you in here, but <laughs> welcome, welcome Sorry, to the panel. Sorry, surprise you. <laughs> so, so uniting the party, so you have Vivek now on the same page as Ronald McDaniel, uh, essentially saying if Trump wins, this race is over. But a lot of people will point out that there's still 50 percent of voters who maybe want something different, Republican voters. Do you think this process should continue? Or if Trump has a decisive victory here, is it over? I'm going to start with you, Rich. Well, it's probably effectively over. Um, you know, a moral victory, I don't think, is enough for Nikki Haley here. It's a little bit like DeSantis. No other state was going to be as good for DeSantis. He wasn't going to get the sitting governor to endorse him, to campaign with him, the, the prime activist in the state, and he got... 20% or 21%. She's going to do better than that in New Hampshire, but just getting close, where else is it going to be better for her? This is a relatively moderate electorate, a lot of college-educated voters, independents play a big role, and there are other states where independents can vote in Republican primaries, more than most people think, but it's hard to see where it gets better. Where's the, where's the sitting governor going to endorse her? I mean, Chris Sununu may have campaigned harder than Nikki Haley. I mean, he put it all on the line. So close, close isn't going to be good enough in my view, and I would expect if she loses, it'll be kind of a DeSantis run down where you don't immediately get out because you invested so much you think right. about it for a few days and then reality sinks in and you get out and endorse Trump. Sarah do you think the former president uh, Ronna McDaniel all the people supporting Trump do they have enough juice that if Nikki Haley loses tonight 
they're going to essentially force her to stop running? Nikki Haley's campaign has made clear that they intend on sticking it out and staying in through South Carolina. They said that they have a $4 million ad buy that they already purchased. And I think that right now we're seeing turnout be really high in New Hampshire, and that is a good sign for her and her campaign. And if she can kind of defy expectations and maybe pull or uh, get it close enough in single digits with Donald Trump, particularly I think she would need less than 5% single digits to actually make uh, the case for why she should stay in through South Carolina, then maybe she could get an influx of donors who are going to be supporting her, help give her that juice to stay in the race. But if not, then it, there's a month in between um, New Hampshire and South Carolina. That's about a lifetime in politics. And so it might be tough for her to stay in. Hogan, if former President Trump wins New Hampshire but gets clobbered by the independent vote, What's the logic and what's the argument that he's the best candidate to take on Joe Biden? Because, you know, it's going to always come down to the independents. It does come down to the independents to some degree, but you have to turn out the base, too. Base elections are what really captured Barack Obama's victory in a big way, George W. Bush's victory in a big way, mobilizing that base and firing them up. Donald Trump got millions more votes in the second election than he did. Now, obviously, it didn't turn out the way he wanted, but the expectation from Nikki Haley here is a win. They were very clear about this, and only a day before the election, a couple of days before, did they say, wait a minute, hold on, all we have to do is do really well. That month between the end of this election tonight and South Carolina is, yes, an eternity, but I'm from South Carolina. I know where the people of that state are. I know where their hearts are. It's not with their governor, who was elected twice. It's with Donald Trump. And so regardless of the victory tonight and it spread five points, 10 points, 15 points, one point. Donald Trump will be 2-0. and Nikki Haley will be 0-2. He's winning Nevada because she's not playing there and he will win South Carolina. I do not see a scenario plausible, possible, probable, where Nikki Haley decides to stay in the race only to lose her home state by 35 points. I just don't see that happening. Rich, you know, I hear from, from Republicans who say, listen, I, I, I don't like Trump. I'm still Republican. I really dislike Biden. I, I feel almost like a stranger in my mm -hmm. own party. You've covered Republican politics yeah. uh, for a couple of decades now. You've, you've got into it with Donald Trump when he's yeah. a candidate. You've also written columns supporting his policies. Uh, wh where do you feel? Do you, do you feel like you're, you're a man w w with, without <laughs> a country at times? I mean, I'm, I just wonder. Well, I've gotten used to it. So, yeah. uh, look, I mean, the, the party uh, never really quit on him. He seemed weak after the uh, 2022 midterms, and they deny, but I think he had a, a huge... And a week after the 2020 election, too. Yeah. Yeah. Week after I mean, both. He, he, yeah. Lost, he lost to Joe Biden um, narrowly. And a key thing was in 16, he wins the independence, and 20, he loses uh, the, the independence. But people think he... Republicans think he's the most electable this time around. They think he delivered on the promises that, that he said he was going to do in, in 16. They think he's stronger than, than anyone else. They think he has the right experience. Just everything. It's like every, every metric. And I can't remember the last time... Once last time in a competitive Republican primary, someone has won Iowa and New Hampshire, Never. right? And, and maybe by, we'll see if he wins tonight and what the margin is tonight, but by a historic margin in Iowa, and it could still be, you know, double digits here in New Hampshire. So it's just, he's not going to be stopped. He's the presumptive nominee and most of the party is going to um, rally around to him. And, and this is why, this is what happens, you know, that someone becomes a presumptive nominee and everyone else endorses them. It's, that's a normal thing. Rich, how do you think Republican voters uh, who witnessed everything that happened after the 2020 election, um, how do they talk themselves into voting for former President mm -hmm. Trump if they do believe that former President Trump tried to steal the election? Uh, he's accused in Georgia. He's accused, obviously, by the federal government as well. How do those Republican voters say, I'm going to give him another shot, even though he tried to sort of... Well, it's, it's the opposite, okay, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, walk most me Republicans this. think that he was done dirty so, to, at some level in 2020. By the mail-in voting, by whatever. He, yeah, he, he was a, even something Even though worse. it was legal. It was, so, yeah. But, yeah, but the, the thing is, this would have been his, his foremost vulnerability, right? He lost to Joe Biden, right? Right. But he, he, he lied it away, you know, and, um, and, and most Republicans are willing to go along with it or actively believe it. And that's the other key thing. The two exogenous factors that hurt Ron DeSantis or Nikki Haley, besides, you know, how terrible DeSantis' campaign were, obviously the indictments. But then the electability argument went away because yeah. Trump's polling was so strong against Biden. You look at the 2020 polling, 
Trump never led against Biden. Never. He's never pulled this strong in national polls ever. He wasn't pulling this strongly against um, Hillary. So I think it's actually a sign of weakness that he's not higher against Biden because I think Biden is in such a, a weak state. But you can't really make that argument. You can't go out and Ron DeSantis say, I'm losing by 20 points in the polls right now to Trump. And he's beating Biden by more than I am. But I'm more electable. I think that's true. But the argument doesn't work. Sarah, do you think Republicans, and I know we have polling on this, but when you talk to Republicans, do you think they don't believe that he tried to overturn the election, or do you think they don't care? I think they believe um, his lies, that they believe that it was stolen from him. They view someone like Joe Biden as incredibly weak, and so they can't imagine a scenario in how Joe Biden would pull off a win against Donald Trump. But the thing is that I wish that those um, same Republicans who believe that were hearing now the guilty pleas that we've heard from some of the Trump uh, co-conspirators in Georgia, where they acknowledge that they knew that Trump lost and that there was no uh, evidence of fraud. Donald Trump has never um, been able to prove those claims. And so it is disappointing then that all these people have kind of had their minds poisoned by these lies. And um, in their eyes, they still think, though, that Donald Trump is more electable heading into 2024 um, because they believe that the 2020 election was stolen, which is just a little perplexing then why you would back the guy, because even if you believe that it was rigged, then why would you back the guy who already lost to Joe Biden once? Jacob Sobroff is at a polling location in Derry, New Hampshire, talking to voters. They're getting a sense of what's going on. Jacob, you spent a couple days now in New Hampshire. Uh, I, I know you've been covering the campaign for us as well. What are voters telling you they care about most? Are, are, you, are you hearing, is it just the economy, immigration? Do you hear the threat of democracy ever? It's all of it. It's all of it. Yes, of course, of course you do, Tom. Um, I, I want to come back to that, but there's actually some important news that's sort of happening here as I'm talking to you from Derry, New Hampshire. This is Tina Guilford. She's the town clerk uh, of Derry. She's the, you're actually the only full-time official in the Derry, elected. only full-time elected official in Derry. Um, yep. You are on the verge of, and it's not happening for sure, and you, it seems to, you seem to feel confident that it won't happen. But you could run out of ballots. You have less than 1,000 ballots left, and almost 9,000 people have participated tonight. Is that correct? Yes, it is. So um, we, uh, we were running low, and so we uh, called the Secretary of State. Um, they did not have anything extra for us, but we did have absentees that we did not use. Uh, and they were at Town Hall, so we went to Town Hall, and we brought them in. So they are here in the building if we need them. Um, our turnout has kind of slowed up, so I don't know that we're going to need them, but we do have them. And you're not the only jurisdiction, a town or city in New Hampshire, that's sort of uh, faced with this issue. Correct. Uh, I've heard from our colleague, Tom, Steve Kornacki, that uh, this is happening throughout the state at the moment. And the Secretary of State is able to get them, and you correct me again, if this isn't right, is able to get some ballots to some of the other jurisdictions, but that's not the case here. That's that's right. Well, so they they told us that they didn't really think they had any print overruns, which is okay. Like I said, we uh, we have the absentees, so we are all set. Okay, so with those absentees, you feel like you'll be able to run out the rest of the clock here with about twenty six minutes to go and make sure everybody can come in and, and participate. Well, we would make sure everybody can come in and participate that wants to participate. If we had to make photocopies and I had to sign every single one and do all those things, we would do them. Okay, that's that's why we love our election workers. Uh, that is democracy in action. Tommy, uh, Tina, thank you very much. You're welcome. Really appreciate you. So um, you heard it here from Derry. It's also happening elsewhere in the state. Uh, the turnout is high. Uh, they say it's almost 9,000. That would be around 50% turnout for the biggest polling location, if not just in New Hampshire, in the entire country. Which way those voters go, ultimately, we won't know until the polls close here. The results are tabulated uh, and announced. Tom? Yeah, I'm seeing it from the reporting you were talking about, the Secretary of State saying there's at least 10 communities that have requested additional GOP ballots. There's no long waits that they're aware of, but I think these communities are trying to figure out how to get those people the ballots they need so they can vote. And uh, we're seeing what, what they did there in Derry. Jacob, we appreciate you. You're watching our special coverage of the New Hampshire primary. Before we go to break, we're getting our first uh, percentage of vote in only 5%, a very close race. At, we look at at 5% of the votes, actually 6% that just came in, 52% for Donald Trump, 40 seven percent there for Nikki Haley. Very close, but only uh, about six percent. And we're going to have much more when we come back after this break. Stay with us.
raw. How hard is it to see it like this? Our house is no longer here, but we are here. Now is real. Let's break down what we know and then the big questions still outstanding. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Fire has grown uh, leaps and bounds. What you see behind me is typical. How you doing? Oh, pretty, pretty bad. This is a Decision 2024 election alert. Welcome Here's back. Tom Yamas. Welcome back. We do have an election alert. Our first votes are coming in. A reminder, not all polls have closed just yet across New Hampshire. Right here with 8% of the vote coming in, you can see it's a very, very close race. 51% for Donald Trump, about 48% for Nikki Haley. But as we mentioned, only 8% of those votes counted so far. As soon as we can project a call, a winner in this race, we will let you know. But if it's a close race, it's going to take a little longer. Our Dasha Burns has been uh, working in New Hampshire ever since she left Iowa on an overnight flight. Uh, she's got an update for us from <laughs> Nashua. So Dasha, tell us what you're learning there and what you're hearing from voters. All right, well, let me show you around here real quick because Nashua is pretty reflective of the state. Back in 2016, the margins here were very similar to the statewide margin, so it is a bellwether. It is not hardcore MAGA country, and it, the polls here are closing in about 20 minutes or so. You see some folks uh, getting their ballots here. This is the last few minutes of uh, this, this polling location being open. Now, I want to show you over here. We've been watching people come to this table, which is the new voter registration table. Table. And Grace has been registering some voters here. Hey, Grace, good to see you. Tell us how many, about how many, I know you guys are going to get an exact count soon, but about how many new voters did you get today? We definitely have more than 100. More than 100. More than 100 new voters. And then, Abby, can I just grab that sheet of paper from you, my producer, Abby? We've got a count right now. Um, there are 7,000, just under 7,000 registered voters in this area. And Kathy here has been helping us keep track of how many ballots have been turned in. So, Kathy, what's the latest number? 3,263. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Mail-in oh, mail ballots. Of course. So you can't forget the mail-in ballots. So mail-in ballots and in-person ballots. So more than 50% or so turnout at this point, or about 50%. And then out here we have a table that just reminds you how distinct New Hampshire is. This is the undeclared voter re-registration table, Tom. This is where undeclared voters come and re-register as undeclared because when they come in here, they can choose a Democratic or a Republican ballot. And then on their way out, if they want to go back to being undeclared, they can go ahead and do so. Now, this is the kind of area that Nikki Haley really needs to rack up her margins because in 2016, a lot of folks here went for more moderate candidates, the Kasichs, the uh, Bushes, right? So this is an area where she really has an opportunity. At the same time, we've also been meeting a lot of undeclared voters and Democrats who have been writing in Joe Biden because that is the other factor that we're dealing with here in New Hampshire that we weren't dealing with in Iowa, right? You've got Trump and Nikki Haley, but also the Democrats have been pushing a write-in campaign for Biden because he's not officially on the ballot, but they do want to show support. They want to show that New Hampshire is playing in all of this. So we're seeing all of these dynamics at play as we've been talking to voters and watching the process unfold here, Tom. Dasha Burns, we appreciate you and all your reporting. I want to get back over to Chuck Todd over at the big board because we're getting some new exit poll data when it comes to the major election issue of abortion. Talk to us about what New Hampshire voters are telling uh, our people. And remember, this is a Republican yep. primary, a Republican electorate, but we've told you that the New Hampshire Republican electorate is not like most Republican electorates. And look at this, a federal law that would ban abortions nationwide, 67% of this electorate opposes that, just 27%. Remember. Governor Chris Sununu is a Republican governor, right. and he's considered pro-choice or pro-abortion rights. But let me compare this just to show you the difference between the New Hampshire and Iowa electorate. Same question we asked in Iowa. 61% of the Iowa yeah. Republicans favored a ban. You know, so you see, again, a huge difference. But tougher to draw on who this helps, right? Because Trump has been out there. Well, he, that's he, the yeah. I was just going to say, Trump and Haley have both sort of tried really hard to make you think they have they right. agree with you on abortion whatever your position is yeah they're both kind of elusive on it obviously trump because he appointed the supreme court justices can't fully get away from some of these abortion questions haley you know haley's been sounding more pro-abortion rights than i've ever heard her before previously than this campaign some of it may just simply be in response to dobbs yeah. and as she's pointed out her home state 
has gone really radical on this. There have been some state legislatures proposing all sorts of things. So, but again, this goes back to why was New Hampshire such a favorable place to potentially knock yeah. off Donald Trump? It's because this is an electorate that is unlike any other. But let's remember, New Hampshire is a swing state. Mm -hmm. This is these numbers tonight tell me Donald Trump can't carry New Hampshire. Hard stop. All right, we're gonna have to wait and see as, as all the votes come in. Um, I wanna to talk to somebody who knows New Hampshire very well, New Hampshire politics, James Pindell. He's a political reporter with the Boston Globe. Uh, James, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Talk to me about what stood out to you so far as we're getting the exit polling data in. We're projecting a, a record turnout in New Hampshire as well. Yeah, first of all, these are impressive voting numbers from New Hampshire voters, but I will say New Hampshire actually does turn out. So in some of these communities, particularly where Nikki Haley needs to do well. I'm thinking of Portsmouth, for example, uh, and Concord, for example. Uh, they're in line with where we were in, say, 2016 uh, for, for, the, for the Republican vote. Now, granted, obviously, there are fewer candidates, fewer staff to try to drive out that vote. There's been lower enthusiasm. But this whole thing is going to hinge on two counties, Rockingham County, which is, I just mentioned, is Portsmouth and along the Massachusetts border and Hillsborough County, which is where I'm at here in Manchester. And we've seen some reporters at, out in Milford and obviously where Dasha's at in Nashua. They make up 55% of the Republican primary base. If you want to include Concord or Merrimack County, that's now two thirds. So the Southern tier, the Boston suburbs, the Boston media market, that is where this base is going to, that's where this race will be decided. And I'll say one more thing. If you look at some of these margins where Nikki Haley needs to do especially well, she is winning. She is probably not winning by the type of margins we will, she will need to sustain some of these more rural communities where Donald Trump is racking it up. And for that, I'm thinking of Laconia, where he's crushing it, or on the western side in Claremont, where he's winning two, uh, uh, he's getting 60 to 70 percent of the vote. That's going to make it really challenging, I think, for Nikki Haley to come out of this. But it's these last votes, the ones that, come, you know, ones that finish at 8 o'clock, that's going to be Nikki Haley territory. So we won't really know exactly where she stands until later in the night. No, do we know where the turnout um, is sort of higher than normal yet in the state? Which regions? We're not sure. Yeah, we do. Uh, I mentioned two counties, and one in particular is all that I'm obsessed with whenever there's a Republican primary, whether it's for state Senate, governor, obviously president, and that's Rockingham County. This is, uh, it does tend to have a mix of people in the trades, some blue collar, but a lot of it is bedroom communities for Boston that are white collar and are college educated. They're a, disproportionately the group of those 10 communities that did seek uh, more, uh, more ballots. They're the ones that we have seen anecdotally more turnout. I know NBC News or MSNBC had a live cam in Londonderry. Donald Trump visited there. That's a community I'm especially watching along with Gary, where I know we just were a few minutes ago. Those votes come in very late. They tend to have almost voting problems in the past because of high voter turnout and one voting location in each of those communities. And if it's really high, that could be really good for Nikki Haley in those communities. I don't think we've spent enough time talking about Governor Sununu here and, and, and sort of his impact on this race. Um, we talk about how independent New Hampshire voters are. They, they don't care how Iowa voted. They want their own vote. Do they care what their governor wants and who he likes? You know, at the Boston Globe, we pulled that specific question, and only a third of Republican voters said they would even consider what he said. Now, that was in the fall. Here's the close. Two things you need to know. Number one, despite the fact that he is the son of a governor and a former White House chief of staff and a brother of a con former congressman and U.S. senator, the dirty little secret is that Chris Sununu doesn't really have much of a political organization in the state, doesn't even really control the state Republican Party. However, there's no question that in the last two weeks, in the last week in particular, he has been an integral part in creating some excitement about her campaign, probably even more than the candidate herself, who closes her last rally last night, her closing rally, it was only 34 minutes of a talk and, and no questions, but he has been clearly been trying to go out there and convince people that this is actually something to care about and to vote against Trump. Now, Tom, I was spent about two hours at polling places in around New Hampshire, particularly in Rockingham County, because you know I'm obsessed. And there are three categories of people, and they're in this order. One, love Trump. Second, 
don't like Trump or like I'm over Trump or he's too old. And then third was like, I, I kind of like Nikki Haley or she's a woman and I'm, I'm, I'm a woman and I'm sort of into that. Those are the sort of the three buckets. And on that second bucket, there's no question that Chris Sununu helped drive that turnout today. All right, James Pindell, we appreciate it. If you want to get that Rockingham tattoo, I'm going to pay for it. You clearly love that county. I know you're watching it. We may check back with you. We thank you for joining our coverage at this moment. I do want to go to Garrett Hake, who's at the Trump watch party right now. Um, Garrett, I guess my first question to you has to be about the reaction we're seeing from former President Trump. We've been sort of surmising here that he's possibly watching the returns coming in, watching some of the coverage. His first uh, sort of, you know, election night tweet uh, seemed kind of upset that independents yeah. uh, were allowed under Clarence were allowed to vote in this election. Yeah, Tom, I mean, it's always interesting to see the Trump campaign and their operations kind of public stance and what the candidate himself is really thinking, which he almost always shares with us very directly on social media. That's certainly true tonight, where the campaign has been so uh, boastful, really, today of how well they thought they were going to do here, how they thought they could close this race out. Even everything about the room behind me, the size and scope of the party they're throwing tonight with an open bar and everybody from the Trump lawyer Alina Haba to George Santos here in attention. They thought they were going to be celebrating big time tonight. But the former president's posting on True Social complaining, as he did earlier today, about the way that New Hampshire runs its primary. The idea that Democrats or unaffiliated voters can join in this process. It clearly frustrates him. Earlier today, he laid that at the feet of Chris Sununu, of the governor, basically saying this is something he has to fix and complained about the idea that this is how Republicans select their nominee. It's obviously in direct contrast from Nikki Haley, who makes the argument that the bigger the tent, the more people you're bringing in to hopefully vote for a Republican in the fall. Donald Trump does not see it that way and is clearly frustrated with the idea that independents and Democrats might be, if not ruining, but at least changing the character of the celebration they are hoping to have tonight. As for the senior leadership of the Trump campaign team, I can tell you kind of the old like axiom of campaign nights is the people who are talking don't know, the people who know aren't talking. The, the sort of inner cloister of the Trump campaign team is going to be watching these numbers very closely. But their guy, their candidate, always sort of tips his hand a little bit about how he feels watching the results come in. Right. And, and, and two very di different sort of campaign managers and, and people leading this campaign than, than Trump campaigns of the past. I do, I do want to go back to something you yeah. said. George Santos is at the, at the watch party there. How is he being received? I saw myself, Tom, taking pictures uh, at the bar with uh, a lot of fans. I mean, he is, in his own way, a, a, a very much a MAGA celebrity and a creature yeah. of this moment. I haven't had a chance to talk to him myself yet, but the selfie line was long around the former congressman uh, at the bar just a few minutes ago. Garrett Haig for us at the Trump watch party for tonight. We're going to check back with you, I'm sure, very soon. Uh, we've been talking about election alerts. We now have a khaki alert. That means Steve Kornacki is going to show us where Nikki Haley has to go to find the votes. Steve, great to have you tonight. Tell us where we, she needs to go. So right here, I think what jumps out is this. The 6% in this Republican primary right now call themselves liberal and 31% call themselves moderate. That is a combined total of 37% saying moderate or liberal. In 2016, last competitive Republican primary in New Hampshire, that total number was 29%. So this is eight percentage points higher. Again, if you're having far more non-Republicans participate, it might follow that the, uh, uh, the ideology would move a little bit away from the conservative side. That's what you're seeing. Again, key question, is this a red herring or is the, are the numbers going to remain like this? Uh, other things we can show you here. We talked so much in Iowa last week about the role of evangelical Christians. They were an outright majority of the caucus electorate, 55 percent, and they went overwhelmingly for Donald Trump. They were the backbone of his Iowa landslide last week. What share in New Hampshire identify as born-again Christians and evangelicals in this first wave? It is 19 percent. Again, that is far lower than Iowa. We knew it would be far lower than Iowa, but also New Hampshire is one of the most secular Republican electorates you're going to find. But eight years ago, it was 25 percent. So it's down even from that in, I keep saying this broken record, but it's important, in the first wave. Other key findings I think we, we can show you here. I want to show one more from the second page, and that is we asked this question in Iowa, and we asked it again tonight. 
Do you consider yourself part of the MAGA movement? And the answer here in this Republican primary and the first wave is 64% say, basically two thirds say, they do not consider themselves that, uh, to consider themselves part of the Iowa, of the uh, Iowa, of the MAGA movement. And I'm just searching to make sure I get the right number here. In Iowa uh, last week, the number of no's was 50. Hmm. So it's jumped up double digits here in this first wave. Steve Kornacki for us. He can't stop. He's still going. Steve, we got to go. We thank you for that. Uh, I want to bring in back the panel now. Uh, so, Rich, you know, I want to ask you, we, we've heard from a lot of sort of Republicans. We've heard about some of the people assembling around uh, the Trump uh, watch party, people like uh, George Santos. There's sort of these, these MAGA celebrities <laughs> within the, the Republican Party. H how are they viewed by all Republicans. I mean, he, he, why, why is someone like disgraced former Congressman George Santos, why is he embraced by that community? Because he's famous, you know? And yeah. it's like, be famous for, for anything. Political and, celebrity is, is, is yeah, huge with Republicans. And, and look, this this is one one thing that I, that I think is a very bad trend in our politics generally. It's uh, used to come to Washington generally just to, to legislate or try to legislate because you're interested in the substance. Now you can come and be on social media and do cable hits and be a celebrity without really doing any work or really be interested in doing the work or reaching out to the other side or whatever it is. So that I think that's a, a broad trend in our politics, a very Hogan, unhealthy one. Hogan, explain this to me. Why does former President Trump want people like disgraced well, Congressman George Santos, as we see here on our screen talking to our, our Garrett Haig. Why does he want him at that point? Well, a couple of things. I know yeah. Garrett was lamenting the fact that the, that the selfie line was long. I'm sure if Garrett waits around, he'll be happy to get a picture with George Santos. I'm not sure that Trump wants him there or, or thinks he's great in any form or fashion. I've not talked to him about it. But this is one of those things I think Rich is hitting on, which so many people in politics now are deemed celebrities, regardless of their ability to do anything regardless of whether or not they've been run out of office or not so that's a weird a weird bedfellow there if you ask me i don't i, I wouldn't be too keen on going to take you're a not picture gonna go to line santos. you're not gonna get a photo i'm not gonna get a photo <laughs> with george santos but you know whatever uh terry your thoughts as we see that some of the votes coming in we still got about five minutes left before the polls close at eight o'clock eastern in new hampshire um you know, we have about 12% of the vote in, 52% for Trump, about 47% for Nikki Haley. A lot closer right now, at least, than the polls had it right before the voting started. Yeah, I just want to say one thing about the George Santos thing. Uh, I, I Everyone think wants to say something about yeah. George well, Santos. Yeah. You know why, though? Because yeah. I think it's it's a sad commentary that someone like George Santos was even allowed in the door. Right. Um, Donald Trump is a criminal defendant with 91 counts against him. George Santos is also a criminal defendant with counts against him. He was just thrown out of Congress um, in disgrace. And yet, here he is in the Trump show, it fully embraced. That does not help the image in the general election. There are a lot of people in this country who look at that and say, yeah, the fact that these people hang out together tells you a little bit about the type of integrity and character of this type of uh, personality cult that's going on in the GOP. So that doesn't help Donald Trump when it comes to a general election. Can it's I pretty disgraceful. Yeah, yeah. But I just well, want to finish yeah, my yeah, thought yeah. also right. now about New Hampshire. Um, Donald Trump putting out that, that uh, message on X earlier yeah. on, on Truth, Truth Social, Social. She tells me he's nervous. I mean, you can say whatever you want, but yeah. when you feel confident in your position, there's no need to attack the process. How do I know that? Because I spent 27 years in the Republican Party, and we used to make fun of Democrats mm -hmm. who would go after process co complaints. So it's clear that he's not gonna, going to get the blowout win that he thought he was going to get, so now he's going to complain about the process to try to blunt the expectation game here in case it's not a 20 or 30 point blowout like it was in Iowa, and God forbid it's single digits or what if she wins? So that's what that's about. Clearly, he's nervous. Yeah. About and you know it. who won independence in New Hampshire on the Republican side in 2016? Donald Trump. Yeah. He had 36% among Republicans, 36% among independents. Well, because but, there was a plurality of the vote, though. It wasn't right, just two, right. it wasn't just, uh, you know, two, one, two, two, two candidates. Yeah. Like Tom, it is this now. is the great strategic insight I want to share with you. This is why I'm here, I hope. I, I hope this blows you away. But I think, you know, if it's like a five or six point margin, who knows? But if it is, Nikki Haley will actually have been hurt by the consolidation after Christie leaving. Christie leaving was good for her, but if DeSantis and Vivek were still in there holding, yeah, they would have 10, fractured the, the Trump vote. Of, of course, Trump voters, she might have been able to get over the top. Yeah, I, I got Chuck over here signaling me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to run right over to Chuck Todd over there in the big board. Yeah, eight o'clock. As you know, we're going to be able to characterize the race. We've been able to update our exits with the real data, yeah. so we've reweighted it a little bit. They're small shifts, but they're important shifts. And here's the biggest one. If you recall. Uh, earlier in the evening, the first two waves, 
had the Republican number at 47 percent, right? And the combined independent Democratic number was sitting at 53 percent. So now what are we staring at here, right? It's a, it's a four-point swing, but that is a huge swing. That is the difference between a coin flip and five to ten points or things like that. So we've seen there clearly was a slight overstatement, in the, and this is why the way, this is why the exit polls, you want to see them after we've been able to see sample precincts, we're able to weight it to real-time data and you get a better sense. So this is, it's a slight shift, but it's an important shift that I think signals directionally that this is Donald, that this is looking like an electorate that's a little more favorable to Donald Trump I mean, Chuck, than just, it looked like an yeah, hour ago. Just walk our viewers through this because yeah. not enough Republicans on that side will have picked Nikki Haley in, the, in that assumption. Well, that's been the problem. Yeah. He's been, you know, to go back, we've had this phenomenon before, right? John McCain, everybody talked John McCain when he beat George W. Bush. John McCain won Republican voters too in New Hampshire. He didn't win a majority, but he won a plurality. This is not what's happening here. We're going to show you the breakdowns uh, as soon as polls close. But it's basically a totally big split where Trump is uh, beating her badly among Republicans and Haley's beating him badly among independents. So that's not the formula she needs to pull this off. Uh, that independent number, though, Chuck, before, because we're, we're coming up on 8 o'clock and we'll have a big announcement at, at 8, but, but that independent number... Could have that been even higher, or, or that's, that's look, we're already pretty high? I believe it could. Look, yeah. sure. I mean, this is pretty high already, okay? But I look at, I've been, I've been going to New Hampshire since 96, covering them since 92. A lot of New Hampshire voters were disappointed that there wasn't one more debate. Um, the final weekend is a huge, decisive weekend, you know? And so I can't help but wonder, had Nikki Haley gotten that command performance on the, the state's only television affiliate, WMUR, the only one that broadcasts to all of New Hampshire, and she walked away from that, right? And, you know, again, she didn't want to debate Ron DeSantis anymore. She wanted Trump there. I get it. But I just wonder, she missed some important markers in the final week that, I, you know, could it, have, could it have been a difference, right? If she comes up short, she's going to second guess a whole bunch of stuff about her schedule, I think. Yeah, and, and the ironic part is that if there was even another debate sanctioned, she wouldn't have been able to debate anyone because Trump would have never shown up. DeSantis mm -hmm. ends up dropping out of the race. It, it, would, it, would, have been, it would have been her on the stage, uh, but I, I, I guess she could have done a town hall or something like that. Yeah. Um, we are coming on the top of the hour right now. Polls are closing, and we're standing by for our first characterization for this race. We are literally one second, and there it is. It is 8 o'clock on the dot. The polls have just closed there in New Hampshire. We are coming to you with an NBC News election alert at this hour. All right, this is important. The NBC News decision desk is projecting that the race is still too early to call, but that former President Trump leads. You can see those vote totals as they continue to climb. Right now, we're at 12% of the vote in right now. Former President Trump, you see it on your screen, 52% of the vote. Nikki Haley with 47% of the vote at this hour. But again, it is still very, very early. Only 12% of the vote in. As we just mentioned, the NBC News election desk, the decision desk is still waiting on, on making a call right now, a projection. We, all we can say is that Trump is leading, but it's still too early. We're still gonna wait for some more votes to come in, some more data to come in. Nikki Haley still looking to pull off a major upset tonight as she faces a make or break moment in her campaign. The crowds we saw turning up to vote a little earlier. We have another election alert coming in right now. They're coming in fast and furious. This is actually a very interesting one. Maybe not surprising, but definitely interesting. Uh, NBC News can now project that Joe Biden has won the Democratic primary. Why is this interesting? Well, he didn't compete in the Democratic primary. This is largely from a write-in campaign. Uh, Dean Phillips, a Democrat who's trying to challenge Joe Biden on the Democratic side, did campaign in that state. He, he has lost. NBC News can project that the current president is the winner of the New Hampshire primary. The sort of question here is, will this matter at all in New Hampshire? Because the delegates will not be awarded. South Carolina is going to be the first uh, in the nation primary. Let's go over to Chuck Todd right now to kind of walk us through uh, sort of the interesting uh, conundrum, if you will, the Democrats find themselves in with, with Joe Biden winning, but no delegates going to be awarded. Well, right. No delegates are awarded, and we can show you here. And it is worth noting, while we're, 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 we don't know that every single write-in is a Joe Biden write-in, Okay, there was a campaign to write in ceasefire, 
by some Gaza activists. It was legitimate enough that I saw yard signs there myself. So whether this is the full, but, you know, assume 5%. Uh, is pulled from that. So the fact of the matter is, this is successful. Look, Dean Phillips not even getting into the 20s, I think is, is a tough thing. I've talked to his campaign. You know, they'd like to find a place where they actually get to be on the ballot with Joe Biden to see if there's, you know, if there really is a movement here. And the one early state they're looking at after this that they may try to spend money in is Michigan. South Carolina is not a state that you're going to be able to defeat Joe Biden in, but, but Michigan is certainly. And let's talk about South Carolina, right? Mm -hmm. They put Joe Biden over the top. Right. A uh, few years ago, and he said, "Listen, this is this is this is more reflective of the Democratic Party. Right. Let's make South Carolina first. Uh, New Hampshire voters said it's our law. Let's remember how yeah. Biden did. Biden did so well. Can you find his name? Well, you know, keep on the going. 2020 results, yeah, keep, right? Keep, you got to keep five. going. Was he, he, right, was five, he was right? Fifth. He was fifth, no, yeah. fourth. Fourth. He was okay. fourth in New Hampshire and fifth. Uh, in Iowa. Look, it's a warning that Chris Sununu has got to worry about with the New Hampshire Republican primary. Yeah. Because those who are nominees, especially if they come president, they decide what the primary calendar is based on their own personal experiences. And if New Hampshire ends up being the state... So those 10 delegates, what happens? They go to the convention and what, what happens? Well, they'll be seated. Okay. They always say they're not going to seat them. But yeah. I'll tell you this, we saw this in 2008. There was Florida and Michigan had this whole thing. Right. Whoever the nominee is, because you know why they're going to seat them? Because New Hampshire's a swing state. Right. Okay. You don't if New Hampshire wasn't a swing state... This was Idaho, not a big Democratic yeah. state. They might tell them to pound sand. They're not going to tell the New Hampshire electorate to pound sand. Let's talk about the Republican side, what we have in 13 percent. It's growing almost by the minute. T tell me, is there anything we can draw from what we have so far? Yeah, I'm going to take you to one one area. And yeah. this is in Rochester, New Hampshire. This has been a growing this is a growing part of the state. It's a growing place. This was some place that she needed to narrow this a little bit. Let me just show you over the last couple of cycles. You can see, okay. I mean, first of all, it's a growing vote. I mean, there already is going to be more vote that's ever turned out in Rochester before. And Trump's doing better. He's already got more raw vote uh, with 68 percent in than they got the entire time last time. And as you can see, this is this was not as friendly to the moderate candidates right. as you will. But this is He's this is why if you this will. is why we're saying we're le he's leading. Yeah, because she is doing well in the Democratic counties in the swing counties so you look at concord yeah. and she's winning but she's not winning by the same margins right, right? the counties the, the the townships she's winning are not this was this was one she really needed to run up the score right. as you can see and that's the difference here manchester and, i know just closed do we have anything from manchester we have a little bit coming okay. out of manchester i can show you here um and but wow, about look, half that's, the that's vote. somewhat interesting but just okay. to let you yeah. again so yeah. you can see here Manchester, a little more working class. It really is right. more of a Trump. It would be a, a pretty big upset if, if Haley was able to carry Manchester. But again, Trump's winning by bigger margins in his areas than Haley is in her areas. Okay. Chuck Todd, we always appreciate that. Uh, Hallie Jackson has been out and about for us in the Granite State. Uh, first, she was at a polling location. She's made her way to a watch party tonight. Uh, Hallie, talk to me about, oh, wait, it looks like it's, uh, is that a saloon, a bar? Uh, it's a bar. <laughs> what, what sure you, is. What are you hearing from, what are you hearing from uh, everyone there enjoying a nice, uh, a nice beverage, if you will, and, and some politics to go as well? That's the thing. Yeah, coming out to see and get a sense of like how their neighbors, how their colleagues, how their community members voted here in this big deal first in the nation primary. It is kind of a watch party, I will tell you. There's a lot of Fox News on the TVs up here. People are tuning in to see those returns coming in, including uh, people here like Pat, who is bellied up to the bar here. Pat, thank you for chatting with us. Sure thing. How did it go for you today voting? Tell us who you voted for and why. Um, I actually voted Trump because... I like his policies, not necessarily the man. He's a little boastful, and sometimes he can be divisive. But overall, his policies worked, and I don't think Biden's are, honestly. Did you ever consider or evaluate potentially any other candidates? Did you consider perhaps backing Nikki Haley, or were you always for former president? I actually like her, too. Um, I think people are familiar with his policies, so they might lean towards him more. But you never know. I mean, it's early voting. She could win in our state and keep going. You know, it, you just never know. But I think maybe um, sh she could run again, maybe down the road. I think she still has a good chance, but may it might not be her time yet, you know. Why did you come out here tonight? Was this about watching the returns come in, being with others? Is the, is well, actually, I like Fox News, and I like Pete Hegseth, and he's here. So I saw that he was going to be here, so I'm like, maybe we can see him. <laughs>
Pat, thank you so much for talking with us. We appreciate it. Obviously, a lot, lot of folks out here tonight for a lot of different reasons, Tom. I want to bring you back here to some other folks that we're talking to as well, because one thing that we've seen throughout the course of the evening as the polls have started to, sh to close, so much interest here, right? I mean, I've heard you and Chuck talking about it, some of the folks that you have there um, talking about the engagement here of New Hampshire voters. That's what we're seeing uh, as people want to know what are the results, Tom. Hallie Jackson for us. Hallie, we appreciate you. This is our big live remote board uh, right here. They're reading out results in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. That's a, a city we want to watch. Let's listen in. 510. Asa Hutchinson, zero. Uh, Peter Jeddick, zero. Perry Johnson, zero. Donald Kajernis, zero. Mary Maxwell, two. Glenn Peters, zero. S. Peterson Morell, zero. Darius Mitchell, zero. Mike Pence, zero. Vivek Ramaswamy, two. All right, we were just listening to the vote count in Portsmouth, but it sounds like we might have missed the uh, two top contenders at the top. It's all right. It's a live event. Those things are happening. Speaking of live events, we have some breaking news in. Mike Memoli uh, just spoke with the Biden new campaign manager of the reelect team. Mike, what's the new reporting you have for us? Yeah, Tom, I just spoke exclusively with Julie Chavez Rodriguez. She is and has been the Biden campaign manager. But one of the big stories tonight, of course, is the fact that there is uh, some movement within the Biden senior leadership. We have Jen O'Malley Dillon, who is the deputy chief of staff at the White House, was Biden's campaign manager in 2020, will be moving to Delaware to uh, take a senior role in the campaign, as will Mike Donilon. He's the chief strategist for President Biden, has been for a long time. This is being described as a shakeup, and it is a significant move uh, that the campaign is describing as an acceleration of what was already planned. And so as I spoke with Julie Chavez Rodriguez, I asked her what this means for her, what this means for the campaign. She said, listen, uh, O'Malley Dillon and Donilon, they are familiar names to the campaign. They are familiar names to me that this is an all hands on deck approach now as we head into this new phase of the general election campaign. I asked her about the relationship she has with so President Biden. Of course, she is the campaign manager. She briefs him uh, at least weekly. And she said that that relationship will continue, that she's excited, that there's a great energy around the campaign, uh, especially after what we saw tonight, which was a rally with President Biden, with Vice President Harris in uh, Virginia as meant to sort of set up this next phase of the campaign. And so uh, these comments, I think, speak to what the Biden campaign is, is trying to characterize as sort of a, a full time now, all hands on deck approach to the campaign and not necessarily a shakeup. Mike Memoli for us tonight. Mike, we, uh, we appreciate all that new reporting. If you have any other updates from the Biden campaign, let us know. All right, it's 8.09 uh, on the East Coast. New Hampshire, we're watching. Still too early to call by NBC News standards. 15% of the vote in. But here's something that is happening. Donald Trump's lead keeps getting bigger and bigger as more vote comes in. Chuck Toddy's at the big board tonight for us. Chuck, uh, something that you pointed out to me as we get more of this vote yeah. in and more of the exit poll data in, something really interesting that actually works in former President Trump's yeah. favor. Well, look, we now can show you the, the Trump-Haley splits by party. So as we told you, our reweighting of the exit poll, the basically 49% of Republicans. Among those that are Republican that voted in this primary, look at this uh, number that Trump got. He got 74% of self-identified Republicans. Haley, 25%. As you know the math, she needed over 30 now. But that's not bad. That's not bad, but something bad did happen, yeah, right? And well, you're gonna show it's us not, now. It's not bad. Uh, uh, in, until you see this number, which here's Haley among independents. She won the independents, but as you saw here, Trump got 75% of GOPers. Haley's getting 61 there. Haley got 25% of GOPers. Trump got 37 there. So there are more Republicans than independents, and Trump did better with independents than she did with Republicans. It's basic algebra, right? We're not even, it's a little bit more than regular uh, addition and subtraction, yeah. but you see why. We've characterized the race the, the race the way we have. All right, Chuck, I got to interrupt you because uh, we have a key election alert. We just got this election alert from our decision desk. Stand by for breaking news. I think we have a call in New Hampshire. And there it is. NBC News can project that former President Trump has now won the New Hampshire primary, defeating U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley. Uh, Garrett Hake is at the watch party for former President Trump in New Hampshire. The president, the former president, now two for two. 
Nikki Haley saying this was not going to be a coronation, that she was going to stay in the race. But it's clear when it comes to Iowa voters, New Hampshire voters, the king right now is former President Trump. What are you hearing there in the, in the Trump watch party, the victory party now, Garrett? Yeah, Tom, just a minute ago, the Trump campaign changed these digital billboards behind us to say Trump wins New Hampshire. And a huge cheer went up from this party that had sort of all the makings of a victory party. But now it started to get a little rowdy. Now, make no mistake, this was the expected result for the Trump campaign. They thought they would romp in New Hampshire. And we'll find out what the final margin is. But a victory in both Iowa and New Hampshire has usually been a golden ticket to the presidential nomination. And what you're seeing now is the Trump campaign already starting to pivot towards a general election. All of their messaging, including just moments ago, a statement from the super PAC supporting Donald Trump, is arguing that every day more from this moment on that this primary continues is a day that Joe Biden gets an advantage he shouldn't have and that the Republican Party needs to coalesce around Donald Trump. I expect to hear very much that same message from the candidate when he takes the stage here later tonight. And we're hearing from an army of surrogates who are really trying to kind of close the door on this primary after just these two states voting. But again, another victory for Donald Trump in New Hampshire. It was the first state he won in 2016, launched him eventually towards the nomination in that year. The Trump campaign in 2024 is very much hoping this campaign now follows a similar trajectory. Tom? Garrett, as we have a split screen here, we're looking at the Nikki Haley watch party as well in New Hampshire. Obviously, the feeling there, uh, not as excited, a bit dour, if you will, if we can just judge from what we're seeing, the body language, a lot of people on their phones. Garrett, was there ever a moment tonight where, where it seemed like Team Trump was nervous, or did they think they had this the whole time? Team Trump, no, Tom. I mean, the professionals in this campaign, the folks who run it, have done this kind of thing before. They were very confident in their numbers. They were very confident that ultimately core Republican voters were going to come home from their candidate. But the candidate himself, Donald Trump, as he always does, expresses himself on social media, made very clear that he was frustrated with the numbers he was clearly seeing earlier in this evening, talking about the number of Democrats, the number of independent or unaffiliated voters participating in this process. He won New Hampshire by 20 points in 2016. And I think less so the Trump campaign, but more so the Trump candidate expected to see a similar margin in this state. Uh, I don't know that that's going to end up being the case here. Uh, and so that frustration about the margin was palpable. That frustration at Chris Sununu, the New Hampshire governor, has been palpable throughout the week. But the Trump campaign, I think, never really sweated that this would be a win here. Just sort of how much of a rhetorical advantage would they get towards their argument that the primary needs to end now uh, was sort of the one big question that they face over the last uh, 36 hours or so. Garrett, thank you for just joining our coverage. Former President Trump, the projected winner by NBC News of the New Hampshire primary. As soon as we get some reporting on when uh, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley or former President Trump will take the stage to speak in New Hampshire, we're going to bring that information to you live. We also have a team of reporters at the Haley event. As soon as we have new reporting, we're going to bring that to you. I want to bring in our panel back here for more. Uh, Hogan, I'm going to start with you. Do the margins matter tonight? No. I don't think they do. Uh, Donald Trump will now be 2-0. and Nikki Haley is 0-2. He will win Nevada because she's not on the ballot there. It's a caucus. And then he's ahead big in South Carolina as well. And uh, as I said before, I don't see a world in which Nikki Haley decides to keep going and lose her home state by 35, 40 points, which is what she's on track to do right now. Yes, had it been 1%... You know, really, really close. Maybe we could, we could be having that conversation. But this is a decisive win for someone in Donald Trump where a GOP candidate has never won Iowa and then gone on to win New Hampshire. Not to mention the fact, I believe it's the first time in history, I think Garrett said, where the amount of independents and Democrats voted in the GOP primary outweighed the number of Republicans. It's a huge deal for him to take yeah, both to, of these states. To win, to win both and win both over 50%. And as, as Hogan says, he's going to win Nevada. It's not contested. And H Haley will try to stay in for a while, I think, which is not going to be a happy experience for her. The entire conservative media is going to attack her for staying in, yep. saying this thing's over. Why are you helping Joe Biden? And if she stays through South Carolina, she's going to lose handily there as well. Tara, I want to read from, from the Nikki Haley campaign memo that was put out. 
before the, the voting was done in New Hampshire. It was a very effective memo, if you will. And they write, listen, we started with 2% 11 months ago, zero dollars in the bank. No one thought we had a shot. No one thought we could get it done. And here we are, $50 million raised over 200 stops and 12 fellas later, and Nikki's still standing. Will she still be standing after this loss? Um, I think the margins do matter. Uh, if it's a double digit loss, then I, it's go it will be difficult. Earlier I said I thought it was a fait accompli anyway, that Donald Trump would be the nominee. And I didn't see a path for her regardless of the of the uh, results tonight, even if she did win. Um, but at this point, I'm not surprised by the result. We'll see at the end. We only have, what, 16 percent in. We'll see what the margins are at the end. But it's also a matter of whether donors still feel comfortable giving her money. We all know we've been in campaigns long enough to know that you you stay in the race as long as you have money. <laughs> right. And so um, if she if the Koch network and, and other donors feel as though um, they can still support her, and that that memo is something they think it creates a path, then she'll stay in. But to Hogan's point, um, she is losing by 30 to 40 points in her home state. I don't know any campaign where losing that decisively in your home state shows there's a path for you to gain momentum to move forward after that. So I think they're going to have to have a lot of discussion. Now, the, the primary isn't until February 24th. So does she stay in and still hammer Trump and think that somehow that that's going to weaken him moving forward? Maybe. But I don't see why. I don't see that really being said, realistic though, for her. If, if you've been told, if any of us been told, I know if I'd been told a year ago, even three months ago, Nikki Haley finished at whatever it's going to be, 45% in New Hampshire, I would have been shocked. I mean, she's overperformed in this campaign, but she's just, the way she's campaigned, the way she's been branded, the way she's been attacked, she's just too far over on the non-Trump side of the party, which where you can get that in a state where independents are a huge swing vote and they're coming all in because they don't have, uh, have uh, a Democratic contest, but that's just not going to be replicated elsewhere and she's not going to be, you know, DeSantis couldn't get enough of the Trump vote and widen into the non-Trump vote because she, she had it. She has a grip on the non-Trump vote, but won't be able to get further into the party to get to a winning plurality or majority places. We know former President Trump likes to speak late on these nights, but when he does speak, Hogan, what do you think we're going to hear from him? I think you're going to hear a very similar message to the one you heard after Iowa. He's going to thank Nikki most likely. He will also talk about the need to unify and focus on Joe Biden as he is the enemy he believes of this party and of this country. And I would imagine that's Hogan, the I got interrupt you because uh, we do have some breaking news. It looks like Nikki Haley's about to take the stage after losing New Hampshire. Here's the former UN ambassador now. the support and a great night here tonight. Thank you so much. I want to first say thank you to my husband who I know is watching right now. I love you. We're excited to have you. Thank you. I want to thank my kids who are here, Rena, Naylan, and Josh, who have really kind of stepped up and um, just giving me the support I need. You know, you, you really pull on your family when something like this happens, and um, I am incredibly blessed by their support. I have my parents at home, and I will always say that the way they raised me to know that we lived in the best country in the world, but to also know that the best way you appreciate your blessings is to give back. Thank you, Mom and Dad. I love you so much. <laughs> to my siblings, to my in-laws, um, to everybody back at home, to Vicki for helping me take care of Mom and Dad. Thank you for that. You know, I will tell you, it has been, it feels like it's been a lifetime, but it has been almost a year that we've been campaigning in New Hampshire. Touching every hand, um, answering every question, being the last person to leave. And we had um, the most amazing thing happen is the second that we got the endorsement from Governor Chris Sununu. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean a true governor that doesn't stand behind a podium. He shows up at a diner. He shows up at the brewery. He loves the people of New Hampshire. He has been with me every single day at every single event. Chris, I couldn't have done it without you. And I want to thank someone who was with me on day one. He's a patriot. He's a hardcore conservative. And he is my friend, General Don Boldick and Sharon. Thank you so, so much. I want to congratulate Donald Trump on his victory tonight. He earned it. And I want to acknowledge that. Now, you've all heard the chatter among the political class. They're falling all over themselves, saying this race is over. Well, I have news for all of them. New Hampshire is first in the nation. It is not the last in the nation. This race is far from over. There are dozens of states left to go. And the next one is my sweet state of South Carolina. At one point in this campaign, there were 14 of us running. And we were at 2% in the polls. Well, I'm a fighter. And I'm scrappy. And now we're the last one standing next to Donald Trump. And today we got close to half of the vote. We still have a ways to go, but we keep moving up. Yes. For a lot of people, politics is way too personal. It's not personal for me. I voted for Trump twice. I was proud to serve America in his cabinet. I agree with many of his policies. I decided to run because I'm worried about the future of our country and because it's time to put the negativity and chaos behind us. We have an economy that's crushing middle class Americans. We have a border that is totally open and dangerous, creating a disaster in our country. Unbelievable! We have school we have schools that are failing too many of our children, and we have a world on fire with a war in Europe and the Middle East and a huge and growing threat from China. And then you look at Washington, D.C. We have a Congress that fights about everything and accomplishes nothing. And we have Joe Biden in the White House making one bad decision after another. When he's making any decisions at all. Our country's in a real mess. And the question is, who's going to fix it? With Donald Trump, Republicans have lost almost every competitive election. We lost the Senate. We lost the House. We lost the White House. We lost in 2018. We lost in 2020. And we lost in 2022. The worst kept secret in politics is how badly 
the Democrats want to run against Donald Trump. Yes. Yes. Trump's a loser. He's a loser. They know Trump is the only Republican in the country who Joe Biden can defeat. You can't fix you can't fix the mess if you don't win an election. You want to win. A Trump nomination is a Biden win and a Kamala Harris presidency. I defeat Biden handily. With Donald Trump, you have one bout of chaos after another. This court case, that controversy, this tweet, that senior moment. You can't fix Joe Biden's chaos with Republican chaos. The other day, Donald Trump accused me of not providing security at the Capitol on January 6th. Now, I've long called for mental competency tests for politicians over the age of 75. <laughs> Trump claims he'd do better than me in one of those tests. Maybe he would, maybe he wouldn't. But if he thinks that, then he should have no problem standing on a debate stage with me. Most Americans do not want a rematch between Biden and Trump. No. The first party to retire its 80-year-old candidate is going to be the party that wins this election. And I think it should be the Republicans that win this election. So our fight is not over because we have a country to save. In the, in the next two months, millions of voters in over 20 states will have their say. We should honor them and allow them to vote. And guess what? In the next two months, Joe Biden isn't going to get any younger or any better. We'll have all the time we need to defeat Joe Biden. When we get to South Carolina, Donald Trump's going to have a harder time falsely attacking me. The great people of South Carolina know I cut their taxes. They know, they know I signed the toughest illegal immigration bill in the country. They know we passed voter ID and tort reform and ethics reform, and they know we moved 35,000 people from welfare to work. Yes. Every We've just time been listening to former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley deliver her concession speech there in New Hampshire, but making it very clear she is not going anywhere. She is staying in this race and using this time to thank her supporters, thank her family, but then going full throttle against Donald Trump, saying that if she would take a mental competency test over 75, that he should take one, that he's scared to debate her, that a Trump nomination is a Biden win and a Kamala Harris presidency. Um, clearly, she's not going anywhere, saying she's staying until South Carolina till Super Tuesday, at least for now. It's what she's saying tonight. Our panel's here along with Chuck Todd. Um, Chuck, I'm going to start with you. At first, we weren't sure where she was going with this speech, yeah. but then, th then she made it clear. I I'm, I'm sticking around. I'm not going anywhere. And there's all these 
states left. There were a lot of family thank yous. Yeah. yeah. It made you wonder, like, mm -hmm. oh, where's this going? That's, that was, uh, and then she said, I'm not going anywhere. Look, we've been, look, I, I understand the desire to get to Super Tuesday because there are quite a few states that have similar ballot rules as yeah. New Hampshire. And she's got a, a path to 45% in a lot of places, which could accumulate some delegates. The question is, does she have a path to 50% plus one anywhere? And the real problem she has is Super Tuesdays in March. I'm checking the calendar again. Today's mm -hmm. still January, right? Yeah. She's got to slog the next 31 days before we get to South Carolina. With the only contest being, is it uh, Nevada, I believe, yeah. which she's not participating in because of the, the weird caucus rules. So how, th this momentum that she was able to create over the last three weeks, how does she get it? There's no debate, right? What's an event? What's a, you know, I, her biggest fear, the donors that have been pouring money into her over the last couple of uh, months, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're focused on one thing. They don't want Biden Trump. Haley is the vehicle to try to stop Biden Trump. If this vehicle can't work, they're going to look for other vehicles. The no labels business, like, it, it, what she's got to worry about is, do her donors give her enough money to go through Super Tuesday, or do they say, you know what, this is, I'm not throwing any more money on this, um, I'm going to try the no label. Now I'm going to go to no labels. That's to me the next week we're yeah. going to find out, and she's going to find out how how confident her donors are in her yeah. to try to go through. Our Nikki Haley embed, Greg Hyatt, tells me that tomorrow, this week and next week, I think she's meeting with donors on Wall Street mm -hmm. to get more money from, from New York and other states to try to keep her campaign alive. I want to go to a, a graphic we've made. Uh, former President Trump out on Truth Social, uh, putting his reaction to his victory, <laughs> but also the Nikki Haley concession speech. He started by saying, Haley said she had to win in New Hampshire. She didn't. He goes on to say more. She came in third last week, exclamation point. And then finally, this last one, delusional, exclamation point, exclamation point. Uh, I want to bring back our fine panel here who, you know, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley called the political class, right? At, over the conversation we were just having with it's, you guys. She was referring to Hogan. She was just referring yeah. to Hogan, okay. Um, yeah, right. Rich, but she says it's not over. Yeah. Is she wrong? I think she, she probably is. Um, this doesn't surprise me that she, she came out and s still in it. You know, as long as you're in it, you've got to be in it and say you're going to fight and you're going to win. Uh, she's, you know, going, going after Trump, Trump in a pretty tough way. It doesn't feel as though there's an off-ramp there that she's expecting, you know, onto his ticket. But Tuck, uh, Chuck described the slog, the, the month until South Carolina. And then but why probably, can't she get stronger? Is, is it just too hard? It's possible. But South Carolina, she's polling really poorly in South Carolina. It's a strong Trump state. And it's a state that demonstrates how Trump has this ability. He's still an outsider, right? He has his outsider vibe, outsider appeal to a lot of people. At the same time, he is in some ways, in many ways, the established candidate. So Hogan was mentioning earlier, every elected official in South Carolina is behind Trump. You'd expect the former governor to have that, but he's the former president right. that everyone expects to win, and it's going to be really tough for her down there. So Tara, I saw you watching this speech. You're, yeah. you're a never-Trumper. Did yeah. she motivate you? Do, do you now want her to stay in the race longer? I, I mean, look, I, I told you, I, I felt as though they were always running for second place from the very beginning, both Nikki Haley, DeSantis all, DeSantis, all of them. When they had an opportunity to go after Trump and cut him off at the knees, they didn't take it. So you can't play footsie with MAGA and then expect to beat them in the end. Like it, 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 They just never ran the type of campaign to take Trump out from the beginning. So um, anything, anyone who stays in the race that weakens Donald Trump in the general election, I'm fine with it. I mean, she can go right ahead and, and do that if it, if it weakens him. I saw some interesting numbers here. Even though she didn't win enough independents, um, she needed to win about 65% of the independents in New Hampshire. She won 61%. But if we look at those numbers and break down those those uh, suburban areas and those independents, it shows weakness for Trump in the general. And I think that's the value that she brings, is showing people who are still voting, um, they're not voting for Trump necessarily, but they, I mean, they're voting for Trump, but not in the ways that would, he would need for a general election. So that's the only value that is I there, see. Is there enough in. money out there to keep her alive past South Carolina? Uh, is there enough money out there? I mean, there's lots of money out there. But is there enough money that's going to be written to say, okay, we believe in you? Uh, well, that's what I said earlier. It depends on what the what the Coke network does and those donors. There are major billionaires out there. There's Wall Street guys out there that are looking for somewhere to put their money. Do they see a path for her? Um, I'm not so sure because everyone we've seen so far, from Jamie Dimon, 
women on down yeah. in the Wall Street class. They keep their beginning to coalesce behind Trump again because they little like by tax little, cuts. Right. That's right. Uh, Hogan, before we start with you, I, I do want to put the poll up on our screen. This is South Carolina, the next contest in the GOP uh, race for the nomination. And the numbers here, uh, they're, they're just not great for Nikki Haley. 64% for Trump, 25% for Haley there. You're from South Carolina. You look at these numbers, you hear her speech, and, and listen, if you're on the fence for Nikki Haley, you hear her speech, she sounds like she still wants to fight, that she's a warrior, she's ready to go into South Carolina. But what's going to happen when, when she gets her, do you think? They're all going to stay in until they don't. Right. DeSantis was going to stay in yeah. until he didn't. The same thing applies here. What else is she going to say unless she wants to get out and endorse Trump tonight, which she's not going to do. She feels as though this race is between herself and Donald Trump, and it is. I mean, there are more people on the Democrat primary ticket than there are on the Republican side. But the point has been made here ad nauseum, but it's, it's worth saying again, and that is it is very difficult for someone like Nikki Haley, who, yes, was governor of this state, and also one re-election there to be down so far and expect to win her home state. Everyone in South Carolina, the statewide office holders um, at the local level, the governor, the attorney general, they're all lining up behind Donald Trump. And even as we said, Tim Scott, a, a senator from the state of South Carolina, someone Nikki Haley put in appointed. his position, yeah. appointed him, and he is for Donald Trump. I just don't see a world in which she continues. You've run campaigns. You've run campaigns that have come out successful in Iowa and, and then later had to keep raising money until it got to a point where it was just there was New, New the reality. There's always been yeah. Hogan's weak spot. Yeah. <laughs> Raided right Iowa. But talk to me about the conversations <laughs> with donors. When, when you're on the Nikki Haley campaign and you're picking up the phone tonight, what is the pitch to donors? Well, interestingly enough, the, the Wall Street conversation hurts her with the GOP base. You're telling me she's going to go to Wall Street and ask for more money. That's a pariah. Like when she was when she was given the Coke money uh, in politics on the Republican side, typically you would say, wow, look at this great boost of influx of money. Now it's like, wait, of course she would get the Coke money because she's an establishment globalist like they are. So it's not necessarily a good thing. I don't know what she says other than, hey, we're going to get through South Carolina and then we're going to play in. She's got to have a strategy that's specific because these people are millionaires and billionaires not by being stupid, but by knowing how to invest money to get a return. And if they don't right. see a return so, in any of these states, I don't know what kind of pitch she's right. going to yeah, make. It's a pragmatic, you know, it's, she's a vehicle, right? It's not like uh, they'll crawl over broken glass for Nikki right. Haley because they believe so deeply in her. They Correct. think she has a shot. And if they conclude she doesn't, they'll go someplace else. Ali Vitali is at the Haley campaign headquarters. She was there watching that speech unfold as well. Ali, talk to me about what stood out to you, because in the beginning, it almost sounded like she was going to say, I'm out of this race. But then she, again, just went straight after Donald Trump and didn't let her foot off the gas. You know what, though, in Iowa, Tom, she started the same way by profusely thanking her family and the people who helped her get to this position in the first place, thanking her husband who's serving a tour overseas, thanking her kids for stepping up in the meantime, and thanking the governor of the state of New Hampshire, Chris Sununu, who was a driving force behind the way that she barnstormed in this state in the closing week of the primary here. He was with her in diners, at coffee shops, and of course at town halls. Now, of course, Haley thanking him from this big stage and announcing early in the night that she's going to be staying in. It sort of reminded me of back in 2020 when Amy Klobuchar in Iowa came out early, said she did well enough to call it a win by her standards, and then moved on to New Hampshire. That's kind of what Haley is doing right here in New Hampshire, trying to just bounce on into what she keeps calling sweet South Carolina because it's her home state. I think your panel's right to point out it is a real slog there for a number of reasons, specifically the idea that there's less college plus age voters there, the idea that this is really a place that, as we were talking about before, was one of the first real places that we saw Trump country begin to show its power in 2016. Nevertheless, there were some parts of Nikki Haley's speech that really stood out to me, specifically just the general way that she is basically making an open invitation to anyone who, like her, voted for Trump twice, not served in his administration, though she points out that she did that for him as well, and liked his policies, she's now inviting them, hey, if you like all those things and you voted for him twice, I will offer you those things without the chaos, without the court cases, without, in her words, the senior moments. 
talking about Trump in the most direct fashion that we've heard her do it, challenging him to debate her, challenging him in some ways to take a mental fitness or mental acuity test. She said that on the day that she announced her presidential bid almost a year ago in South Carolina, she said, if you are over 75, you should be taking a mental fitness test. Clearly, she's challenging Trump on that front now almost directly. This is a real moment where we're watching Nikki Haley take her most direct shots at Trump yet, but we're also watching her make age the key issue here in this race. It's almost the thing that she says with reluctance and a little twinge of sadness that she almost hates to be saying this about her rival, but it is the seed that she's continued to plant in the minds of voters, both here in New Hampshire and, of course, down the rest of the primary calendar as she goes. That's the one thing that Trump's not going to be able to change. He's not going to be able to change how old he is, and frankly, neither is Joe Biden. And it plays upon a fear that I've already heard from Republicans. Republicans have done a really good job of instilling concern about Joe Biden's age and acuity. Now Nikki Haley is lumping him in with Donald Trump, and that makes the concern tougher. It is a very subtle way to dig into the minds of voters, and she's hoping that this is an issue that can be a wedge that she can use to get to the nomination. Allie, before you go, d does the margin of victory matter here? because as we watch more of the vote come in, uh, yeah. the spread's getting wider and wider. We're now a double-digit lead with former President Trump over Nikki Haley. If this turns out to be a shellacking, do you think she eventually drops out, or do you think that's it? She's made the speech. She's sticking in this at least until South Carolina. It's going to matter hugely, and I think that's why she came out as early as she did, because right now we're looking at the results and we're thinking, well, it looks a lot closer than we thought it would be. Her campaign team is seeing that, too. It was a shrewd move for them to come out early and say, this was good enough. We did really well. Let's go to let's go to what they would call maybe greener pastures in South Carolina. But again, we can't underscore enough how tough of a slog that is. But the margin is going to matter immensely here, because when she goes to meet her donors in New York and Texas and across Across the country, that's going to be the proof of purchase, the return on investment. How close can she actually get to Donald Trump? How much of a match can she actually make this? All right, Ali Vitali for us from the Haley uh, watch party tonight. Ali, we appreciate all your reporting. Please stand by. Joining us now live, Frank Luntz, a pollster and political strategist and analyst and former Democratic senator from Missouri, Claire McCaskill. We uh, appreciate you guys both being here. Frank, I'm going to start with you. You wrote the, wrote the book, Words That Matter. Any of the words that Nikki ha Haley said tonight, will they matter with Republican voters? Yes, they will. But we still can't tell whether it's a double-digit win or not. That question that you asked your colleague moments ago is the question if she wins if she sorry if she loses by less than 10 percent she has permission to go on voter permission if that becomes a double digit loss it's how it's hard to see how she recovers in terms of her language three things that matter number one electability does she have what it takes to beat joe biden number two chaos you hear her use that word all the time is she the kind of leader that the Republicans are looking for. And number three, can she capture that unaffiliated, that vote that isn't so hardcore Republican to demonstrate that she can put together a majority in these other states? The first two, arguably, let yes. The last one is much tougher. And that's why the final margin of tonight matters considerably. Frank, I do, I do want to ask you, though, when, when you look at this race and you listen to her message and you've helped craft so many speeches and, and phrases for candidates that have, that have won races, did she craft her message too late? Did she sort of get her voice too late in this process? That's a great question. And if you watch her debate performance, she got better as time went on. She found her voice. She found the language, the messaging that, that put her as close as it did here in New Hampshire, but this is the best state for her. Independents can vote here. Moderates are a significant percentage of the Republican vote. Her message is so attuned to them, but you cannot forget Donald Trump's intensity, the level of passion and support of his supporters is unlike anything I've seen in my career. Unlodging them or dislodging them is pretty darn hard, and clearly she hasn't succeeded to the level that she wanted to do tonight. Frank, is it frustrating to you as somebody who's worked with so many Republicans that close to 50 percent, maybe more, maybe a little less of Republicans don't want former President Trump and yet he's going to be the nominee? I don't think the word is frustrating. I do want a positive 
message. I do want someone who's hopeful. I want someone who's focused on the future. The governor of New Hampshire, Chris Sununu, who just walked into the room right across from me, right here. You can hear the noise as he's walking in. He's the kind of Republican that this country needs to look and find a more positive approach. Donald Trump understands his voters. He gets them. And he knows how to deliver the kind of speech and the kind of message that they're looking for. Nikki Haley, it's a little, it's a little tougher because, quite frankly, the Republican Party of 2024 is not the Republican Party of 10 years ago. Frank Luntz, we appreciate that as you're continuing to count votes there in Milford, New Hampshire, on the left side of the screen. Uh, Senator Claire McCaskill, you've won elections, you've lost elections. Um, I asked Hogan this question, but you've, you've had to do this. How hard is it now to call your supporters in South Carolina, call your election teams, get them excited, and then call your donors and say, I need you to write another check? I don't think it's going to be hard at all for Nikki Haley to raise money. she got plenty of money. That's not her problem. But I've got to turn this on its head a little bit. I mean, really, this is the former president, which is like an incumbent to the Republican Party. And he managed 50% in Iowa. He's at 50% in New Hampshire of his own party. Now, I know in, Iowa, in New Hampshire, unaffiliated voters can vote in the Republican primary. But I don't see how this is necessarily a show of strength for him. I mean, Joe Biden's going to get more than 50%. He's not even on the ballot. Yeah. So I, I think... This shows that there is in the Republican Party voters that do not want Trump, strongly do not want Trump. And I believe that those are open for Joe Biden to get. And that could be the difference in this election. So you're saying if you had a say in this, you'd want this Republican race to shake out because you don't think that this is what the party needs right now. Because if there's half the party or around half the party that doesn't like a candidate, let the process play out. Well, I think we've seen in Washington, the Republican Party is really divisive right now. I mean, they can't lead the House. They can't even do the business of the government because they're so busy fighting among themselves between the MAGA wing of the party yeah. and, frankly, the Nikki Haley wing of the party. Now, no question, Trump has the majority of the Republican Party that is part of the MAGA group now. They are with Trump, and I think he'll win the nomination. But don't discount that they have a real war within their party, and part of that is among the folks that have funded the Republican Party by and large for most of its history. Senator Claire McCaskill brings a good point. Hogan, I want to bring it over to you now. I mean, is she right? You know, can, can Trump get the rest of the party behind him? And more importantly, there by November? Sure. I mean, look, like ice cream is not ice cream. Like the incumbent is not the incumbent. This is a much different situation that Donald Trump sees himself in as opposed to someone like Joe Biden, who's the sitting president. Donald Trump clearly has a stranglehold on the GOP voter. There is a massive amount of people on our side who want to see a second term for Donald Trump, who love those America first policies that improve the lives of all Americans, and they want to see a return to that. The question becomes, can he take that and expand the party and get some of the independents, which which is what we've been talking about for a long time. This, as always, these presidential elections are a referendum on somebody. Yeah. Who's it gonna be on? If we can make it about Joe Biden and his failures, we have a really good chance of taking back the White House. If not, and it's about Donald Trump, then we've got an issue. But this campaign, I should say, is so much different because it's not in a vacuum. We're actually talking about a candidate in Donald Trump who has a record as president, and now we have Joe Biden also has a record as president, and you can butt those up against each other and ask yourself that famous question Reagan did, is your life better today than it was four years ago? Senator McCaskill? Well, first of all, presidential politics is <laughs> famous for personalities mattering. Sure and whether or not somebody is likable and whether somebody wants someone in their living room for four years. That's where I think Donald Trump has a real problem, especially with swing voters and independent voters that don't eat politics all day long like all of us do, mm -hmm. that don't live and breathe it every day. They know he represents chaos. They know he represents a guy who is more interested in driving grievance than he is aspiration. They know he is not somebody who's ever talked about uniting the country. He has always talked about dividing the country. So I think that will come into play also. It will be an important part of this. You heard all these Republican voters today that we've interviewed yeah. in New Hampshire. So many of them said, well, you know, he's arrogant. I don't like him, but I liked his policies. It matters in presidential politics. And those were, you know, diehard Republicans. Right. So when you get to an independent yeah. voter, it really makes a difference. Personality matters. The economy matters as well. And, and we'll have to see where the economy is as we get closer to November. Rich Lauer, you've covered uh, Trump as well, his rise in the Republican Party. Uh, talk to me about 
potentially the viciousness that is going to be unleashed now on Nikki Haley and the Nikki Haley campaign as they go into South Carolina. We're seeing a, a, just a taste of it tonight. Yeah, uh, the, the line on her will be it's over. Uh, she needs to get over it and get with the team and not hurt Donald Trump, who's the only vehicle to beat Joe Biden. And uh, I just don't think it's going to be very happy four weeks for her up to South Carolina, and she's probably going to lose South Carolina. I will say both Claire and Hogan are, are right. If either of these parties were able to switch someone out, which is not going to happen, but if it was someone else besides Biden or Kamala Harris, they'd beat Trump easily. If there's someone else besides Trump, they'd beat uh, Biden easily. But that's not going to happen. You have, according to the poll, you know, roughly Joe Biden's 35 percent approval, Donald Trump's 35 yeah. percent approval, right? And th it's they're a 50-50 race. Well, yeah. Yeah. A lot of clear, polls. Though, Tara, Joe, yeah. uh, Donald Trump has never beaten Joe Biden. Joe Biden beat Donald Trump, despite what Donald Trump has been trying to tell people. In his mind, he thinks he's the incumbent, right? He's never acknowledged that he actually lost the election, which is why we're uh, where, where, where we are with this with him. But the other thing, too, is that to Claire's point, independent voters and the moderate voters in the Republican Party who don't like Donald Trump are going to be the people who decide this election in Pennsylvania, in Nevada, in Michigan, in Wisconsin, in Arizona. And those people, as we get closer, are pay when they pay more attention and realize that this is a Trump-Biden race and what Donald Trump represents, which means less rights for, for, for their daughters, with daughters having less rights than their grandmothers do, thanks to the extreme uh, MAGA position on women's reproductive health, that's something that is going to not sit well with women. When they look at Donald Trump's behavior and the, what, what he says and how vicious you talk about viciousness, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, when we get closer, are they going to step back and say, D is this a type of, of America that we want? again are we going to go through this again someone who incites insurrections someone who doesn't who thinks they want to be a dictator on day one someone who doesn't believe in our democracy someone who mocks people someone who's a criminal defendant um, I think when people start to pay more attention and there's a binary choice which there will be those independents are not going to break for Donald Trump that's entirely possible and those are all obviously vulnerabilities for Trump but one of the Huge most extraordinary, th extraordinary thing in the polling is there's this kind of Trump this nostalgia about the Trump presidency. You ask people, who are you better off uh, uh, under? Whose policies you thought were better in the country? And Trump wins on those metrics Clearly. compared to Joe Biden. Well, the Biden campaign has work to do on that, despite the fact that right now the, the economy is actually pretty, doing pretty good. We are the number one oil producers in the world, so the energy um, argument is actually a fallacy. Inflation is down to 3% yeah. from 9 The Biden, you know, Biden passed infrastructure, the Inflation Reduction Act. They're actually governing, but it's up to the Biden campaign to actually sell that message so the American people right. feel what the reality is <laughs> yeah, going on. Oh, good. I heard yeah. you say earlier, and I just got to jump in here and say, I will make you a really friendly $1 wager <laughs> that Donald Trump will not thank Nikki Haley tonight. Yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, he'll take that. Uh, we'll take that. If you just join dollar. us, if you just join us, NBC News has projected that <laughs> Donald Trump has won the New Hampshire primary. Holly Jackson is in New Hampshire talking to voters about this reaction, about this victory tonight. Holly, what are they telling you? Well, let me have him tell you, Tom. We've been here uh, at this bar where folks Thanks, are watching the returns come in, watching some of the results. This is uh, Ed. I'm sorry to interrupt, gentlemen. Greetings. You voted for former President Trump? I did. I voted for Donald Trump. Tell us why. Well, I just feel like he's uh, not beholden to any anybody. Like, he doesn't take any money from donors. He just loves America. And I think he just wants the best for America. NBC News has now projected that the former president has won this primary. Your reaction here? Well, I'm happy about that. So I hope he can go on and uh, win the general election in November and take down whoever's going to run for the Democratic Party. I don't think Biden's going to be their candidate, but the country's going in the wrong direction. I mean, we're what's going on here? Like, the economy is bad. Um, the border is wide open. It's, I feel like there's so much corruption going on in government on both sides, Republican and Democrats. Do you believe that Nikki Haley should drop out of this race? There's been some discussion around that. You saw the, uh, the current chair of the Republican National Committee come out tonight and say that if, listen, we don't know what the margins are, but she said if Donald Trump has a strong showing that that sends a clear message about where the electorate is at, about unity here in the party, and yet Nikki Haley says, hey, listen, this is not a coronation. People deserve the chance to make their voices heard. What say you? Well, I, I believe that Nikki Haley has a chance. Like, she sh I don't think she should drop out just yet. Um, I think this this like a flavor for her in this country. Uh, but I, I feel like 
Trump is the person that the people want. Like, he, he needs... I feel like he's the only candidate that loves America. Like, I, I think Nikki Haley's beholden to rhinos. I feel like she's a rhino, and she's part of the Uniparty. Like I was trying to allude to earlier, she's with, like, the Democrats and the Republicans that are part of this Uniparty that I feel like are in control, and there's no way out. We need somebody that loves America. Ed, thank you so much for talking with us. Uh, obviously, through... Happy, as you say, that former President Trump is projected to win in here. It looks like um, we will be chatting with you and others throughout the night. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So I want to walk you back a little bit. And listen, you heard it there, right? The rationale from some of these folks who have backed former President Trump, who see the results here tonight, that uh, he appears to have the lead, of course, projected to win here. What we don't know is by how much. I want to bring over to somebody else who's backing former President Trump, who voted from today. Jamie, that's you, right? Voted for former President Trump today. Absolutely did. Uh, we have now projected the race for him. I am so happy to hear all this. This is great. I'm, I'm surprised it was as close as it was, to be honest with you. I didn't think she was going to actually get that much, but it's crazy. We still don't know what the margins are at this point. And I asked one of your... Uh, F fellow folks over here enjoying the evening here at this uh, bar, the GOAT in Manchester. Do you think Nikki Haley should drop out of the race? I do. I think it's about time that she drops out, just like the rest of them have. And I think, I got to be honest, I think Vivek is amazing. We did a couple of events with him, and the guy is absolutely class act in everything he stands for. And I hope he stands with Trump because I think he could be after Trump. Talking about Vivek Ramaswamy, yeah, yes. uh, Jamie, awesome. of course, at this bar here, the GOAT. You said he had a couple events here. Do you yeah. think he could be potential VP material? I mean, I don't know about VP, but I think he should work with Trump side by side. I would love to see it, and his crew is absolutely amazing. I mean, amazing. Not the class act, for real. Jamie, thank you so much. I really appreciate you talking with us tonight. Um, and this is going to be the scene throughout the night here. As we turn ahead now, and I'll tell you uh, where I'm going actually tomorrow is South Carolina, because that is a state where Nikki Haley is now eyeing. It is obviously, I'm going to post up here for just one second. It is obviously her home state. It is a place that she is already, and you heard it in her speech tonight, in her remarks now, she's already casting her eyes on her home state. The issue with that is that it is simply, and, and we've been talking about it here on this program and this special, it doesn't have the same kind of demographic makeup that New Hampshire does as it relates to some of those undeclared or more independent minded voters who we've seen have been breaking for Nikki Haley here. South Carolina, different vibe, different situation. A real question mark as to whether she is going to be able uh, to pull together the same kind of coalition and have a strong showing there. Uh, there's I think, some skepticism. Uh, in, in the broader Republican orbit that that could actually happen. So we will see what the margin is here for former President Trump. He, for his part, is already casting his eye on November toward the general election. We have heard that and seen that time and time again at his rallies, uh, even just recently uh, overnight here at his latest rally, talking about how he wants to take it to President Biden come November. That is part of the dynamic here. Now, keep in mind the other piece of this here. Uh, we will talk to a couple other folks about this in just a second. Um, Actually, these guys. Hi. Voters, did you vote yes, today? I Tell did. me who you voted for. Uh, Donald Trump. Okay. Uh, reaction. He's projected to win here in New Hampshire. What do you think? I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, well, we called it. I mean, it looks like he, we, we were oh. saying he's projected to win. Oh, good. Excellent. Because, you know, I think uh, if you're voting for Haley, you're voting for war. So Trump is the way to go. No wars. One of the things that we were just about to get into, this is a, a former president, and I spoke with him today at a campaign event at a polling site, actually, very briefly. He's facing some legal challenges here. Does that concern you? Does that bother you at all? No, that's all political stuff. That's going to go by the wayside. I'm not worried about that at all. Thank you for talking, uh, for chatting with us. I appreciate okay. it. I mean, that is one of the things that has come up on the campaign trail. Former President Trump obviously facing multiple indictments. You saw Ron DeSantis, one of his former rivals today, blame that in part for why DeSantis's campaign never really took off because he said that some Republicans rallied around former President Trump because of those legal issues. So, Tom, that's kind of the lay of the land where we are here in Manchester. Uh, I will see you either later tonight or in South Carolina soon. Hallie, with all that hard work you're doing over there, are they at least offering you a beer? Are they offering you wings? I mean, tell me you're getting some love out there. Can I just say, I'm going to have a burger and then no comment on what happens when we're off the air. That'll, we'll, we'll let that just live here in Manchester. That'll be off the record. Hallie Jackson, thank you so much for that. We are at the top of the hour. Our coverage of the first in the nation primary continues right now.
News Special, Decision 2024, the New Hampshire primary. Reporting tonight, Tom Yamas. And good evening. Welcome back to our continuing coverage of the New Hampshire presidential primary. It has been a big night for former President Trump. But Nikki Haley refusing to back down. To get you up to speed, NBC News projecting that former President Trump has won the New Hampshire primary, defeating his last standing challenger, former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley. Right now you can see where the vote's at, about 28% of the vote in. And you can see Donald Trump expanding his lead here. The Haley campaign saying they are not going to drop out of this race. You can see Trump's lead, though, even still starting to widen. But within minutes of that call, Haley did this. She came right out uh, at her campaign headquarters in New Hampshire, addressing supporters in a fiery and defiant speech and going after Trump. New Hampshire is first in the nation. It is not the last in the nation. This race is far from over. There are dozens of states left to go. And the next one is my sweet state of South Carolina. We are now waiting to hear the victory speech from the former president that could come at any moment. And we will bring it to you live as soon as it happens. I want to get right over to Garrett Hake. He's standing by at the Trump campaign headquarters. He's been watching all of this. So, Garrett, you know, my first question to you is what do we expect to hear from the former president? Because I think we've already got a sense of it on Truth Social. And it sounds like he's getting angrier and angrier that, she, yeah. that Nikki Haley has not dropped out. Yeah, Tom, I think that's right. And it's notable because after he won in Iowa, we saw a very conciliatory tone from Donald Trump in his victory speech there. And we may yet see that tone tonight. He knows he's going to have a huge audience across the country, not just Republican primary voters, but the voters, the swingy voters that he hopes to win over in a general election. And he wants to project a kind of calm uh, competence and try to unite Republicans, including Haley voters behind him. That said, on his social media platform, his first commentary on the fact that Nikki Haley was speaking and not dropping out tonight was to call her delusional and to suggest that she basically failed to meet the, the high bar that she set for herself of winning in New Hampshire. So I think what we can expect is really a two-pronged approach from the Trump campaign going forward. To try to show that they can be open-armed to even Nikki Haley and her supporters like they have been to the other candidates who've dropped out of this race. To try to rebuild the Big Ten of the Republican Party. And by the way, they've already gotten two senatorial endorsements tonight, one from Josh Hawley, who was always sort of a Trump guy, but one from John Cornyn, who I can tell you is nobody's idea of a MAGA senator on Capitol Hill, kind of coming back into the fold tonight. But they're also going to start to make Nikki Haley's life very miserable and very lonely. About, about five minutes after this race was called, Tom, I turned around to see South Carolina Senator Tim Scott walk into the ballroom as a guest of the Trump campaign. He's now about to become probably one of the most recognizable political surrogates in the country. Likewise with South Carolina's Republican governor, a Trump endorser, the other senator, Lindsey Graham, a Trump endorser, and much of their congressional delegation. They want to put Nikki Haley on an island, and that's what they're going to be doing over the next uh, three, four weeks until the South Carolina primary, if she stays in the race that long. It is not going to be an easy race. All right, Garrett Hake, we appreciate all your reporting. We're going to stand by with you, and as soon as the former president takes the stage, we are going to take you live. Um, we do want to get you updated on where the vote stands right now. As we've projected here at NBC News, Donald Trump, the winner of the New Hampshire primary. A lot of the votes still coming in. The big question now, how big is this margin, right? It's grown from double digits to even more than that. We're about 13% uh, right now. So we know that Donald Trump has won the New Hampshire primary, but the question tonight is, how did he win this primary? Chuck Todd is over at the big board. He's got some of the data coming in. And Chuck, during the commercial break, you were pointing something out to me. You're yeah. like, this, this is sort of incredible for New Hampshire. and This is actually very strong for the president, former president. What'd you see? Well, it's the gender gap, but let me just go through the basics yeah. here, right? These were the biggest groups for him. He's defining what conservative is. He won 88% of those voters. And of course, we've been talking about this all night. Uh, about half the electorate was Republican. Well, he won 75% of half the electorate. The problem is Nikki Haley didn't win 75% of independents, right? right? She won just under that. Uh, he did well with working class voters, voters with incomes under 50, and of course, those without a college degree. But where he really, just another just straight up way of seeing this is, look at this massive gender gap here. Um, Donald Trump won men by nearly 20 points. 58%, yeah. 40, 51% was male. Now, let me show you what the female split was. 
Nikki Haley won it by a point. Wow. Okay, you can do the math. These were female voters in the New Hampshire, in the New Hampshire, Hampshire electorate. America. So, you know, this, is, this has been a problem for her. She is not... She doesn't seem to benefit from, from anybody voting on gender or not right. benefiting enough, while Donald Trump overperforms with men in general. Some of this has been abortion rights, which is why we've seen more women um, flock against the president. But you can do the math here. OK, this is yeah. why a double digit victory now looks we, more likely than not. We have talked about margins, right, mm -hmm. and that the margins are going to matter here in New Hampshire. I'm looking up at one of the screens right now. We got 30 yeah, percent of the, the vote, the vote in. We'll, we'll, in. We'll pull it up here. Yep. And, and now you have 55.8, 42.6. This keeps growing as more vote comes it does. in. Do you think that that's going to be the trend? It is because, look, there's a ton of stuff that isn't reported here on the border of Massachusetts. And why? Why does why do those towns matter? The. The Taxachusetts label, yep. right, is basically former Massachusetts residents right. who moved across the way and no tax. New Hampshire, this is always a very heavily Republican area. So, for instance, just look, you know, he's winning a place like Nashua. Nashua is a place that, frankly, Democrats usually do well in a general. This was a place she needed to win. Yeah. Um, this was always a place that John McCain's headquarters would always be in Nashua. Nashua was the heart of, of sort of McCain country. I was always looking at Nashua to see, and she's not winning there. And in some of these other places, his numbers are just gigantic. Sorry, these are yeah. tiny little things. Seabrook. Right. This is uh, where everybody in Massachusetts has to go to buy fireworks. Okay. okay. It's the place <laughs> yeah, yeah, you go yeah, across yeah, the border. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you, it gives you a hint, right? Hey, yeah, yeah, live yeah. for your die. Right. A live free or die place yeah. is a 50 point victory for Trump. That yeah. sort of fits, does it Chuck not? Chuck Todd with the Roman candle data there point, which I, I appreciate. The important um, firework demographic. Our, our crack panel is standing by. We're going to get to them in a second, but I want to bring in the moderator of Meet the Press, Kristen Welker, who joins me now. She's got some new reporting. Kristen, I know you've been working your sources. Uh, you've had some conversations, uh, some, some deep conversations yeah. with the Haley campaign. What are they telling you? So they are defiant, just like Nikki Haley is defiant. They say they still have a path. Only two states have voted. It it is way too early to declare this race over. Most importantly, Tom, because this is the question that I continue to put to them, how do you convince your supporters? How do you convince your donors to stay on board? They say, look, they still have a ton of cash in the bank. They say they still have the support of donors to move forward because she is marching on to her home state. So that's the messaging coming out of the Haley campaign. But here's the reality check and why it does get so complicated, in part because of the numbers that Chuck just laid out. New Hampshire is tailor-made for Nikki Haley because 45% of voters, according to exit polls, say that they are independents. Very few other states match that, maybe a Massachusetts down the road. But when you think about South Carolina, where Trump has a double-digit lead, when you think about those Super Tuesday states, the math doesn't necessarily get better for her. In fact, you have larger swaths of voters who describe themselves as Republicans. And that's why it becomes more uphill for her. Yeah, if you were Nikki Haley, you could say, listen, New Hampshire's going to be the electorate writ small. Yes. The, I did well here, but as Chuck's pointed out, she did, she did okay, right? That's right. And, and in talking to my sources leading up to tonight, they were focused on that margin. Would she be able to hold him to single digits? And that's what Governor Sununu, one of her top surrogates, has been arguing. Look, we're going to have a strong finish here. That's what they were signaling that they were hoping for. That would, I think, in their opinion, have been a win. We're still waiting for the vote yeah. to come in. But again, if she can't argue that she kept him to single digits, it just gets very complicated. The other point that I would make is that it, it, let's do a split screen and check in with the Biden camp. From their perspective, it seems like the general election has begun today. Because they want to run against Trump and they That's just put out right. an announcement. Yeah. Out an announcement and a campaign shakeup, yeah. which is a sign that they are seeing the red flags in the polling. They are seeing that former President Trump is incredibly competitive in some of these key states that propelled Biden to the White House. And Former President Biden and his team have clearly taken a hard look at their campaign and have made the realization that they've got to get into go mode now, given this momentum that yeah. we are seeing from Trump. And by the way, just one more point I'll make. We're not just talking about momentum. We're talking about math, too, because Trump right. is racking up delegates with each you, You've states. covered the Republicans and Donald Trump. Yep. 
and the Republican Party, how it changed since 2016. Talk to us about sort of the machine that Nikki Haley is going to be up against. Because some, some, some voters out there, some viewers may be saying, well, why doesn't she just stay in it if she's got the money? But she's going to be up against a lot more than just negative ads. It's, there's this pressure campaign that's going to build. It's such an important point, Tom. And we saw that today with the head of the RNC, Ronna McDaniel, putting out a statement basically saying, now is a time for unity. She put that statement out before the polls had closed. We are seeing Republicans close those ranks around Donald Trump. You have the endorsement by Tim Scott and the delegation from South Carolina. You have, as Garrett was just mentioning, Senator Cornyn, Deb Fisher, who've now come out and endorsed Donald Trump. But guess what else you have? You have Republicans in Biden districts starting to endorse Donald Trump. And that's a significant step, I think, in what we are seeing, this coalescing, the Republican Party really coalescing around Donald Trump. So Nikki Haley's going to be up against all of that. I would just point out, look, she's still watching these returns come in, as we all are. She's still watching to see right. what the final tally is going to be. Ron DeSantis did the same thing last week, and then he looked at a lot of polling and had some hard conversations. So we'll have to see what happens as we get closer to South Carolina, because if she loses in her home state, Tom, it's one thing to lose in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. If she loses in her home state, that could potentially jeopardize her political future yeah. if she has aspirations for 20 if she if she gets booked on meet the press for sunday and then suddenly cancels <laughs> we, 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 we know there might be something going on that's there that's the tell sign don't think we haven't asked already um, Kristen Walker, always great to have it's you great thank to be you. here Tom. Yeah. thank you uh, republican congressman and trump supporter mike collins of georgia joins us now from the trump campaign headquarters representative explain this to me right if we all believe in democracy we all love democracy why don't we let the process play out why shouldn't Nikki Haley stay in this race as long as she can. Well, I think it's uh, we need to go ahead and just close this thing down now and get on to the general election. It's it's very important that we stop playing games with a primary that you have no chance in. She's not going to win. The, she's not going to be the nominee. She has no chance of winning. And especially if she can't even get close to New Hampshire, where it is a more liberal state, she is the more liberal candidate in this primary. She's not going to carry South Carolina. She's not going to carry Nevada. So why keep going through the motions when we could get a, a good head start on making sure that we turn out the vote in November and get President Trump back in the White House? But, Representative, aren't you concerned? I mean, even in your home state, right, the president has been indicted for election interference, right? He, he has more than 90 criminal counts against him. Are you worried that you, you, you may have a candidate who, who can't even run or has been convicted? Not one bit. You know, Donald Trump was loved in this country up until the point where he became president and started implementing great America First Agenda policies. And the deep state decided we need to get rid of this guy and we'll do it any way we can. These are all bogus charges. I think everybody's even seeing now that the, the wheels are falling off the bus fast on that case down in Georgia to the point to where you may have an indictment on Fannie Willis and the prosecutor for what they've been doing. Yeah, it's unclear if there'll be an indictment against them, but we know they, they are now obviously being investigated and that's trying to be figured out down there in Georgia. As this race continues, um, would you put pressure on Nikki Haley? I mean, vocally, on social media, um, is that gonna be necessary or, or should you guys at least wait till South Carolina and see what happens there? You know, I would hope that uh, Nikki Haley takes the opportunity tomorrow while she's in South Carolina. Uh, to go ahead and set her speech up and, and get out of the race and get behind and put her support behind Donald Trump tomorrow. And then we get this thing closed out and we move on with President Trump as being our nominee, which he will be at the end of the day, and uh, get started on our general election. Uh, you know, the Biden-Harris re-election team has put out a statement essentially saying and agreeing with you uh, that, that, that the results tonight confirmed Donald Trump has all but locked up the GOP nomination. That's a direct quote. Why do you think the Democrats want to run so badly against former President Trump if President Trump can beat Biden, in your opinion? Well, I don't know what their reasoning would be since I'm clearly not in a Democrat camp. But I can tell you what the American people want, and they want back what they had during that Trump administration and those policies that uh, were, had this economy and this country humming like a sewing machine. They want back that border security that we had down there on the southern border, and they want back that, that, that peace through strength that we had with our military. 
it is so obvious and, and people across this country and you know we've been out there i was in ohio last week we came up here today and we have just been out among the motoring public just to see what the issues are and what the concerns that they have and those are the exact concerns the american people want to get back what they had during the, the uh, trump administration and come november yeah we're going to do that we're going to take our country back all right, Representative, we appreciate your time. Thank you for joining our coverage here of the New Hampshire primary. Joining me now is Republican strategist Sarah Fagan and Robert Gibbs, former press secretary for President Obama and an NBC News analyst. And I should mention, I think, a host of Hacks on Tap, right? One of the largest growing podcasts in America, possibly. Uh, Sarah, I'm, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you work in the Republican Party. You've consulted Republicans. Uh, tonight's results, does, does Nikki Haley need to drop out or should she continue to fight another day? Well, I think she doesn't have to drop out. I, I think, you know, as has been talked about tonight, there's a there's a hard path for her. There doesn't appear to be a path for her to accumulate the de delegates needed to win based on these results and based on the presumption that she's not going to do well in South Carolina. But, look, I think if you were making an argument uh, to her to stay in the race, you would say you've got a, you know, 77-year-old, likely Republican nominee with a lot of legal challenges before him. You have an 81-year-old incumbent president. The odds of that being the case on Election Day, those two people, uh, you know, being the nominees, like, you know, perhaps that's, you know, 80 percent, but it's not 100 percent. And so why not just stay in and see what happens and accumulate some delegates? And I think you know, that's certainly an argument that I hear being made, um, you know, in the Republican Party in some corners. Robert, you know, we saw a, a campaign shakeup, if you will, with the Biden-Harris reelect team tonight. Uh, the economy numbers uh, moving in favor of President Biden. But there's one thing you can change, right, which poll after poll shows voters are really concerned about, even Democratic voters, and that's Joe Biden's age. How does a campaign like his get over that fact, and how can you still show the American people that he still has you know, several years left in him to run this country. Well, they're just going to have to show it each and every day in the campaign. They're going to go have to go out there. He's going to have to prosecute the case. He's going to have to have energetic events. People are going to need to see him. I, I hope you'll see debates uh, in the fall. Uh, they're just going to have to project through this campaign that he's capable of doing this job. He's not going to get any younger. N neither is Donald Trump. In terms of what happened in the campaign, I think it was a smart decision. Look, you had two of President Biden's most senior and trusted aides in the White House. Uh, and quite frankly, you can't run a campaign these days from inside the White House. It's too complicated. There are too many decisions to be made. Uh, and it just makes a lot of sense to move those people out of their day jobs into uh, into running the campaign in a more forceful way. I, I think, you know, Donald Trump has got, gotten closer tonight to being the nominee. I think in the end, that's a good thing for Joe Biden. I think having a longer campaign, putting that choice in front of people is what, quite frankly, is likely to be more successful than a shorter campaign where people don't fully understand the choice. You know, Robert, there's, there's direct and indirect pressure when it comes to campaigns and, and having people drop out and trying to put pressure. Uh, you, you've been there. You've been there where you were on a winning campaign and there were very established names on the other side. Um, what are some of the ways sort of directly and indirectly they're going to put the pressure on Nikki Haley to, to sort of drop out of this race? We've already seen Ronald McDaniel come out with some strong language. We know former President Trump. He's already on Truth Social tonight. What else do you think we should expect to see? Well, I think you'll see that external pressure, as you just talked about, with members of the party. Some will do it overtly, like you've mentioned. Some will do it subtly. Somebody like a John Cornyn, Senator Cornyn from Texas, who had said he wasn't going to endorse in the primary endorses, uh, he's, that's sort of letting it be known to Nikki Haley where he is in this race, right? He's a, a, a member of the Senate Republican leadership. I, I think what you'll see quietly, and, and the real question is, can she maintain a fundraising and a donor base that allows her to continue this for another 31 days between now and, and when she gets to the vote in, in South Carolina? And, and that will be, quite frankly, maybe more telling than a congressional endorsement is, 
Does she have the ability to run a campaign in South Carolina that's capable of winning? She can run that race. She can be on the ballot. But if she doesn't have strong TV buys, if they're not investing in a field operation that can win the state, uh, then, quite frankly, she's just going through the motions. I, I think whether she's in this race in a week will be more telling than if she's in this race or that she said that she's in this race tonight. Uh, I got to interrupt you, Robert. Thank you. Um, we're going to go now to the Trump victory watch party in New Hampshire. We understand the former president, uh, surprisingly, is about to take the stage at any moment uh, pretty early. Uh, it's 920. We see him right there. He's walking the stage, taking his victory lap, going to soak some of this in. We can see the uh, MAGA hats are raised along with cell phones. The collection of American flags there and then some of his surrogates and his biggest uh, endorsers over the last couple of days and weeks, Vivek Ramaswamy right there, the entrepreneur, Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina. Uh, the president is, uh, is he by the podium? I can't see with all the cell phones. No, he's still, he's still doing, no, I think it looks like he's still doing his victory lap. Um, the interesting thing, as we mentioned about Senator Scott here, you know, Senator Scott ran against former President Trump. I asked him why he wanted to run. And, and he told me he was the right person at the time. And then interestingly enough, I, I haven't seen him have as much energy as since he's endorsed Trump and been on the stage with him and so excited to get behind him. Um, and you wonder what is sort of the, the calculation between a lot of these guys, these surrogates who are coming by and, and endorsing Trump now, how many of them are thinking about, man, possibly we, we, we have a chance to be a running mate here. The rest of the Trump team coming together here, we've seen Jason Miller, Dan Scavino, uh, others who have been in Trump circle for a long time. Of course, his son, Eric Trump, is right there. And uh, it sounds like uh, former President Trump at any moment will take the stage, but he's enjoying the song, taking a lot of pictures, and uh, we'll listen for a second. Thank you. Whoa. Well, I want to thank everybody. This is a fantastic state. This is a great, great state. You know, we won New Hampshire three times now. Three. Three. We win it every time. We win the primary. We win the Generals, we've won it, and it's a very, very special place to me. It's very important. If you remember, in 2016, we came here, and we needed that win, and we won by 21 points, and it was great. And uh, today, I have to tell you, it was very interesting because I said, wow, what a great victory. But then somebody ran up to the stage all dressed up nicely <laughs> when it was at 7. But now I just walked up, and it's at 14. She ran up when it was seven. And, you know, we have to do what's good for our party. And she was up and I said, wow, she's doing uh, like a speech like she won. She didn't win. She lost. And, you know, last last week we had a little bit of a problem. And if you remember, Ron was very upset because she ran up and she pretended she won Iowa. And I looked around, I said, didn't she come in third? Yeah, she came in third. And then I looked at the polls. She was talking about most winnability, who's going to win, and I had one put up. I don't know if you see it, but I have one put up. We've won almost every single poll in the last three months against Crooked Joe Biden, almost every poll. And she doesn't win those polls. And she doesn't win those. This is not your typical victory speech, but let's not have somebody take a victory when she had a very bad night. She had a very bad night. And you, uh, you have the, you have the very, the now very unpopular governor of this state. This guy, he's gotta be on something. I've never seen anybody with energy. 
He's like a uh, hopscotch. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm watching this guy, and two weeks ago he said, we're going to win, we're going to win in the last side, we're going to win. About three days ago he started saying, well, we want to do well. That's a big difference. But I walked out just now, we're 14 points up, and I don't know what it's going to be, but when she was up here, it was like six or seven, and, you know, with like 7% of the vote counted. Now, uh, let, let me just tell you, uh, we, uh, we had an unbelievable week last week in Iowa. We set a record. It was the best in the history of the caucus, in the history. And uh, I remember I sort of had the same feeling. I'm up and I'm watching, and I said, she's taking a victory lap. And we, we beat her so badly, she was, but Ron beat her also. You know, Ron came in second and he left. She came in third and she's still hanging around. The other thing, she only got 25% of the Republican votes. I don't know if you saw that. Tremendous numbers of independents came out because in this state, because you have a governor that doesn't frankly know what the hell he's doing, in this state, in the Republican primary, they accept Democrats to vote. In fact, I think they had 4,000 Democrats, Democrats before October 6th, they already voted. Now, they're only voting because they want to make me look as bad as possible. Because if you remember, we won in 2016. And if you really remember, and if you want to play it straight, we also won in 2020. <laughs> by more. And we did much better in 2020 than we did in 2016. But as they said, we lost by a whisker, just by a whisker. No, 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 but we can't let that happen. You know, you have to have people that speak up. I said, I can go up and I can say to everybody, oh, thank you for the victory, it's wonderful, it's what, or I can go up and say, who the hell was the imposter that went up on the stage before and like claimed a victory? She did very poorly, actually. She had to win. The governor said, she's gonna win, she's gonna win, she's gonna win. Then she, she failed badly. Now I have here, if he promises to do, to do it in a minute or less, but the only person more angry than, let's say me, but I don't get too angry, I get even. The only person, the only per because he was there, and he did fantastically well, by the way, and then he endorsed me, and we don't have to talk about Tim Scott, who, by the way, just got engaged, we have to tell you. And that's more important than all of this stuff. But a man that got to know her very well is Vivek. I said, Vivek. I said, Vivek. Go up and say a few words about it. He has to do it in one minute or less, and then we're gonna just say, we had one hell of a night tonight. And one other thing before Vivek comes, do you see that, Paul? We're gonna put it up. We have beaten Biden. You could almost say, who can't? Who the hell can't? The man can't put two sentences together. He can't find the stairs off a stage. Who can't? But Vivek, one minute or less. Go do it, Vivek. What we saw tonight is America first defeating America last. That's what we saw tonight. If you want America last, you can go to Joe Biden. You got another candidate still apparently in the Republican primary. Cut your social security to fork over more money to Ukraine so some kleptocrat can buy a bigger house. Go to Nikki Haley. But you know who delivered a double digit victory tonight? It is a double digit victory as of right now. Is this man, Donald J. Trump, the leader of America first. And that means something. Now. USA and Donald Trump, America first. Now, I got, I got 30 seconds left. I wanna make this point here, okay? We gotta say this, we gotta say this right. What we see right now with her continuing in this race is the ugly underbelly of American politics, where the mega donors are trying to do one thing when we the people say another. And it's up to us to we the people to at long last say hell no, we the people create a government that is accountable to us, and we the people have said tonight we want again, as we did in Iowa, Donald J. Trump. And so you wanna actually speak truth, 
That's the truth tonight. And the only thing well, they're rooting for is watching a portion of Donald Trump's uh, victory speech there in New Hampshire. Things took a little bit of a weird turn. He gave over the podium to Vivek Ramaswamy, who then proceeded to attack Nikki Haley and go after her pretty aggressively. A couple uh, quick fact checks here. Uh, the former president uh, said that he's won every single New Hampshire election he's been in, which is not true, uh, including general elections. He also said Nikki Haley doesn't beat Joe Biden in the polls. That That is also not true. Nikki Haley has, has beaten uh, the president in, in several polls. Um, I want to go to Tara right now. Tara, uh, you know, Vivek was just talking about the ugly side of politics. We were having a conversation talking about the viciousness and how bad it'll get. When will it start? Um, the former president took the stage and he pretty much the only thing he talked about was Nikki Haley attacking her over and over again. And I got to tell you, what stood out to me is Senator Tim Scott in the background, an elected senator from the state of South Carolina who was appointed by Nikki Haley, mm -hmm. sort of just smiling and going along with this. Um, is this what we can expect over the next month before South Carolina? Absolutely. And I mean, South Carolina has been an ugly place for politics and Republican politics before yep. Donald Trump. So imagine what is going to happen between now and then. Um, the fact that that Senator Tim Scott was there and just perfectly OK with the viciousness, I, again, speaks to the lack of character that, de that Senator Scott has demonstrated during this time of Donald Trump. And it's very disappointing. Um, he was asked very directly whether he was comfortable with Donald Trump's tone and he couldn't he, he made excuses for it, uh, including Donald Donald Trump saying that January 6th uh, prisoners uh, who were convicted are hostages. He was OK with that, too. So I'm not surprised that Senator Scott continues to debase himself. And for Vivek Ramaswamy to say anything about that, this is a guy who went after Nikki Haley's teenage daughter. So he has he has continued to lower the bar here um, when it comes to any type of, of integrity as well. So but this is par for the course. Yeah. This is what the Trump campaign represents. And this is what we are up against going into the general election. It's never going to change. Yeah. And anyone who thinks otherwise is um, it's living in a fantasy here. This oh, is what it is. Yeah. Hogan, does the former president you work with, does he need to do this? He, he, he even said, quote, I don't get angry, I get even. He literally <laughs> said that. Sure. He said the quiet part out loud. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> is it's going to get uglier than this? Oh, yeah. This yeah. is going to be the longest general election we've ever had in the history of this country. It's going to start pretty quickly here in the next several weeks. And these both camps, I'm sure you can speak to this too, this is going to be a ton of money spent and a ton of mud thrown all over the place between now and then. And look, I get he said he won New Hampshire. He didn't. That's different than someone like Joe Biden saying he was jailed with Nelson Mandela or that he started the civil rights movement. Both of those things can oh, come on. have... He says that. I mean, don't look at me. I mean, but I'm saying one of those has a, a significant weight. But I will say something he Donald Trump did mention about Nikki Haley. The four million dollar ad buy that was a sh for her to try and say, look, we're going to continue. Those things can be pulled down very easily. It's a campaign tactic. Yeah. Everyone knows that. But she made a point in her speech to say, now we're on to South Carolina where I can't be lied about. Basically, they know me best there. That's undercutting her own argument because she's down by 35 points. So if they know you best and you can't be lied about and you're down 35 points, it's going to be very difficult for her. Richard, uh, uh, Richard, we're getting formal here. Uh -huh. Rich Lowry, um, <laughs> you know, the Biden administration, the Biden reelect team has already put out a statement sort of saying that that Trump is a nominee and, and they're going to go after him. But but I have to ask you, is this moment important for Donald Trump? Because he he's sort of vilifying uh, the, the female rival in this race. He's going after her with a, a group of men on, on that stage. And I just wonder if that just sends the wrong image right now. He's up by double digits. Does he need to do this? Is it worth it? He, he won the New Hampshire primary by a, a, quite a comfortable margin. He's won Iowa and New Hampshire, and he got up and gave a speech where he literally described himself as angry. How does that make any sense? You know, and this is this is the bifurcated Trump you get. Sometimes you get him on teleprompter, which he had in Iowa. They wrote a nice speech for him. He was very friendly and and nice to everyone. Thanked people, which Hogan thought maybe would happen tonight, but but didn't. And and this was more his true. Feelings, right? He's agreed that this race is happening still. He's upset about it, and he and he can't and won't hide it. So you know, this isn't like a decisive moment in the campaign. But you know, you have people watching. Why not be gracious? Why not be optimistic? And then he's still going to go on Truth Social and Just say whatever. One wants. quick point on about that, though. Yeah. He's also right now currently um, in a court trial defamation lawsuit with E. Jean Carroll for the second time, where he was credibly accused of raping her and sexual assault. So Credibly the is idea, a debatable word, but okay. Well, okay, that the judge used the term raped her. So and that's so that's not debatable at this it point. It's true, a defamation. Though. It's a defamation trial. The judge said it. It's New York it must law. Be true then. But anyway, so it is. So I, the idea that you know he. 
he's going after the, the, the female candidate with men on the stage doesn't matter. He's been a misogynist his whole career. He doesn't care about those dynamics. David Pluff, uh, who joins us now, uh, you ran winning campaigns for former President Obama. Does a moment like this matter? Every moment a campaign matters. And you can't squander a one. So Trump's unconventional. You know, my view is he probably watched every word Nikki Haley said, and it got him really upset. What he should have done is thank the voters of New Hampshire, thank the voters of Iowa, and said the general election has started, and mm -hmm. ignore Nikki Haley. All this right. is like first grade political practice. Right. Mm -hmm. He didn't do that. Now the question is he may start doing that later tonight or tomorrow, um, but that, I think there was a huge opportunity missed. Now, you know, at the end of the day, the one thing I'd say about both Iowa and New Hampshire is Biden won in part, not solely, in part because he did well enough, not just with Republican voters, but independents who were basically Republicans. And there's now okay, a David, bigger on, pool. Speak, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry to, to interrupt you, but, but Trump's picked up again. Let's, let's listen okay. in. Oh. <laughs> Not big reasons. A little stuff that she doesn't want to talk about. But she will be under investigation within minutes. And so would Ron have been. But he decided to get out. He decided to get out. Now, Vivek, I don't think, would be at all because he's perfect, right? <laughs> Tim Scott, I know, would never. That's no chance. Hey, Tim, do you want to say something? Come on. Come on. I want him to say something. New Hampshire. The president said a double-digit win in New Hampshire, and you delivered a double-digit win for President Trump. But I'm going to invite you to my home state starting tomorrow where this election is over. It is time for the Republican Party to coalesce around our nominee and the next president of the United States, Donald Trump. Let's get that party started tonight. What a good guy. What a good man he is. But just remember, I, I did hear Nikki say, and now it's off to South Carolina. Well, I love South Carolina. I, I love it. But, you know, she forgot one thing. She forgot one thing. Next week, it's Nevada. Next week, it's Nevada. It's not South Carolina. We love South Carolina, but next week, it's Nevada. And I'm pleased to announce we just won Nevada. We just won 100%. Because all of them, they looked at it and they took polls and I was polling at 95% to 4 or 5%. And they decided not to play in Nevada. So we just won Nevada. We have a man from uh, Nevada here, Steve Wynn, wherever he may be. And John Paulson, the great John Paulson, made plenty of money in Nevada. Doesn't live there, but he makes a hell of a lot of money. He makes money everywhere he goes, actually. So money machine. Well, maybe we'll put you, you know what? Put him at Treasury. You want to make a little money? Let's put you... <laughs> Anyways, good. Good to have you guys. Uh, but we go to Nevada, and that's been won. So we pick up all of those delegates. And then we do go to South Carolina, where we've done really well, where I've done well. We have a great governor and lieutenant governor and great everything, because almost every one of them have endorsed me. Two great senators, which is hard. I mean, did you ever think that she actually appointed you, Tim? <laughs> and think of it, appointed, and you're the senator of his state, and she endorsed me. You must really hate her. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's a shame. It's I, a shame. Uh-oh. Uh I just love you. No, that's, <laughs> that's why he's a great politician. That's why he's a great politician. So this is a great evening, and it is, you know, we are going to Nevada for a little while. We're not going to have to do too much. We have a great team there, but it's a team that uh, we can now send someplace else. They did a fantastic job, but uh, we, and it's a fantastic place, really a fantastic place. But we'll be leaving there very quickly. We'll head out to South Carolina, where I think we're going to win easily. I think we're 50 points up, 5-0. 5, -0. Five -0, 50 points up on a person that was governor. That tells you something. But I felt I should do this because I find in life you can't let people get away with bullshit, okay? You can't. You just can't do that. And when I watched her in the fancy dress that probably wasn't so fancy come up, I said, what's she doing? We won. And she did the same thing last week 
But he was much more angry about it than I was. I said, get up there and you let him know. We are going to win this. We have no choice. If we don't win, I think our country is finished. I do. I believe our country is finished. We have an opportunity to do something so amazing. And the good news and the reason we have such support, the best numbers I've ever had, the reason we have support is because they are so bad at what they're doing and so evil. And they're destroying our country. So I want to thank... I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to we, thank We've this just been listening to, to, to former President Trump. I, I wanted to come back to our panel. Hogan Gidley uh, worked for former President Trump. Um, Hogan, why, why is he so angry? He just <laughs> won by double digits. I, I'm, I'm confused. I think some of the concern that Donald Trump has is shared by many on the campaign, which is they're ready to go ahead and start focusing all their fire all their money, all their resources on Joe Biden. And every minute that Nikki Haley stays in this race, it prevents that from happening. And with lawsuits looming, as we talked about, Tara, you know, the money's gonna be spent in a lot of different ways. He doesn't wanna spend more time, effort, energy worried about Nikki. He wants to focus on the general Wait, election. Wait, why? He's up by 35 points against her. Ignore her. If she doesn't, if she's no threat to him at all, and she's delusional, which we've all said that it's really a fait accompli that he's going to be the nominee. He can decide to start the general election right now. And he has talked this about not the, the election in general terms for in the general election terms for a, a while now. But tonight, I think watching Nikki Haley deciding to stay in this race because he probably can't got him a little. the fact that the woman in the race did not concede and bow down the way Tim Scott and Vivek and the rest of them um, have done for him, and he cannot stand it. It's not in his the fiber of his being can't stand the fact that she hasn't bowed the knee yet. Rich, uh, cynical people watch politics uh, since 2016. They'll say nothing matters, right? Because they've just seen that <laughs> literally nothing mattered in 2016. Um, but, but I do want to ask you about something. I mean, he, he attacked her dress, yeah. right? And there's also the question of temperament again, right? And then yeah. you're almost reminded of, of how former President Trump can get when he's upset about something. No, of course. Um, he, you, I, you think a moment like this matters and he, and he needs to be careful. Well, it's not he, decisive, yeah. but, you know, as David said, it, it's going to be a close race. Every moment matters potentially. But he talked about her giving an early speech more than he mentioned Joe Biden. And you're absolutely right. He, he has a big megaphone. He can turn the attention to Biden entirely, but he is so personally uh, offended by this, he couldn't let it go. And one, an unappreciated aspect of his primary campaign, maybe he's going to win anyway, he has a good team, a smart team, a shrewd team that he's listened to. A disciplined team. A right. disciplined team. And there's no way they told him to do that. No way. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. 100%. Um, Garrett Haig joins us tonight from Nashville, New Hampshire. He's been covering the Trump, Trump campaign for us. Uh, Garrett, get us up to speed here. Give us your first reactions to that speech. Well, Tom, I was stunned at how different that speech was from the speech that he gave in Iowa, where Donald Trump walked out of the stage and started talking about unity and tried to be magnanimous and joking about yeah. the field, clearly looking ahead to the general election. That Donald Trump was nowhere to be found tonight. I mean, within minutes of taking the stage, he was suggesting Chris Sununu, the governor of New Hampshire, was on drugs and lying about winning New Hampshire in the general election in 2020. I mean, it's unbelievable reversion to the mean here, reversion to Santos. rally Donald Trump as opposed to general election Donald Trump and for a, probably a pretty significant national audience tuning in tonight to watch the results of a big contested primary um, that's a, a frankly probably a gift for the Biden administration for the Biden campaign to see that version of Donald Trump tonight not the Iowa version of Donald Trump but I caught just the tail end of your conversation there with Tara about the idea of why doesn't Donald Trump just ignore her and wait for Nikki Haley to go away to basically run out of money and lose this race I've been asking that question all week to Trump advisors and the answer that they gave me was abundantly clear on stage tonight it's because Donald Trump cannot do that he only has one speed when it comes to perceived enemies and that is to attack 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 and so even if it gives Nikki Haley more life by continuing to draw attention back to her campaign which might struggle to get it when they're not functionally competing in Nevada when there are no debates he's going to keep attacking her because it's the only way he knows how to run a campaign whether his advisors want it to be that way or not they know they can't stop it and that's what uh, voters and viewers across the country are gonna get in moments like this Garrett Haig, first Garrett, we appreciate that. I want to go to David Pluff now. Uh, David, you know, he, he had maybe not even a good night, a great night, because he, he did well in New Hampshire with Republican voters. He did well with independents as well. And then he came out and he had this moment, this speech. Do you think the Biden campaign is sitting back watching this going, 
this is what we want, this is perfect, this is the guy we want to run against. Sure, but Trump may not give that to you every night. But yeah, if this is going to be his M.O., and again, you're squandering time. I mean, Trump should have called the general election starting today. The Biden folks, I think, have. So it was an awful speech. I mean, the only thing worse than the awful makeup he had tonight, which, by the way, is getting worse and worse, uh, was that speech. Now, again, is it going to swing 10 or 20,000 votes in Wisconsin? No. But independent voters, Republican voters, and this is the thing. Okay, he won New Hampshire convincingly. But over 40% of people in New Hampshire, almost 50% in Iowa, chose somebody else. Okay? And he's the dominant frontrunner. And politics, uh, to some extent, is about math. And it's about data and modeling. And this is going to give the Biden campaign a great, rich, huge number of Republican and Republican-leaning independents to target more than they did in 20. Most of those people will go home to Donald Trump, but Joe Biden doesn't need all of them. And this kind of performance just reminds people, I don't want to go back to that. He actually had a, he had a chance tonight, I think, not just to kick off the general election, but, you know, similar to what he did in Iowa, kind of have a big moment, which is I'm focused on that. But I just don't think he's able to do that. I mean, he's enraged at Nikki Haley. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the, but he should, in my view, as a political, he shouldn't go to South Carolina at all. Maybe one trip, that's it. He should go to Wisconsin, mm -hmm. he should go to Arizona, he should go to Georgia, and I don't think he's gonna do that. Chuck, did he just give a gift to Nikki Haley? Well, it's interesting, he could. It could sort of get her to dig in, right? You know, sort of at this point, and he does have a way of sort of almost encouraging his opponents to keep fighting and to keep coming back. And I think ultimately, this is what none of us have the answer to, because none of us are Nikki Haley. What does she want? Where does she want in the two years? We know Ron DeSantis, Tim Scott, Vivek Ramaswamy all yeah. have their own ambition. They decided they want a future in Trump's Republican Party. Nikki Haley has to ask herself, is there a future for Nikki Haley in Trump's Republican Party? Or does she try to go down sort of what the, the calculation Ted Cruz made in 16? Then, of course, after Trump won, he sort of caved in, right? But he was going to he was assuming Trump's going to lose. I'll be the one to be able to stood there. There's an opportunity for Nikki Haley to be the lone person that kept trying to fight. If he does lose, it's a lonely place to be. It'll be a very, but I go back to none of us know what does she want. She'll never be the running mate. And I think if she makes that calculation, that's an incentive in her own mind to stay in and maybe try to build a case for a new Republican Party. But that to me is the only reason to stay in that she, she wants to essentially pick up the pieces if she believes Trump's going to blow this. Rich Lowry. So I was just going to say that the most, that speech uh, um, made me think, you know, the, the most favorable Nikki Haley scenario would be to win New Hampshire, obviously. And then imagine what that speech would have been if he lost, right? If he's angry, yeah. if he won, yeah. <laughs> how outraged is he going to be the loss? And you know what he immediately do? Say he was cheated out of it. It was rigged. And then maybe something shakes loose. I probably, it probably wouldn't. But then you might have Republicans, wait a minute, this is our process, but... Probably wouldn't have happened, but that, that would have been the, the most favorable possible scenario for her. Terrible. Listen, the, speeches like this, when Trump behaves like this, it reminds people um, at the Lincoln Project, we call them Bannon line voters, because those are the voters that Steve Bannon said in 2016, the four to seven percent of Republicans or moderates that um, if, the, if, if Trump loses them, then he'll lose the election. We believe that that Bannon line has expanded to seven to 12 percent because of Dobbs, um, mainly, and because of temperament and, the, and, and people looking at this going, we don't want another four years of this. So every time Donald Donald Trump does this. I believe that that Bannon line, that that expands in places to David's point, like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Arizona. Um, this doesn't help them. This For the general election, this is what people are reminded of when they're going to the ballot box and they say, well, you know, Joe Biden may be a little old, but uh, but Donald Trump is old too, and this is how he behaves. Yeah, what, we do not want an America that looks like that. What's going to lead the morning like shows? Trump's victories? Yeah. That's or the, right. This is what's going to lead the morning Hogan, you've been in the rooms. You, 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 you've seen <laughs> yes. him when, he, when he's not been happy. You've seen him yes. when after moments like this, <laughs> will anybody at, in the campaign, anybody in his circle, tell him, hey, boss, that was a mistake? I think there are plenty of times that we're honest with Donald Trump about how we feel about certain things, and that happens quite, quite honestly <laughs> often. Um, sometimes that's good. Sometimes we have different opinions than the former president. But the fact is, while we're making a big deal of it here, we're on to South Carolina now, and I don't know how much this is actually going to matter to a voter in this moment because this speech isn't going to be played in oh, totality. Oh, the primary now, doesn't I'm, matter. Right, we're talking now, general. Right, but I'm saying, as David pointed out, this isn't going to be Donald Trump every day. 
So the question becomes, how does he keep that MAGA base, which he obviously has, and I think this doesn't do anything to change that, how does he expand and get some of those independents? And I would argue at this point, things like this don't matter all that much. I know people on, on this panel and people on other networks are going to make hay of it, and I understand why they would. But I don't know to the average voter out there who's trying to make ends meet, um, who has crime spiking in their, their neighborhoods or, or people pouring into their neighborhoods illegally and unlawfully from other countries, are going to be too concerned about his rhetoric at this speech. But, but you don't think it's a reminder? Policies. I mean, you don't think it's a reminder? It's a reminder uh, of, of Donald Trump. Uh, and, and how his personality can be. But I think a lot of people are more concerned about policy at this point. But that's the argument. That's going to be the campaign. They're going to try and, on the other side, they're going to say, look at this man. We're going to say, look at Joe Biden. And that's going to be it. Here's something I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. He lost in 2020. And when you're trying to come back, anytime a losing candidate wants to come back and win over voters, they usually admit, here's what I'm going to do different. You know, I hear you. I heard you. I'm going to do this differently. What's he going to say? Is he going to say different? Is he going to say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to, what he's saying is, boy, I'm not going to bring in establishment people. Like what he's talking about differently, he is not promising that it'll be, you know, a little more organized, a little less chaotic. And I, th look, this no, goes to the whole deplatforming. By the way, this God. is the whole deplatforming. He told us The mistake of deplatforming, in all honesty. But, but, because yeah, when he's yeah. platformed, people get uncomfortable. David, the counter argument here, though, is that with, with the wrong track through the roof for President Biden, and voters on the Democratic side, Republican voters, independents, all concerned about his age. You, you may also want a candidate that projects strength, right? A candidate that projects energy. Obviously, maybe not exactly like this, but that's something former President Trump is going to be thinking about as well. Well, it's one reason that people think that Trump is a lot younger than he is. He's got that sort of almost feral quality. Uh, but, you know, there's a fine line between that and chaos. And this election, I think, will be decided on. There could be foreign policy event, even beyond what we're already living through, could be an economic shock. But it's going to be a, a swath of voters basically saying, can I swallow another four years of Trump? And I think that's going to be less about policy, uh, as important as that is, and more about this. And, and if, to Chuck's point, if you it looks like... You think it'll be more about this than, say, the economy? The economy is important. Yeah. Uh, Dobbs and abortion are going to be important. Democracy is important. Immigration is important. I'm just saying these are two universally known figures. And basically, that's the question, which is Biden uh, is obviously a flawed candidate right now compared to where you'd like to see. I think the race is going to look different in two or three months as people really zero in. But Trump is going to be the major figure in this election, quite frankly. And are people saying who voted against him last time come home, say, I want more of that. That's right. And that's where I think it's interesting to me because Trump needs to be in the growth business as any company does. You're not satisfied with your market share. And that's the one thing that's always puzzled me. He doesn't seem that interested in that. And tonight was an opportunity to signal, hey, even if he doesn't apologize for things he did say, I get, and this is about immigration, it's about the economy. So to me, the question will be, maybe he does that tomorrow. Maybe he, maybe, but we'll see at the end of the day. But I think that's what this election comes down to. Uh, and the other thing is, he does have an advantage, I think, on turnout. The one thing I'd say is a lot of Republicans are voting against him. Most of those people vote for him. Most of those people would vote for him. But that's where I think Biden's got the biggest issue is right now you'd give Trump an advantage, I think, on the turnout question. Right, energize and, him. Right. Yeah. All right, Dave, we appreciate that. I want to go back to Garrett Hick. He's actually speaking to some Trump voters from that victory watch party. Garrett. Tom, I'm trying to capture a little bit of the enthusiasm that we saw at this party, and I want to bring in Bridget Trepsis. She's from Salem, New Hampshire. She's a big Trump fan. Were you at all surprised by the result today? No. It was a no-brainer. I knew he was going to win. I did a lot of praying, too, but still, I knew he was going to win. What do you make of what we saw today? The former president came as close as he possibly could to saying that this race should just be over now, that it is effectively over. Do you agree with that? Why shouldn't everybody else in the country get the chance New Hampshire got to have a vote? I'm with you. You're right. They should all get a chance to have a vote. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what do you make of the, the manner in which he kind of started talking today about this race? He, was, he seemed to be more interested in talking about Nikki Haley than he was about Joe Biden. What do you make of that? Well, you know, when, when, we talk, when he talks to the people out there, it's like he's zeroing on me. It's like he's talking to me. And I feel like everybody feels that way. Like, he talks to the people, you know, he's just, I can't explain it, but he's, huh. I'm, I'm crazy about the guy. How do, you, how do you convince your friends and neighbors, the people you know who might have voted for Nikki Haley or might have voted for Donald Trump in 2016 or 2020, who are 
very skeptical about kind of getting back on the Trump train. What do you say to them to convince them that this is the way to go? Well, you know what it is? They don't know the facts. They listen to the fake news out there, you know. I know you're in the news, but they listen to the fake news, and that's what they're going by. They don't know the real, what's really going on. Humor me, what are the, what are the fake facts? The, the, the... Try me, try me, seriously. What are the, like, like they, uh, that, that he's going to be a dictator, he's going to be this, he's going to be, you know, it's all, it's all a lot of baloney. He's, he's going to take care of this country. Look where we are today and where we were four, four years ago. What does taking care of this country look like? Is there some specific issue where you feel like this guy gets it and nobody else does? Well, taking care of this country, people like, can go to the grocery store and uh, prices, gas was what, $1.87? Who is looking at today? We're, you know, a lot of people are really suffering. We're, we're hurting. We don't. They don't have the money. They're going out looking for three jobs. Never mind two. You know? Prices are going back down. The economy. All the, all the economic numbers are kind of going in Joe Biden's direction right now. If the economy improves substantially before November, does any of that change your view about where we are as a country? No, it's not. Biden's not the one improving it. It'll be Trump that's going to improve it. Even, okay, all right, we'll set that aside for now. I want to ask you, because there's so much conversation about uh, Donald Trump's legal challenges, right? He's, getting, he's supposed to be in court later this week, the defamation case, classified documents, the stolen election stuff. What do you make of all of that? It's all crap. All crap. Not one of those things is true. I don't believe any of that's true. He's I found don't. liable for defamation, yeah. for sexual yeah, look, assault. You don't believe look, any of it. Look who's trying them. Look at the judge in there. Hello, anybody home? So... What happens? Can only what Republican juries and Republican judges Nothing. hold him accountable? It's, it's. I don't think he's being treated fairly. It, you know, it's not right. If, we, if it was you in there, they wouldn't be treating you like they're treating him. I mean, I hear that from Trump supporters all the time. If he gets convicted of something, if he gets convicted of mishandling classified documents, or if he gets convicted of trying to overturn the 2020 election results, does any of that change your mind? No. Look at, look at Hunter, what's happening to Hunter Biden? What about the laptop? What's Hunter all Biden is not, not running for president. But still, they're not, they're not doing nothing to him. No. Um, so, talk to me about what you expect to see in the fall. I mean, this could be one of the longest, ugliest general election campaigns that anybody remembers. Is that going to be good for the country to have these two guys going at it for the next uh, 200 some odd days? You know what? I feel it's going to be worth the wait because he's going to get in. Okay. Let me ask you a couple more questions here and then I'll let you go because they're looking about lock us in this ballroom here. The question's about Donald Trump's age. We've heard about Joe Biden's age for a long time. Nikki Haley started to raise questions about Donald Trump's age, suggesting he's not mentally with it. He's pushing 80. He would be into his 80s if he gets another term. How does that, how do you feel about that? Does that concern you at all? Donald's my age, and it's only a number. It's, what, it's, it's what's up here, and he, he looks right. pretty damn good to me. All right, Bridget. Well, if you want to run for president, we should talk. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for chatting with us. And I'm going to let you go now. I'm going to turn this back to Tom. Tom, I think I think that is... Where can I see this? Well, you can watch it right now. Hang on, let me finish it up. But Tom, listen, this is so emblematic of the Trump supporters I've been talking to across this state. I mean, certainly, certain of these things are just taken as articles of faith. The, uh, the investigations aren't real. The court cases are not real. The devotion here is something that's unmatched by any political candidate I've ever covered. Whether there's enough of them to matter in a general election, whole other question. But you cannot uh, question the commitment that these supporters have for Donald Trump yeah, in a state like this. The loyalty and the dedication is there. Garrett, we appreciate all your reporting tonight. Chuck Todd, back with me here. Chuck, walk us through the, the calendar and yeah. what Nikki Haley is going to be up against over the next few weeks and months. Well, look, here it is. We're at New Hampshire right now, right. January 23rd. 16 days later is that thing that Trump was describing where he's the only one that actually is trying to get the delegates. A explain that real quick if you can. Sure, Basically, if you can. And look, they created a caucus and a primary and the party's running the caucus and they said if you register in the primary, you can't be on the caucus ballot. And anyway. And so, and he's it, saying he took a win the caucus. Gotcha. This is why he can't be stopped from the nomination. Right. But then look, you got to go another two weeks before you get to South Carolina on February 24th. Yep. Right. So you get that. Then to me, this is where I think if there is going to be another state where Donald Trump yeah. could have problems, it is Michigan. They have the same rules yeah. um, as New Hampshire. South Carolina does too, but the, there is going to be a South Carolina Democratic primary that takes place before this, which will take potential voters away that Haley could have wooed right. in that primary. And then after that, you hit Super Tuesday. And then after they hit Super Tuesday. So, you know, ultimately, 
I personally, obviously, South Carolina is probably her Waterloo, but Michigan is is sort of the the last gasp. We quick prediction. We got about twenty seconds before we, the top of the hour. You think she makes it to South Carolina, or do you think in the next four weeks we something happens? Ron DeSantis said he was going to go on, talked with some donors, and within ninety six hours was out of the race. I think. Uh, let's see what the next 72 hours are like, but I have a feeling yeah. that'll matter. Chuck Todd, we thank you for that. And that does it for me at this hour. But NBC News Now special coverage of the 2024 New Hampshire primary continues with my good friend Kristen Welker right now. This is it. This is an NBC News special. Decision 2024, the New Hampshire primary. Welcome to NBC tonight, News Kristen special, Welker. Welcome to NBC News special coverage of the 2024 New Hampshire presidential primary. I am Kristen Welker in New York on an historic night for Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump. NBC News projects the former president has won the first in the nation primary. He defeated former South Carolina governor Nikki Haley, the only other major candidate left in the race and by a very comfortable margin. Mr. Trump's victory tonight puts him in a dominant and unprecedented position. He is now the first non-incumbent Republican presidential candidate ever to win the first two nominating contests. The former president addressed supporters tonight with his former rivals on stage with him delivering a grievance-filled diatribe, vowing retribution while repeating false claims about the election and lashing out at Haley, President Biden, and Democrats. The only person more angry than, let's say me, but I don't get too angry, I get even. We have beaten Biden. You could almost say, who can't? Who the hell can't? The man can't put two sentences together. We had COVID and they use COVID to cheat and you say, are they stupid people? I don't think so because nobody can cheat that well if they're stupid. Do they hate our country? They must hate our country. They are so bad at what they're doing and so evil and they're destroying our country. Just a little note to Nikki. She's not going to win. She's not going to win. Well, the result leaves Nikki Haley facing major questions about the viability of her campaign after coming up short in a contest where undeclared voters and Trump skeptics made up an outsized share of the Republican primary electorate. But in her speech tonight, she vowed to soldier on. You've all heard the chatter among the political class. They're falling all over themselves saying this race is over. Well, I have news for all of them. Woo! New Hampshire is first in the nation. It is not the last in the nation. A defiant Nikki Haley there. Well, on the Democratic side, NBC News projects President Biden has won his party's New Hampshire primary despite not even being on the ballot. His supporters organized a writing campaign, avoiding a potentially embarrassing loss to Democratic Congressman Dean Phillips, even though no delegates were at stake tonight in that race. We have got it all covered tonight. NBC's Garrett Hake is at Trump headquarters in Nashua. NBC's Ali Vitale is at Haley headquarters in Concord. And NBC's Hallie Jackson is talking to voters in Manchester. Here in the studio, NBC News chief political analyst Chuck Todd will be at the big board all night to take us inside the results. So let's dive in. Garrett Hake, I want to start with you. Take us inside the Trump campaign. Clearly, we heard former President Trump trying to pressure Nikki Haley to get out of this race. And I know you've been talking to his supporters all night long. What's the scene there, Garrett? Yeah, I mean, let me kind of split this a little bit because the Trump campaign got exactly the result they expected here tonight. They think when all the voting, uh, the counting is done, he'll end up winning this state by somewhere between 12 and 15 points. They are very pleased with the results. They think that keeps them very much on track to lock up this nomination by mid-March, if not sooner. The candidate, on the other hand, seems deeply bothered by Nikki Haley and the way she closed out this campaign and the way she spoke on stage here tonight. You saw it in his post on his Truth So 
social uh, account calling her delusional at the sort of way she uh, tried to turn a second place finish into a, a win or at least some momentum to keep going. And you saw him come out and give a completely different style of speech here tonight than he did when he won Iowa a little more than a week ago. Gone was the magnanimous tone. Gone was the, you know, kind of appeals to unity. And back was rally Trump attacking his perceived enemies, suggesting Chris Sununu, the governor who supported Nikki Haley, was on drugs, suggesting falsely, saying falsely that he won New Hampshire in 2020 in a state he lost by some 60,000 votes. This is the Donald Trump who those of us who cover him are familiar with seeing on the campaign trail. And I think it's the Donald Trump who we're going to see going into the general election, whether his campaign feels as if it's good strategy or not. For the supporters in the room, hugely effective. They ate it up. They are not necessarily the audience going forward. And we'll see if that tug of war between Donald Trump's campaign, who wants him to compete and win in a general election, and Donald Trump, who has only one speed when it comes to attacking perceived opponents, if that tension gets ironed out in the next couple of weeks with or without Nikki Haley continuing, Kristen. It's great analysis, Garen. Just very quickly before I move on, talk about how you expect him to straddle that line between clearly trying to keep up the pressure on Nikki Haley and turning his sights to the general election. He has not won the nomination yet. But President Biden is shifting into a much higher gear. Yeah, and you saw him eventually turn to Joe Biden, you know, about, I don't know, a third to halfway through this speech tonight, almost as an afterthought, remembering that that's the ultimate target here. I think this is one of those things where you will see that tension, perhaps, between the candidate and the campaign. Donald Trump has only one speed. As long as Nikki Haley's in this race, he's going to attack her. There's very little likelihood that he'll be able to simply ignore her, try to wait for her fundraising and the attention to dry up and for her to get out of this race. He's going to attack her. He's going to try to isolate her. And he's going to be focused focused on winning the Republican primary kind of in an aggressive way as opposed to just sort of waiting it for it to end in its natural course. The party wants him to focus on Joe Biden. We'll, we will watch that tug of war, I think, in real time for his attention, Kristen, in the days and weeks ahead. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that. All right, Garrett Hake, thanks so much for your marathon day and night and fantastic reporting. We really appreciate it. Ali Vitali joins us now from Nikki Haley's headquarters in Concord, New Hampshire. So, Ali, look, I've been talking to my sources inside the Haley campaign. They are bullish as well. They insist there is still a path. But let's be realistic here. Part of what they were hoping hoping for tonight and part of the expectations game was that they were hoping she could keep any loss to within single digits and that just hasn't been the case this must be if you really are having realistic conversations with these folks a setback yeah, of course, and I think that's why we saw them come out tonight, Kristen, at the point that they did when polls were much closer than anyone expected, much closer than anyone anticipated, and that's the best time for Nikki Haley to come out and rally the crowd of supporters that was once in this ballroom behind me. They are more than aware of the reality of this race, the fact that it's going to be almost impossible to say you have a shot at the nomination if you haven't won a state outright. They are arguing for states coming way down the pipeline places like Michigan or Texas, anywhere that has an open or semi-open primary system that's akin to what we saw in New Hampshire. They are arguing that with more time, the momentum will build in those places. But we know that even a month to South Carolina is an eternity. Nevertheless, her message tonight was bullish. It sounded like this. Watch. Yeah. No, I'm doing great. Yeah. At one point in this campaign, there were 14 of us running. And we were at 2% in the polls. Well, I'm a fighter. And I'm scrappy. And now we're the last one standing next to Donald Trump. And you know what? It's going to be essential to be scrappy and a fighter because Garrett laid this out. You and I have both covered Trump and we know it to be true. He is not going to make this easy. That speech that we saw him give there tonight was 
almost the beginning of what I imagine is a scorched earth campaign against his former U.N. ambassador. They're going to South Carolina. She likes to argue that it's her sweet home state, but it has changed a lot demographically since she was last on the ballot there in 2014. Yes, she won it two times as governor, but I was there on the ground in 2016 when Trump swept the counties in South Carolina and really solidified the fact that he was remaking the Republican Party in real time, doing away with the Jeb Bushes and Marco Rubio's of that 2016 cycle. Now Haley returning to that same state over a month of just over a month from now. And that is an eternity. She's going to have to make the case to her donors that they can get her over that time period. Well, and I think you touch on the critical point, which is her donors. She's got to convince them to stay with her. Yeah. A defeat in South Carolina, absolutely devastating for any future political aspirations she may have. Ali Vitale, thank absolutely. you so much. Fantastic as always. NBC News Now senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson is on the ground in Manchester where she's been talking to voters all night long at a watch party. Hallie, you got the fun location tonight, I have to say, my friend. I just... <laughs> Can I tell you, Walker, my, my dear, I just looked around and realized everybody left. That's It's just because this is where I'm standing. They didn't leave. Everybody's still here at this bar. They've been watching returns come in. There are a lot of supporters of former President Trump here. We talked to a couple of supporters of Nikki Haley as well. But I want to take you to somebody who knows this state about as, as well as anybody, of course, the New Hampshire uh, Republican chair, Chris Ager. Chris, how are you feeling tonight? Give us a sense of where your head's at. I feel pretty good. It looks like we may have record turnout on the Republican side, which is always good. You know, the more we can hear from people and get a broad spectrum of the voters' views, I think the better politicians can serve them. So having our primary the way we do and the participation, I think is a really good thing. Where do you think this race goes from here, Chris? Well, I think the Haley campaign has to reassess, you know, their chances of winning. New Hampshire is a very friendly state for somebody like Nikki Haley. And with our undeclares able to vote and our more moderate kind of electorate, it, it was kind of teed up for her to do well. You know, she could connect with voters. Looks like she's going to be down 10 points. So you go, boy, are you going to be able to make that up in other states? And, you know, it's up to her campaign to assess that. But if you, if you don't think you can win, you should probably drop out and, st and not prolong the pain. But if she thinks she can win, she owes it to continue on. Where are you on this spectrum between Nikki Haley suggesting this is not a coronation, that she should have the opportunity to compete maybe even into Super Tuesday in some of those states, versus the message that we're hearing from, for example, the chair of the Republican National Committee saying that if Donald Trump has a strong showing tonight, it says something about party unity and people coming together behind former President Trump. What say you? Well, obviously it was not a coronation. There was a competition in Iowa, competition in New Hampshire, and if Nikki Haley wants to continue on, she has every right to do that. Hey, power to her. But if you're looking at winning in November and one side has no primary, they're saving their money, energy, and they're focusing on us, and we're battling, that, that puts us at a disadvantage. So looking at the health of the party, if she thinks she can win, by all means, continue. But if you don't think you can win, why waste everybody's time? Chris, thank you so much. I imagine there's a party that's a little relieved that the, the hard stuff for you is over at this point. Well, we also won two special elections at our local legislature. New Hampshire is a red state, governor, state house, and we also flipped the mayor and board of aldermen in Manchester. So we're trending the right way in New Hampshire, and we won two more seats tonight. So great night for Republicans. Chris, thank you so much for chatting with us. It's really good to see you. Thank I you. appreciate it. I'm going to take you back this way a little bit as we talk for one more second, Kristen, because... What we have seen tonight, right, this question of what is the ultimate margin, et cetera, it's the question of where does this race go? I think you heard it a little bit from Chris there. And this moment of what's going to be potentially reckoning for the Nikki Haley campaign eventually uh, at some point. But in the meantime, we've also got folks who are out here who are very much backing former President Donald Trump. I'm going to introduce you to members of a semi-pro hockey team, right, from here in Manchester, New Hampshire, yes. with a connection to this bar. This is Benny. Um, and you went out and cast your ballot today, right? I did, yes. Who would you vote for? I voted for Mr. Trump. Tell me why. I support him, and I like the way he supports small businesses like the GOAT. Support the GOAT, the GOAT hockey team. That's the bar we're at, just yes. so you know. Yep. And Mr. G's Pizza as well. Local businesses. Uh, yes. He obviously is projected to win tonight. Um, yes. Give me your sense, reaction to that. Do you think that Nikki Haley should be able to continue with her campaign? Did you entertain her as a candidate at all? I feel, uh, personally, she's kind of doing it as kind of a vice kind of 
bid for her. So good for her. Yes, exactly. Uh, so good for her. If she wants to keep that going, she did get a lot of votes. Uh, obviously, I'm a Trump guy, but good for her, I say. Would you like to see her stay in the race or get behind the former president? Uh, probably the, the latter. I'd like to see her get behind Trump, but I can do whatever she can do whatever she wants so ben, thank you very much i appreciate it thank thanks you. for chatting with us so that listen that's the lay of the land here Kristen. um we are headed next i think as a lot of people are i know ali would south carolina because that is the state that nikki haley has her eye on here obviously a reminder nevada happens between that right like that state is going to go she you know it's, it's former president trump competing there um so listen here we are right democracy in action hi, hi. as we uh, i'm good did you vote today i did not but i was okay. gonna all right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, democracy in action for a lot of people here in New Hampshire. Uh, and we will see how the, how the rest of the night unfolds, Kristen. Hallie, it's so fascinating uh, to hear from the folks there, in part because it really fleshes out the idea that there is going to be pressure on Nikki Haley at this point. It, it, that was clear based on both of those great interviews you just did. Hallie Jackson, thank you so much. I do appreciate it. I hope you can have a little bit of fun there at that bar. I now want to turn to our friend Chuck Todd, who's standing by at the big board to break down everything that happened. Chuck, I want to talk about the margin, but first, yeah. can we talk about who turned out right. and, and why Haley didn't pull off the comeback she was hoping to? Well, it's this math right here is pretty simple. Um, this is the most updated exit poll. We incorporate actual results. So this is a, a, a weighted exit poll based on the results themselves. As you can see, it was it turned out to be a majority Republican. As we started the night, and why I think Donald Trump was in such a bad mood is when the night began, mm. the combination of Democrat and Independent was not at 49. It was sitting at 53. Mm. And if it had been 53, that would have been a big difference, because let me show you here. So Donald Trump won Republicans with a whopping 74% of the vote. Nikki Haley got 25% of the vote. Among independents, which was her big number, the good news for her is she won them big, but not by enough. She got 60. Look at this. Donald Trump got 38% of independents. Nikki Haley only got 25%. So, okay. It's, you know, this is basically basic algebra. There were more Republicans than independents and Democrats. Donald Trump got more Republicans, which was the bigger group, and he got more independents than Haley got Republicans. Mm. That's why we're staring at this double digit deficit here. But I'll show you a few other ways to look at how uh, each of them were able to put this, uh, what the key groups were for each of them. So here's Donald Trump. He dominated basically with the version of the party he's created. We told you this last week with Iowa. Very conservative voters. This is actually new for him. He never carried very conservative in 2016. He wasn't viewed as a conservative, but he's redefined the word. Whatever he says is, con is the conservative position, and therefore his voters see it. So that is a number there. We told you already 74% of Republicans. Here's the working class base, those uh, with an in family income under 50 dominated those two to one and those with no college degree the Nikki Haley and it's important to take a look at this Nikki Haley voting group because there's another way to look at this Republican primary in New Hampshire this was a really good night for Joe Biden mm. why do I say that so Nikki Haley against Donald Trump got 73 percent of self-described moderates 66 percent of first-time voters now only one in five were a first-time Republic Republican primary voter what does that tell you they're gonna vote Republican very often or they just show up here uh, she got 60% of the independents, and she got a majority of the college graduates. Joe Biden's not going to win every one of these voters, mm -hmm. but he's, if he pulls 5% in each of these categories, yeah. you know, it, it shows you why New Hampshire is probably a bridge too far for him to carry. He's never carried it. Um, he, I don't think he's built for it, right? Some Republicans do win it. George W. Uh, George w. Bush was uh, able to, I think, narrowly win it once. John Kerry actually flipped it once. But he's not that type of Republican. That's why Trump has lost it both times. This, to me, is a recipe for Donald Trump probably losing New Hampshire a third time. And obviously, the Biden team, which announced a big shakeup tonight, watching all of those numbers mm -hmm. very closely. Chuck, talk about some of the other big takeaways from the exit polls, particularly as it relates to uh, voters who identify with the MAGA movement. Well, yes. And let me get you to that. Uh, I know that we um, have been... And, uh, well, I also want to do the Biden legitimately won the yeah. election. Let's do that because this was a, a pretty split electorate. If you recall, in Iowa, it was two to one, right? Sort of two thirds of Iowans uh, did not believe that Biden legitimately won. So if you don't believe Biden legitimately won, obviously Donald Trump won these voters. Look how, how well he did. He won 86% of these voters. If you thought Biden 
won legitimately. Nikki Haley, she didn't win as many. She won 77%. Mm. I always find this, this happened in Iowa too. One in five voters who believe Biden won legitimately still plan, uh, still ended up supporting Donald Trump. Wow. So it's not as if that issue alone, I, you know, is you know a guarantee that you win all of those voters in that place. But it is it is an interesting way to look at it. But again, you start to see how Nikki Haley continued um, to come up short. And I'm buying a little time here. Is the if Trump is convicted, is he fit? Yeah. The overall split 54-42. Obviously, is he fit if he's convicted? 87%. He won those voters. But check this out. No, he's not fit if he's convicted. Donald Trump still won 13%. 13%. Still won wow. 13%. So and we saw, not a clean sweep. we saw similar numbers to that in Iowa as we well, Chuck, and big implications for the general. Chuck, thanks so much. We're going to come back to you, so don't go anywhere. Coming up, the voters have spoken in New Hampshire. We're going to dive deeper into what tonight's results mean for the future of the primary race and Trump's grip on the Republican Party. You are watching NBC News Now special coverage of the New Hampshire primary election. Do stay with us. is it to see it like this? Our house is no longer here, but we are here. Now is real. Let's break down what we know and then the big questions still outstanding. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Welcome back, everyone. Former President Donald Trump notched an historic win tonight in New Hampshire, and more of the Republican establishment is coalescing around him now. The former president secured two more Senate endorsements tonight, both Senators John Cornyn and Deb Fischer, calling on Republicans to unite around Donald Trump. Joining me now to discuss these results, Mark Short, former Chief of Staff to Vice President Mike Pence, Danielle Pletka, Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and Garrett Ventry, Republican strategist. Thanks to all of you for being here. So let's start off, Mark, let me just start with you. Your reaction to what we saw tonight when we started off today, we talked about the margin of a potential Trump victory. He's got a double digit lead. He does. I think we talked about it, I think, roughly being about 10 points. That's yeah. roughly where we are. And and I think that there's been very little that's changed throughout the, mm. this entire primary. I think the reality is the Republican voters are not ready to quit Donald Trump yet. And, and that's where we are. 
Yeah, Danny, what, what do you make of tonight and what do you make of what we heard from the former president, particularly as it relates to both on social media and in his piece, basically saying this race is over, it's time for Nikki Haley to get out? Well, he would like that. But uh, I think we talked about earlier what the margin was going to be. I think the issue here is that what we've seen is he didn't destroy her and she mm. didn't have a fabulous showing. It's a little bit ambiguous. And I think she can still make a case. I can stay in the race. I can stay until South Carolina. If I win South Carolina, you know, and that's a hard call. We're not seeing that in the polls. But if I win South Carolina, then I have a case to be made. As you keep saying rightly, the money is going to be there for right. Nikki Haley. So that's not going to be a factor, which it was for Ron DeSantis. As far as Donald, Donald Trump's speech is concerned, every time I see him give a speech like that, it reminds me of being in fifth grade. There were just mean kids who turned and said, you know, you're fat, you're ugly, you're stupid, you're mean, and I hate them still to this day, mm. 50 years later, and that's how I feel about that kind of speech. Garrett, what, what do you weigh in on everything we just heard from Danny? She that gave you a lot, a lot to respond to. <laughs> I, I like the analogy. I'll have to use that next time someone's mean to me. Uh, no, I think if we take a step here, back here, I mean, Donald Trump is, is still the king of the Republican Party here. You know, a year ago, people very much doubted his power over the Republican Party, and we've seen him trounce a number of very strong challengers. He just beat Ron DeSantis in Iowa, obviously by 30 points, who dropped out. He's beaten Nikki Haley here. He was outspent two to one. He's won by about 11 points here. That's impressive. He's going to win Nevada because she's not going to obviously be part of that caucus. And you're talking about going to South Carolina. She's down 30 or 40 points. I don't know how she survives that. Like, she have all the money in the world, but surviving a damaging, embarrassing loss in her home state, I don't see a path forward for her. And the real interesting thing I would say real quick here in this New Hampshire primary, your exit polling showed by a 21 point margin, her argument was electability. I can beat Joe Biden. Republican voters in the primary think Donald Trump by a 21 point mm -hmm. margin is a better candidate to beat Joe Biden. That kind of throws her argument in the trash. Chris, can I just say, I think that there are a lot of people who want to look at Trump's speech and say, boy, he was irrational or he got emotional and he got unhinged. I don't think that's the case. Mm -hmm. I think people underestimate how much of this is intentional. He knows he's going to win Nevada. He knows he's going to win South Carolina. He knows Super Tuesday is locked in for him, and so he's going to pound her. And that's what he does because it builds the sense of inevitability. It builds the sense that, that he's the victor. And I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it helps him with general election voters. But it's not like the, everyone wants to report that he got unhinged. It was something emotional. This is him. Yeah. It's, not, it's not accidental. This is an intentional decision on his part because he knows he's going to win coming down the path. Talk about this air of inevitability because of everything that Mark's saying. You also have Senator Cornyn coming out tonight with an endorsement. Deb Fisher coming out with an endorsement. That extraordinary statement that we were talking about earlier from RNC Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel, essentially saying, now's the time for unity. A not so subtle way of saying, Nikki Haley, if you can't win tonight, it's time to leave this race. That statement went out before the polls closed. I mean, is there not a sense of inevitability? And how then does Haley have a path in South Carolina? Look, she may not have a path, yeah. but we have a process. We have a primary process. We have a primary process for the Democrats. We have one for the Republicans. If we don't like it and we want to change it, we have a means to do that. But we haven't done it. And we don't get in the race and talk about our leaders like kings even though they may think of themselves that way. There is a discussion to be had, there is a debate to be had, and Donald Trump has to prove himself. And my view is this primary process is that process. And especially for the party chairman who's supposed to be neutral. Yeah, there were so many fascinating revelations that came out of the exit polls. And Garrett, I wanna read you one of them. Uh, when it relates to primary voters, 61% said they do not consider themselves to be a part of the MAGA movement. When that first came in, we were looking at that and going, well, maybe this is going to be a closer night than we thought. What do you make of that? What does that tell you? Despite that fact, mm -hmm. Donald Trump still trounced Haley. Yeah, I think it shows he has broader appeal than just outside the MAGA base. And I think you see that in general election polling, too, whether it's Hispanic voters, black voters polling sometimes at 20%, which is historic essentially for a Republican candidate. Mm -hmm. You're seeing young voters come home to him as well here. I think it has to do with, it is inevitable right now. People see this as a race between Joe Biden and Donald Trump right now. And that's what the matchup's gonna be going into 2024. We do have a primary process. Nikki Haley has every right to stay in the race. 
the way, all the way through, but right now there is no path going forward with her. She's getting trounced going forward over and over again, like Mark pointed out. You're going into Super Tuesday. This map's going to open up. It's going to get even more friendly to President Trump. Yeah. To so your question, I think something else that's missed in the media Please. is I joined the campaign in 2016 after Pence was selected to be vice president. So yeah. I was not part of the nomination. But New Hampshire was considered a battleground state. And I was always shocked the number of signs we saw. There were Sanders, Trump. Mm. People assume all independents must have gone for Nikki, but there's still that, that rebellious notion of voter who's like, I hate all of Washington and I'm looking for somebody to throw them all out. And they still, despite him having been president, they still view him as that vehicle. And you might disagree with this, but a, a populist swath of the electorate, Danny, is partly what Mark's describing. And it's, I think people don't like to be labeled that way. First of all, President Biden has made that label, that MAGA label, mm. his own in some ways. He's made an epithet, an insult to people. That's a great point. And I think yeah. people don't want to be labeled like that. Yeah. Well, when we look forward to what the next few weeks might look like, Mark, Nikki Haley undoubtedly is going to have to have some tough conversations because remember, Ron DeSantis, after Iowa, was celebrating his second place finish. And yet, when he took a hard look at the polls, at his donors, which again, we're saying she still has donors, he didn't feel like there was a path. If she feels like she's not going to win her home state, can she stay in the race? Because that would be a more devastating loss than yeah, yeah, I, I don't think so, but I don't think she has to make a decision tonight. I mean, to Danny's point, a lot of candidates get out because you run out of money. She's not. There's a lot of donors who don't want Trump and they're hoping for something different. She's going to continue to have the means to continue this on. But a month from now, when you get to South Carolina, I'm not sure she really wants to be on a ticket if she's going to lose by 25 points. Yeah. Danny, very quickly, yes or no, does she make it to South Carolina? I think she makes it for Garrett? sure. Garrett? I think she does, yeah. Okay, good. We'll stick around. We've got a lot more to discuss. Mark Garrett and Danielle, great conversation. Up next, NBC News projects a win for President Biden in the Granite State as well. It's the first time he's ever won the New Hampshire primary, and he wasn't even on the ballot. We'll delve into all of that. You're watching NBC News now. Special coverage of the New Hampshire primary election. mobile app get connected to your favorite news shows for the top stories breaking news and live video download the nbc news mobile app now Kristen welker hosts meet the press every sunday on nbc 
Welcome back. Tonight in New Hampshire, President Biden won the New Hampshire primary as a write-in candidate. And now in reaction to former President Donald Trump's victory, the president has a clear eye on a likely rematch against President Biden. In a statement tonight, President Biden reacted to Trump's victory, saying, it is now clear that Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee. And my message to the country is the stakes could not be higher. Our democracy, our personal freedoms, from the right to choose to the right to vote, our economy, which has seen the strongest recovery in the world since COVID, are all at stake. NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli is at a write-in Biden watch party in NBC, MSNBC's anchor and former White House press secretary, Jen Psaki is an NBC News election headquarters in Manchester, New Hampshire. Thanks to both of you for staying up late with me on this election night. Mike, let me just start with you and that striking statement from President Biden. What do you make of it? And tell us about this major campaign shakeup that you've been reporting on throughout the night. Well, Kristen, we really have seen over the last month the Biden campaign ramping up the kind of urgency that a lot of Democrats have, frankly, been wanting to see for some time. And the crystallization now of the fact that we do appear to be heading into general election mode uh, earlier than a lot of folks expected is, is really driving what the campaign is describing, not as a shakeup, but as the beginning of an all-hands-on-deck moment. For some time, people, including up to the former president of the United States, Barack Obama, have been suggesting that the Biden team in Wilmington, Delaware, the headquarters there, needed to include some of those senior decision makers who have thus, thus far been working in, in the West Wing. That includes Jen O'Malley Dillon. That includes Mike Donilon, who will now, indeed, we learned today, be joining the headquarters. I spoke earlier tonight with Julie Chavez Rodriguez. She is, she has been the campaign manager. She said this is a welcome development. This is a reflection of the fact that we are seeing the Republican nomination race come to an early end. She's describing this as as not likely to change really much in the way of the day-to-day -day operations. She noted that O'Malley, Dillon, Donilon are very familiar names to her. They are very familiar names in headquarters. And so having everyone under one roof will only uh, continue to keep this operation moving forward. Uh, another senior official telling me, listen, the president still continues to have confidence in his campaign manager uh, that this is a campaign that has been slow, yes, but to build up a, a rapid response operation. Uh, they're beginning to put field staff in the, in the, in the early states and, and expanding the map as well. And so uh, they're kind of downplaying this as simply a matter of some of the staff in the White House who had split responsibilities now moving to the campaign full time. Uh, but it is certainly a noteworthy development, considering, Kristen, what you and I were just hearing a few weeks ago when they were pushing back on these kinds of suggestions. Oh, absolutely. It is a striking development indeed. And Jen Psaki, let me bring you into this. It is pretty stunning to hear President Biden say it is now clear that Donald Trump will be the Republican mm. nominee. Nikki Haley is still in this race. What do you make of him coming out and saying this on mm -hmm. the same day that the campaign has announced these changes, on the same day that he had his first joint appearance with the vice president, the focus abortion rights? Well, first, Kristen, it's very consistent with language that was in a statement issued by Julie Chavez Rodriguez a couple of hours ago. Obviously, the president's voice is much more significant. It's interesting that they decided to do that because it is elevating it more. But the first line of this statement from Julie Chavez Rodriguez a couple of hours ago said, tonight's results confirm Donald Trump has all but locked up the GOP nomination. That is the first line of it. And what it indicates, uh, should indicate to everybody and all of us, is that they are starting the general election. However long Long Nikki Haley stays in, whether it's until tomorrow, until South Carolina, they're running against Trump, they're running full throttle against him, and, and that's their plan. So, uh, you know, pretty significant tonight. I, I think that they put out both of those statements, and certainly the one in the president's voice. Jen, take us inside some of your conversations with Democratic colleagues, because Mike and I, of course, are always reporting on this, and there has been some concern mm. that the campaign has been slow to ramp up. Now, obviously, the campaign is saying, OK, here we are in the general election. Do you think that this is the right time from the perspective of the president's supporters or do they wish that he'd done this a couple of months ago? 
Well, I think, first of all, that reporting, that was excellent reporting done by a number of people, including Mike Memoli, that just, that kind of unearthed the fact that they are bringing in Jen O'Malley, Dillon, and Mike Donilon. I don't believe that was planned to go out today. That was mm. obviously in the works behind the scenes, clearly, but I don't think they planned to do that. I think they planned today to make clear the general election was starting. In terms of conversations, I think I've heard a lot of the same things you all have been talking about. Uh, the Democrats are nervous. They're mm. nervous about the possibility of D Donald Trump being elected to another term. They want to see urgency from the campaign. I think a lot of people were encouraged by those two democracy speeches that the president gave. They want to see more of that. They're also encouraged by what they're seeing in sort of a more aggressive tact on social media and in the media against Donald Trump. And I think we'll have to see over the next couple of weeks what that looks like. But the, Mike Donilon and, um, and Jen O'Malley Dillon going to the campaign, what that does is it's like a comfort security warm blanket for people um, because they are known entities, they're in the inner circle, um, there's a comfort level with who they are and their track record among people who have long supported the president. So even though, as Mike said, they're not characterizing this as a shakeup, Julie Chavez Rodriguez, still the campaign manager, the statement was in her name tonight, which I think was done on purpose. This is going to give people out there who were nervous a little bit more confidence that some people who have been around him for a long time, who've run these campaigns successfully, are going to be also deeply involved. And Mike, pick up on that point. What are you watching for in the coming weeks from President Biden, from the vice president? Obviously, they are going to be putting this focus on abortion rights. They're also going to be talking about democracy, as Jen just talked about. One of the challenges, though, is to find a new message on the economy, right? Yeah, I, there are really three pillars to this Biden re-election campaign, and we've seen that play out as the year has begun. The first is that democracy argument, Valley Forge, the strong speech from the president there, abortion rights today, an important issue through the general election. But the economy is not going to be forgotten. The president, as he looks forward to his State of the Union address on March 7th, we expect that to be a major theme. And Kristen, I think we also do have to talk about the primary calendar continuing. The president will be traveling to South Carolina this weekend. And I also want to you know, I think it's worth highlighting what happened here in New Hampshire tonight. This write-in effort was successful. Uh, it took a lot of grassroots organizings from people uh, who were not very happy with the Biden campaign with the DNC for depriving New Hampshire uh, of that first slot. Uh, but they're, they're now hoping that the president will come here and come here quickly because New Hampshire will be a battleground state in November. The of him winning that write-in campaign hugely significant. There's no doubt about that. Mike and Jen, thank you both for a great conversation. Coming up after the break, Steve Kornacki will join us, teaming up with Chuck Todd at the big board. There they are. Get ready. Do not go anywhere. You don't want to miss this. You're watching NBC News Now, special coverage of the New Hampshire primary election.
on top of breaking news and the biggest stories of the day with NBC News Daily. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Morgan Radford. I'm Vicki Wynn. I'm Kate Snow. And I'm Zinclair Samoa. Get in-depth reporting from across the country. We have breaking news out of the White House. And around the world. Questions about the rebellion inside Russia. And ways you can take care of your health. What are symptoms that people should be on the lookout for? And your wallet. Some really great last-minute deals if you have flexibility. NBC News Daily, weekdays from 12 to 4 p.m. Eastern on NBC News Now. Welcome back. We have got a very special, rare occurrence here. We've got Chuck Todd and Steve Kornacki at the big board together talking about the path forward. It's like an eclipse. Exactly. You know, you don't get it very often, <laughs> but when you get it, uh, you'll, Just you'll appreciate Just as exciting. It. So, look, we've put our brains together to basically talk about the path ahead. Obviously, for Nikki Haley, it has to be a formula of of primaries that allow independents and yes even democrats here and so we this is everything through super tuesday through the first that first tuesday in march so you can see where she'll start to put her resources you know she's going to put her resources obviously in everything here in yellow and realistically look to me michigan minnesota is a good place for her colorado could be in those i think these southern states while they're open are probably not great territory for her but realistic and maybe she does well here in the rest of New England, is there. But I know, Steve, you did some crunching uh, as well on this, state by state. Yeah, I mean, just looking at, obviously, the reliance she had on independents and Democrats. They were, according to the exit poll right now, 49% of this Republican electorate, of this uh, Republican primary electorate, is actually Republican. So just looking back at 2016, some of these states you're talking about, what share of the electorate was Republican yep. in those primaries here? 62, 69, 60. Massachusetts, you're mentioning. Okay. That, could, well, there's that one. could be a Haley yeah. target. You know, <laughs> 69, 83, 63, 70. Vermont, 56. Well, that's a different kind of Republican. I think right. she could be competitive there. Virginia at 55. But, you know, Chuck, the other factor here is this is a two-person race now. Yep. In a lot of these states, the formula is very simple for delegates. If you get 50 percent in a congressional district, you get all from the district. You change the rules in some of these places California. to pull this off, and California is obviously yeah. the big one. Winner take all if you get yeah. 50 percent plus one. So he doesn't even – he could beat her by two points and take all the delegates in a bunch of these states. You know, the Democratic primary tonight did draw about 100 – plus thousand voters. There are some places that if there's no competitive Democratic primary and Democrats can participate, that could in theory help her. I think it cost her some votes tonight. I think Dean Phillips' ad campaign and the successful right and effort with Biden cost her some opportunity. Tonight. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, 6% in the exit poll IDing as Democrats, it's usually 2% or something. Well, no, it was double digits though in 12 and in eight. Yeah. It was only single digits when Bernie Sanders was the Democrat on the other side in 2016. Yeah. So that's why there was an opportunity here, but more Democrats stayed in their lane. I know in South, you know, in South Carolina, they, they don't do party registration, so we're just at the reliance of what they say in the exit poll, but I know the high water mark for Democrats there was McCain in 2009. Yep. Independent was, they got 40% non-Republican electorate in in. And if uh, I recall, McCain still couldn't get 50%. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a really tough place yeah. for him. Uh, and he's essentially the Nikki Haley candidate. Well, and the, the Bush message in 2000, is it was a more refined version of what you heard from Trump tonight, which is essentially, this is a loyalty test. Yeah. Don't side with the Democrats, don't side with the independents, don't side with the media. And remember, 70, Donald Trump won a majority of the Republicans. John McCain actually won a plurality of Republicans in New Hampshire. Mm. Right. So you could, he could actually lay claim that some Republicans wanted him. She's got a problem when only one in four Republicans in New Hampshire wanted her as the nominee. So to win the independent vote, by 44, by a, a 34, a 20, me, 24 in the independents, and to lose the Republicans by 49 is a 73 point swing. I looked back, there is no New Hampshire primary where there's ever been that big of a swing. And guys, just to put a fine point on it, in terms of the number of Republicans in New Hampshire, we're looking at double the amount when you get to South Carolina, when you get to Michigan, and that's why her path gets so much harder. Yeah, hey, look, that's why it's all about, you know, in the old days, you'd say you want to collect delegates because you want to influence the platform and you want to do all these things. To me, the only motivation for her to stick this out is if she wants to be the leader of a party that doesn't have Donald Trump involved. If she somehow believes yeah. that Trump loses and that there will be room and she'll look, it was the bet Ted Cruz made and lost in 2016. 
I don't know if that's who she is, though. I just don't. Given that she served in the administration and seemed to make the other calculation last time. Now, I agree. And the other number on South Carolina, too. Look, uh, 76 percent Republican in 2016. It was also 72 percent evangelical in 2016. Tonight in New Hampshire, 19 percent. Iowa was 55. And again, that's the backbone of Trump right now. He's formed that political bond. By the way, this map proves only Massachusetts is less Republican, right, of a Republican primary yes. than New Hampshire. Yes. Only Massachusetts, the neighboring state. Maybe the D.C. primary. Yeah. Right? I mean, again, McCain, he yeah. swept New England pretty much uh, and lost almost everywhere and else. And if you remember in 2016, I believe, Marco Rubio Marco was the Rubio, president of Virginia. That's right. Yeah. Virginia. Can, in Minnesota, can, I, was close. can I jump in? Because one of the states that Nikki Haley's campaign is looking at is Virginia, Massachusetts, Virginia. What would the path be in a Virginia? Oh, it's quite easy. Virginia is not. Look, Virginia, we saw this. Virginia is allergic to, to Trump. So, I mean, it is, the, it is literally the path. We can actually, why don't we not give a history here, right? We can, we can go back into time here and show you what happened here in Virginia, I believe. Right? Go there ahead there. 2016. 2016. Get over there it is. Virginia and we can get. And, and in fact, so this was the path. You can see it here. Look, there's Washington, D.C. Yep. There's all the Rubio counties. And he won all of Richmond. You could see where basically it's wherever Democrats carry in Virginia. Rubio did well. And by the way, though, he still came up short. Mm. And, and this That's is, the irony here. He well, still came up short. Well, we're on this. I got to point this one out. Okay. The <laughs> D.C. primary, a combined 72, almost 73 percent from Marco Rubio, John Kasich. There will be 19 delegates mm. in D.C. So this one, yeah. I could see Haley getting delegates from. The problem is she, it's, she's got to follow a Democratic right. path to win a Republican nomination. Wherever Democrats do well in general elections is where she has to go and figure this out. That's no way to win a nomination. And that has been the challenge ever since we started delving into New Hampshire. This was more interesting than an eclipse. Thank you, there Chuck you, and Steve. Wait a minute, eclipses are also very interesting. <laughs> no one went blind well, staring at this. Yeah, yeah, they're they're more, very you know. interesting, but <laughs> yeah. this, I think this tops it. All right, thank you both very much. Still to come, as we're just saying, all eyes will be on the next major Republican primary battle in her home state of South Carolina. You are watching NBC News Now special coverage of the New Hampshire primary election. Stay with us. lives in the now. It's coming at us every second. News is more now than ever. Just outside of the Israeli military headquarters. Now is raw. <laughs> now is real. The Fed's decision today, help us translate that into very plain English. Now is constant. You gotta see this. Future is now. News for the generation of now. 
is NBC News Now. This race is far from over. There are dozens of states left to go. And the next one is my sweet state of South Carolina. Welcome back. After losses tonight in New Hampshire and last week in Iowa, the Haley campaign is faced with what could very well be a last gasp contest in her home state of South Carolina, where both senators and its current governor are now backing Donald Trump. In fact, that's South Carolina Senator Tim Scott behind Trump, literally, as the former president spoke after his victory. Back with me now is the panel, Mark Short, Daniel Pletka, and Garrett Ventry. Garrett, let me talk to you. The optics there of Tim Scott standing right behind Donald Trump as he spoke tonight, we all thought, boy, it, we know there's a lot of buzz about him being a potential VP nominee, but that type of moment reinforces the buzz around a Tim Scott. Yeah, I think it does an extent. I think also it just shows Trump wants to show that he has complete domination over the Republican Party. You've got a couple of his opponents over there. I think part of it's optics. I'm sure that conversation will happen. The entire reason we're having the conversation about the VP this early is because of his domination in Iowa, New Hampshire, and then talking about going to South Carolina here. Haley's issue going into South Carolina is that, again, there's been other campaigns. Ron DeSantis' super PAC had hundreds of millions of dollars. Jeb Bush, we saw this with Right to Rise as well, had a ton of money and still wasn't able to beat Donald Trump in 2016. I would argue in 2024 he's in an even stronger position right now than he's ever been going forward here. So it's going to be tough for her to suffer that loss. We saw Rubio suffer a loss in Florida in 2016 in his home state. It's just very hard to recover from that. So even if she has the money and the resources, it's going to be hard to go forward for her if she can't put W's on the board. Yeah, that's staring down a double-digit deficit, Dan, in your home state is just so challenging. And Chuck and Steve just laid out why the path is so challenging beyond South Carolina. All right. Well, what I really like that they said is, uh, that Chuck said, actually, is, is, is that her path is actually sort of a Democratic path. It's, mm. not a, it's not a Republican path. But at the same time, if you're Nikki Haley, you look at the, at the landscape, the political landscape, and you're still seeing the numbers that say that 60, 65 percent of Americans don't want 2020 again. They don't want Donald Trump. They don't want Joe Biden. How does that work for you? And how does she think about that moving forward? And I'm willing to bet that's a big part of how she thinks about her future. Mark, what do you think about that? And what the other point that Chuck made, which is, does she think about another way to take on Trump if not through this path? Oh, I, I never have viewed her as an ideological warrior, Kristen. I think she's very transactional herself. Mm. And so I, I don't see her having a bigger cause beyond this. Let's remember, she was the one who uh, in 2016 spoke out against Trump in her response to the State of the Union, but quickly accepted a, a post as UN ambassador as long as it would be a cabinet post. Yeah. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't see that in her future. Let's talk about this really remarkable statement, I think, from President Biden, who's basically declared this race over, who has said effectively that the general election uh, has begun, that the nomination seems to be locked up by former President Trump. Danny, what did you make of that statement? And it, it, I mean, going back to this point, Americans do not want this rematch, and yet here they are. This is what they are going to get. What are you going to be watching for? You saw, you know, President Biden, the vice president out today talking about abortion rights. Clearly, they're going to make this a central part of their campaign. First of all, the way I picture this is that Joe Biden wakes up every morning and says Donald Trump is going to be the candidate. These two have a symbiotic relationship. Mm. Right? Donald Trump can only beat Joe Biden and Joe Biden can only beat Donald Trump. We just don't know how it's going to come out. But they are in this death match, almost literally, <laughs> locked <laughs> together given their age. Um, and I think so. I think for the president, this is hugely, hugely important. Plus, he wants to pivot. He wants to say democracy is on the ballot every single minute of every single day. I think people are going to get a little tired of it, but that's where he wants to go. Garrett, what do you think about that? And what do you make of the fact that clearly they're signaling that abortion is going to be central to their reelection campaign? And, and I've spoken to a lot of Republicans who've said we still have not found our footing, our messaging mm -hmm. on that critical issue. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very clear that these two are going to be the party's nominee, and I think we've thought that probably for a long time. We're just dragging out the inevitable here, but that will it will be Donald Trump versus Joe Biden going into November of 2024. I do think that uh, the democracy argument from Joe Biden is interesting in Democrats when they're literally cheering, taking him off the ballot in multiple states. You know, democracy, but let's take him off the ballot and don't let voters decide. The third thing I would say here when you're talking about abortion, I would agree with you. It is a tough issue for Republicans here. They'd much rather want to talk about economy and inflation. I think Biden doesn't want to talk about those two things because he's underwater with the American public, has been the last year. I think a very good answer, Nikki Haley's had a good answer. I think President Trump in his interview with you had a pretty good answer as well. And I do think uh, Senate candidate in Arizona, Carrie Lake, has had an interesting answer. She mm -hmm. has said that she doesn't support a federal abortion ban. And she talks about more resources for women, for babies, those type of things, baby bonus. I think it's a good answer. Mark, what do you think? Well, it's just remember, Carrie Lake was a two-time Obama voter, so she's not exactly an orthodox Republican, and I'm not really going to go to the bank of what she thinks on the life issue. I do think that Biden is smart. To, to Danny's point, I think that the reality is that it is symbiotic. And as Nikki Haley said, um, that uh, any other Republican would beat Biden and pretty much any other Democrat would beat Trump. So he's smart to elevate this into a Biden versus uh, Trump race as soon as he could. It's so interesting, Danny. I talked to some Republicans who say Biden's underwater with the economy right now. But what happens if that changes in November? That's what they say. That's one of their big concerns. Well, that's a, a lot of change that has to happen. <laughs> I mean, we're looking at very, very serious inflation still. We're looking at things that people care about that the president isn't talking about. Right, people aren't, people don't care about junk fees. People care mm -hmm. that their house is worth less than their mortgage, that they can't afford milk, that they can't afford to send their kids to school. And those things aren't going to change. And I it, wish they would. It is, a, he is signaling potentially a, a shift in messaging on the economy. Inflation has begun to come down, but Garrett, are you hearing that type of concern within Republican circles? And we have about 10 seconds. I, I think that it's going to be tough for Biden to do because the, the, the point here is this. People think it's going to get worse, and two-thirds of people still think the economy, everything's heading in the wrong direction. Okay. Great conversation. Great hour. Thank Thanks, you Chris. all for being here. Mark Short, Danielle Pletka, and Garrett Ventry. Really appreciate it. And, of course, Chuck Todd, who's been here throughout the hour. We have much more coverage of the 2024 race every weekday at 4 p.m. Eastern on Meet the Press Now. Thank you so much for watching our special NBC News Now coverage of the 2024 New Hampshire primary. This is it. This is an NBC News special. Decision 2024, the New Hampshire primary. Welcome Reporting to NBC tonight, News special. Kristen Welker. Welcome to NBC News special coverage of the 2024 New Hampshire presidential primary. I am Kristen Welker in New York on an historic night for Republicans.